which none of us knew for a couple of years he was HIV positive and not looking after himself. There came a point when he developed full-blown AIDS. Elizabeth cleared her throat. Well, you'll remember how much hysteria there was about HIV when it first emerged. Strike was inured to people thinking that he was at least ten years older than he was. In fact, he had heard from his mother, never one to guard her tongue in deference to a child's sensibilities, about the killer disease that was stalking those who fucked freely and shared needles. Joe fell apart physically, and all the people who'd wanted to know him when he was promising, clever, and beautiful melted away. Except, to do them credit, said Elizabeth grudgingly, Michael and Owen. They rallied round Joe, but he died with his novel unfinished. Michael was ill and couldn't go to Joe's funeral, but Owen was a pallbearer. In gratitude for the way they'd looked after him, Joe left the pair of them that rather lovely house, where they'd once parted and sat up all night discussing books. I was there for a few of those evenings. They were happy times, said Elizabeth. How much did they use the house after North died? I can't answer for Michael, but I doubt he's been there since he fell out with Owen, which was not long after Joe's funeral said Elizabeth, with a shrug. Owen never went there because he was terrified of running into Michael. The terms of Joe's will were peculiar. I think they call it a restrictive covenant. Joe stipulated that the house was to be preserved as an artist's refuge. That's how Michael's managed to block the sale all these years. The Quines have never managed to find another artist or artists to sell to. A sculptor rented it for a while, but that didn't work out. Of course, Michael's always been as picky as possible about tenants to stop Owen benefiting financially, and he can afford lawyers to enforce his whims. What happened to North's unfinished book? asked Strike. Oh, Michael abandoned work on his own novel and finished Joe's posthumously. It's called Towards the Mark, and Harold Weaver published it. It's a cult classic, never been out of print. She checked her watch again. I need to go, she said. I've got a meeting at 2.30. My coat, please, she called to a passing waiter. Somebody told me, said Strike, who remembered perfectly well that it had been Anstice, that you supervised work on Talgarth Road a while back. Yes, she said indifferently. Just one more of the unusual jobs Quine's agent ended up doing for him. It was a matter of coordinating repairs, putting in workmen. I sent Michael a bill for half, and he paid up through his lawyers. You had a key? Which I passed to the foreman she said coldly, then returned to the Quines. You didn't go and see the work yourself. Of course I did. I needed to check it had been done. I think I visited twice. Was hydrochloric acid used in any of the renovation, do you know? The police asked me about hydrochloric acid, she said. Why? I can't say, she glowered. He doubted that people often refused Elizabeth Tassel information. Well, I can only tell you what I told the police. It was probably left there by Todd Harkness. Who? The sculptor I told you about who rented the studio space. Owen found him, and Fancourt's lawyers couldn't find a reason to object. What nobody realized was that Harkness worked mainly in rusted metal, and used some very corrosive chemicals. He did a lot of damage in the studio before being asked to leave. Fancourt's side did that clean-up operation and sent us the bill. The waiter had brought her coat to which a few dog hairs clung. Strike could hear a faint whistle from her laboring chest as she stood up. With a peremptory shake of the hand, Elizabeth Tassel left. Strike took another taxi back to the office, with the vague intention of being conciliatory to Robin. Somehow they had rubbed each other up the wrong way that morning, and he was not quite sure how it had happened. However, by the time he had finally reached the outer office, he was sweating with the pain in his knee, and Robin's first words drove all thought of propitiation from his mind. The car hire company just called. They haven't got an automatic, but they can give you— It's got to be an automatic, snapped Strike, dropping onto the sofa in an eruption of leathery flatulence that irritated him still further. I can't bloody drive a manual in this state. Have you rung? Of course I've tried other places, said Robin coldly. I've tried everywhere. Nobody can give you an automatic tomorrow. The weather forecast's atrocious anyway. I think you'd do better to— I'm going to interview Chard, said Strike. Pain and fear were making him angry. Fear that he would have to give up the prosthesis and resort to crutches again. His trouser leg pinned up, staring eyes. Pity. He hated hard plastic chairs in disinfected corridors. 
hated his voluminous notes being unearthed and pored over, murmurs about changes to his prosthesis, advice from calm medical men to rest, to mollycoddle his leg as though it were a sick child he had to carry everywhere with him. In his dreams, he was not one-legged. In his dreams, he was whole. Chard's invitation had been an unlooked-for gift. He intended to seize it. There were many things he wanted to ask Quine's publisher. The invitation itself was glaringly strange. He wanted to hear Chard's reason for dragging him to Devon. Did you hear me? asked Robin. What? I said, I could drive you. No, you can't, said Strike ungraciously. Why not? You gotta be in Yorkshire. I got to be at King's Cross tomorrow night at eleven. The snow's gonna be terrible. We'll set out early. Or, said Robin with a shrug, you can cancel Chard. But the forecast for next week's awful, too. It was difficult to reverse from ingratitude to the opposite, with Robin's steely grey-blue eyes upon him. All right, he said stiffly. Thanks. Then I need to go and pick up the car, said Robin. Right, said Strike through gritted teeth. Owen Quine had not thought women had any place in literature. He, Strike, had a secret prejudice, too. But what choice did he have, with his knee screaming for mercy, and no automatic car for hire? Chapter 28 That, of all other, was the most fatal and dangerous exploit that I ever was ranged in, since I first bore arms before the face of the enemy. Ben Johnson, every man in his humour. At five o'clock the following morning, a muffled and gloved robin boarded one of the first tube trains of the day, her hair glistening with snowflakes, a small backpack over her shoulder, and carrying a weekend bag into which she had packed a black dress, coat and shoes that she would need for Mrs. Cunliffe's funeral. She did not dare count on getting back home after the round trip to Devon, but intended to go straight to King's Cross once she had returned the car to the hire company. Sitting on the almost empty train, she consulted her own feelings about the day ahead and found them mixed. Excitement was her dominant emotion, because she was convinced that Strike had some excellent reason for interviewing Chard but could not wait. Robin had learned to trust her boss's judgment and his hunches. It was one of the things that so irritated Matthew. Matthew. Robin's black-gloved fingers tightened on the handle of the bag beside her. She kept lying to Matthew. Robin was a truthful person and never, in the nine years that they had been together, had she lied, or not until recently. Some had been lies of omission. Matthew had asked her on the telephone on Wednesday night what she had done at work that day, and she had given him a brief and heavily edited version of her activities, omitting her trip with Strike to the house where Quine had been murdered, lunch at the Albion, and, of course, the walk across the bridge at West Brompton Station with Strike's heavy arm over her shoulder. But there had been outright lies, too. Just last night he had asked her, like Strike, whether she oughtn't take the day off, get an earlier train. I tried, she had said, the lie sliding easily from her lips before she considered it. They're all full. It's the weather, isn't it? I suppose people are taking the train instead of risking it in their cars. I'll just have to stick with a sleeper. What else could I say? thought Robin, as the dark windows reflected her own tense face back to her. He'd have gone ballistic. The truth was that she wanted to go to Devon. She wanted to help strike, she wanted to get out from behind her computer, however much quiet satisfaction her competent administration of the business gave her, and investigate. Was that wrong? Matthew thought so. It wasn't what he'd counted on. He had wanted her to go with the advertising agency into human resources at nearly twice the salary. London was so expensive, Matthew wanted a bigger flat. He was, she supposed, carrying her. Then there was strike. A familiar frustration, a tight knot in her stomach. We'll have to get someone else in. Constant mentions of this prospective partner, who was assuming mythical substance in Robin's mind, a short-haired, shrew-faced woman, like the police officer who had stood guard outside the crime scene in Talgarth Road. She would be competent and trained in all the ways Robin was not, and unencumbered, for the very first time, in this half-empty, brightly lit tube carriage, with the world dark outside, and her ears full of rumble and clatter, she said it openly to herself by a fiancé like Matthew. But Matthew was the axis of her life, the fixed centre. She loved him. She had always loved him. He had stuck with her through the worst time in her life, when many young men would have left. She wanted to marry him, and she was going to marry him. It was just that they had never had fundamental disagreements before, never. Something about her job, her decision to stay with Strike, about Strike himself, 
had introduced a rogue element into their relationship, something threatening and new. The Toyota Land Cruiser that Robin had hired had been parked overnight in the Q Park in Chinatown, one of the nearest car parks to Denmark Street, where there was no parking at all. Slipping and sliding in her flattest smart shoes, the weekend bag swinging from her right hand, Robin hurried through the darkness to the multi-story, refusing to think any more about Matthew, or what he would think or say if he could see her, heading off for six hours alone in the car with Strike. After placing her bag in the boot, Robin sat back in the driver's seat, set up the sat-nav, adjusted the heating, and left the engine running to warm up the icy interior. Strike was a little late, which was unlike him. Robin whiled away the wait by acquainting herself fully with the controls. She loved cars, had always loved driving. By the age of ten she had been able to drive the tractor on her uncle's farm as long as someone helped her release the handbrake. Unlike Matthew, she had passed her test the first time. She had learned not to tease him about this. Movement glimpsed in her rearview mirror made her look up. A dark-suited strike was making his way laboriously towards the car on crutches, his right trouser leg pinned up. Robin felt a sick, swooping feeling in the pit of her stomach, not because of the amputated leg, which she had seen before, and in much more troubling circumstances, but because it was the first time that she had known strike, forsake the prosthesis in public. She got out of the car, then wished she hadn't when she caught his scowl. Good thinking getting a four-by-four, he said, silently warning her not to talk about his leg. Yeah, I thought we'd better in this weather, said Robin. He moved around to the passenger seat. Robin knew she must not offer help. She could feel an exclusion zone around him as though he were telepathically rejecting all offers of assistance or sympathy, but she was worried that he would not be able to get inside unaided. Strike threw his crutches onto the back seat and stood for a moment precariously balanced. Then, with a show of upper body strength that she had never seen before, pulled himself smoothly into the car. Robin jumped back in hastily, closed the door, put her seatbelt on and reversed out of the parking space. Strike's preemptive rejection of her concern sat like a wall between them, and to her sympathy was added a twist of resentment that he would not let her in to that tiny degree. When had she ever fussed over him or tried to mother him? The most she had ever done was pass him paracetamol. Strike knew himself to be unreasonable, but the awareness merely increased his irritation. On waking, it had been obvious that to try to force the prosthesis onto his leg when the knee was hot, swollen, and extremely painful would be an act of idiocy. He had been forced to descend the metal stairs on his backside, like a small child. Traversing Charing Cross Road on ice and crutches had earned him the stares of those few early morning pedestrians who were braving the sub-zero darkness. He had never wanted to return to this state, but here he was, all because of a temporary forgetfulness that he was not, like the dream strike, whole. At least, Strike noted with relief, Robin could drive. His sister, Lucy, was distractible and unreliable behind the wheel. Charlotte had always driven her Lexus in a manner that caused Strike physical pain, speeding through red lights, turning up one-way streets, smoking and chatting on her mobile, narrowly missing cyclists, and the opening doors of parked cars. Ever since the Viking had blown up around him on that yellow dirt road, Strike had found it difficult to be driven by anyone except a professional. After a long silence, Robin said, There's coffee in the backpack. What? In the backpack, a flask. I didn't think we should stop unless we really have to. And there are biscuits. The windscreen wipers were carving their way through flecks of snow. You're a bloody marvel, said Strike, his reserve crumbling. He had not had breakfast, trying and failing to attach his false leg, finding a pin for his suit trousers, digging out his crutches and getting himself downstairs had taken twice the time he had allowed, and in spite of herself, Robin gave a small smile. Strike poured himself coffee and ate several bits of shortbread, his appreciation of Robin's deft handling of the strange car increasing as his hunger decreased. What does Matthew drive? he asked as they sped over the Boston Manor viaduct. Nothing said Robin. We haven't got a car in London. Yeah, no need, said Strike, privately reflecting that if he ever gave Robin the salary she deserved, they might be able to afford one. So what are you planning to ask Daniel Chard? Robin asked. Plenty, said Strike, brushing crumbs off his dark jacket. First off, whether he's fallen out with Quine, and if so, what about? I can't fathom why Quine, total dickhead though he clearly was, decided to attack the man who had his livelihood in his hands, 
and who had the money to sue him into oblivion. Strike, munched shortbread for a while, swallowed, then added, unless Jerry Waldegrave's right and Quine was having a genuine breakdown when he wrote it and lashed out at anyone he thought he could blame for his lousy sales. Robin, who had finished reading Bombix Mori while Strike had been having lunch with Elizabeth Tassel the previous day, said, Isn't the writing too coherent for somebody having a breakdown? The syntax might be sound, but I don't think you'd find many people who disagree that the content's bloody insane. His other writing's very like it. None of his other stuff's as crazy as Bombix Mori, said Strike. Hobart Sin and the Balzac brothers both had plots. This has got a plot, has it? Or is Bombix's little walking tour? Just a convenient way of stringing together a load of attacks on different people. The snow fell thick and fast as they passed the exit to Heathrow, talking about the novel's various grotesqueries, laughing a little over its ludicrous jumps of logic, its absurdities. The trees on either side of the motorway looked as though they had been dusted with tons of icing sugar. Maybe Quine was born four hundred years too late, said Strike, still eating shortbread. Elizabeth Tassel told me there's a Jacobean revenge play featuring a poisoned skeleton disguised as a woman. Presumably someone shags it and dies. Not a million miles away from Phallus Impudicus getting ready to— Don't, said Robin, with a half-laugh and a shudder. But Strike had not broken off because of her protest, or because of any sense of repugnance. Something had flickered deep in his subconscious as he spoke. Somebody had told him. Someone had said— but the memory was gone in a flash of tantalizing silver, like a minnow vanishing in pondweed. A poisoned skeleton, Strike muttered, trying to capture the elusive memory, but it was gone. And I finished Holbart Sin last night as well, said Robin, overtaking a dawdling Prius. You're a sucker for punishment, said Strike, reaching for a sixth biscuit. I didn't think you were enjoying it. I wasn't, and it didn't improve. It's all about a hermaphrodite who's pregnant and gets an abortion because a kid would interfere with his literary ambitions, said Strike. You read it? No, Elizabeth Tassel told me. There's a bloody sack in it, said Robin. Strike looked sideways at her pale profile, serious as she watched the road ahead, her eyes flicking to the rearview mirror. What's inside? The aborted baby, said Robin. It's horrible. Strike digested this information as they passed the turning to Maidenhead. Strange, he said at last. Grotesque, said Robin. No, it's strange, insisted Strike. Quine was repeating himself. That's the second thing from Holbart's sin he put in Bombix Mori. Two hermaphrodites, two bloody sacks. Why? Well, said Robin, they aren't exactly the same. In Bombix Mori, the bloody sack doesn't belong to the hermaphrodite, and it hasn't got an aborted baby in it. Maybe he'd reached the end of his invention, she said. Maybe Bombix Mori was like a, a final bonfire of all his ideas. The funeral pyre for his career is what it was. Strike sat deep in thought while the scenery beyond the window became steadily more rural. Breaks in the trees showed wide fields of snow, white upon white beneath a pearly grey sky and still the snow came thick and fast at the car. You know, Strike said at last, I think there are two alternatives here. Either Quine genuinely was having a breakdown, had lost touch with what he was doing and believed Bombix Murray was a masterpiece, or he meant to cause as much trouble as possible, and the duplications are there for a reason. What reason? It's a key, said Strike. By cross-referencing with other books— he was helping people understand what he was getting at in Bombix Mori. He was trying to tell without being had up for libel. Robin did not take her eyes off the snowy motorway, but inclined her face towards him, frowning. You think it was all totally deliberate? You think he wanted to cause all this trouble? When you stop and think about it, said Strike, it's not a bad business plan for an egotistical, thick-skinned man who's hardly selling any books. Kick off as much trouble as you can. Get the book gossiped about all over London, threats of legal action, loads of people upset, veiled revelations about a famous writer, and then disappear where the writs can't find you, and before anyone can stop you, put it out as an e-book. But he was furious when Elizabeth Tassel told him she wouldn't publish it. Was he? said Strike thoughtfully. Or was he faking? Did he keep badgering her to read it because he was getting ready to stage a nice big public row? He sounds like a massive exhibitionist. Perhaps it was all part of his promotional plan.
He didn't think Roper Chard got his books enough publicity. I had that from Leonora. So you think he'd already planned to storm out of the restaurant when he met Elizabeth Tassel? Could be, said Strike. And to go to Talgarth Road? Maybe. The sun had risen fully now, so that the frosted treetops sparkled. And he got what he wanted, didn't he? said Strike, squinting as a thousand specks of ice glittered over the windscreen. Couldn't have arranged better publicity for his book if he'd tried. Just a pity he didn't live to see himself on the BBC News. Oh, bollocks, he added under his breath. What's the matter? I've finished all the biscuits. Sorry, said Strike, contrite. That's all right, said Robin, amused. I had breakfast. I didn't, Strike confided. His antipathy to discussing his leg had been dissolved by warm coffee, by their discussion and by her practical thoughts for his comfort. Couldn't get the bloody prosthesis on. My knee's swollen to hell. I'm going to have to see someone. Took me ages to get it sorted. She had guessed as much, but appreciated the confidence. They passed the golf course, its flags protruding from acres of soft whiteness and water-filled gravel pits now sheets of burnished pewter in the winter light. As they approached Swindon, Strike's phone rang. Checking the number, he half expected a repeat call from Nina Lascelles. He saw that it was Ilsa, his old school friend. He also saw, with misgivings, that he had missed a call from Leonora Quine at 6.30, when he must have been struggling down Charing Cross Road on his crutches. Ilsa, hi, what's going on? Quite a lot, actually, she said. She sounded tinny and distant. He could tell that she was in her car. Did Leonora Quine call you on Wednesday? Yep, we met that afternoon, she said. And I've just spoken to her again. She told me she tried to speak with you this morning and couldn't get you. Yeah, I had an early start, must have missed her. I've got her permission to tell what's happened. They've taken her in for questioning. I'm on my way to the station now. Shit, said Strike. Shit, what have they got? She told me they'd found photographs in her and Quine's bedroom. Apparently he liked being tied up and he liked being photographed once restrained, said Ilsa, with mordant matter-of-factness. She told me all this as though she was talking about the gardening. He could hear faint sounds of heavy traffic back in central London. Here on the motorway the loudest sounds were the swish of the windscreen wipers, the steady purr of the powerful engine, and the occasional whoosh of the reckless overtaking in the swirling snow. You'd think she'd have the sense to get rid of the pictures, said Strike. I'll pretend I didn't hear that suggestion about destroying evidence, said Ilsa, mocked sternly. Those pictures aren't bloody evidence, said Strike. Christ almighty, of course they had a kinky sex life, those two. How else was Leonora going to keep hold of a man like Quine? Anster's his mind's too clean, that's the problem. He thinks everything except the missionary position is evidence of bloody criminal tendencies. What do you know about the investigating officer's sexual habits? Ilsa asked, amused. He's the bloke I pulled to the back of the vehicle in Afghanistan, muttered Strike. Oh, said Ilsa, and he's determined to fit up Leonora. If that's all they've got, dirty photos, it isn't. Did you know the Quines have got a lock-up? Strike listened, tense, suddenly worried. Could he have been wrong? Completely wrong. Well, did you? asked Ilsa. What have they found? asked Strike, no longer flippant. Not the guts. What did you just say? It sounded like not the guts. What have they found? Strike corrected himself. I don't know, but I expect I'll find out when I get there. She's not under arrest. Just in for questioning. But they're sure it's her, I can tell, and I don't think she realises how serious things are getting. When she rang me, all she could talk about was her daughter being left with the neighbour, her daughter being upset. The daughter's twenty-six and she's got learning difficulties. Oh, said Ilsa. Sad. Listen, I'm nearly there. I'll have to go. Keep me posted. Don't expect anything soon. I've got a feeling we're going to be a while. Shit, Strike said again as he hung up. What's happened? An enormous tanker had pulled out of the slow lane to overtake a Honda Civic with a baby on board sign in its rear window. Strike watched its gargantuan silver bullet of a body swaying at speed on the icy road and noted with unspoken approval that Robin slowed down, leaving more breaking room. The police have taken Leonora in for questioning. Robin gasped. They found photos of Quine tied up in their bedroom and something else in a lock-up, but Ilse doesn't know what. It had happened to strike before. The instantaneous shift from calm to calamity. The slowing of time. Every scent suddenly wire-taut and screaming. The tanker was jackknifing. He heard himself bellow, Break! 
because that was what he had done last time to try to stave off death. But Robin slammed her foot on the accelerator. The car roared forward. There was no room to pass. The lorry hit the icy road on its side and spun. The Civic hit it, flipped over, and skidded on its roof towards the side of the road. A Golf and a Mercedes had slammed into each other and were locked together, speeding towards the truck of the tanker. They were hurtling towards the ditch at the side of the road. Robin missed the overturned Civic by an inch. Strike grabbed hold of the door handle as the Land Cruiser hit the rough ground at speed. They were going to plow into the ditch and maybe overturn. The tail end of the tanker was swinging lethally towards them, but they were traveling so fast that she missed that by a whisker. A massive jolt. Strike's head hit the roof of the car, and they had swerved back onto the icy tarmac on the other side of the pile-up, unscathed. Holy fucking! She was breaking at last, in total control, pulling up on the hard shoulder, and her face was as white as the snow spattering the windscreen. There was a kid in that Civic, and before he could say another word she had gone, slamming the door behind her. He leaned over the back of his seat, trying to grab his crutches. Never had he felt his disability more acutely. He had just managed to pull the crutches into the seat with him when he heard sirens. Squinting through the snowy rear window, he spotted the distant flicker of blue light. The police were already there. He was a one-legged liability. He threw the crutches back down, swearing. Robin returned to the car ten minutes later. It's okay, she panted. The little boy's all right. He was in a car seat. The lorry driver's covered in blood, but he's conscious. Are you okay? She was trembling a little, but smiled at the question. Yeah, I'm fine. I was just scared I was going to see a dead child. Right then, said Strike, taking a deep breath. Where the fuck did you learn to drive like that? Oh, I did a couple of advanced driving courses, said Robin with a shrug, pushing her wet hair out of her eyes. Strike stared at her. When was this? Not long after I dropped out of university. I was... I was... Going through a bad time, and I wasn't going out much. It was me dad's idea. I've always loved cars. It was just something to do, she said, putting on her seatbelt and turning on the ignition. Sometimes when I'm home, I go up to the farm to practice. Me uncle's got a field he lets me drive in. Strike was still staring at her. Are you sure you don't want to wait a bit before we... No, I've given them my name and address. We should get going. She shifted gear and pulled smoothly out onto the motorway. Strike could not look away from her calm profile. Her eyes were again fixed on the road, her hands confident and relaxed on the wheel. I seem worse steering than that from defensive drivers in the army, he told her. The ones who drive generals who are trained to make a getaway under fire. He glanced back at the tangle of overturned vehicles now blocking the road. I still don't know how you got us out of that. The near crash had not brought Robin close to tears, but at these words of praise and appreciation, she suddenly thought she might cry, let herself down. With a great effort of will, she compressed her emotion into a little laugh and said, You realize that if I'd braked, we'd have skidded right into the tanker? Yeah, said Strike, and he laughed too. I don't know why I said that, he lied. Chapter 29 There is a path upon your left-hand side that leadeth from a guilty conscience unto a forest of distrust and fear. Thomas Kidd, The Spanish Tragedy in spite of their near crash, Strike and Robin entered the Devonshire town of Tiverton shortly after twelve. Robin followed the satnav's instructions past quiet country houses, topped with thick layers of glittering white, over a neat little bridge spanning a river the color of flint, and past a sixteenth-century church of unexpected grandeur to the far side of the town, where a pair of electric gates were discreetly set back from the road. A handsome young Filipino man, wearing what appeared to be deck shoes and an over-large coat, was attempting to prise these open manually. When he caught sight of the land cruiser, he mimed to Robin to wind down her window. Frozen, he told her succinctly. Wait a moment, please. They sat for five minutes until at last he had succeeded in unfreezing the gates and had dug a clearing in the steadily falling snow to allow the gates to swing open. Do you want to lift back to the house? Robin asked him. He climbed into the back seat beside Strike's crutches. You friends of Mr. Chard? He's expecting us, said Strike evasively. Up a long and winding private driveway they went, the land cruiser making easy work of the heaped, crunchy overnight fall. The shiny dark green leaves of the rhododendrons lining the path had refused to bear their load of snow, so that the approach was all black and white, 
walls of dense foliage crowded in on the pale, powdery drive. Tiny spots of light had started popping in front of Robin's eyes. It had been a very long time since breakfast, and of course, Strike had eaten all the biscuits. Her feeling of seasickness and a slight sense of unreality persisted as she got down out of the Toyota and looked up at Tithe Barn House, which stood beside a dark patch of wood that pressed close to one side of the house. The massive oblong structure in front of them had been converted by an adventurous architect. Half of the roof had been replaced by sheet glass, the other seemed to be covered in solar panels. Looking up at the place where the structure became transparent and skeletal against the bright light grey sky made Robin feel even giddier. It reminded her of the ghastly picture on Strike's phone, the vaulted space of glass and light in which Quine's mutilated body had lain. Are you all right? said Strike, concerned. She looked very pale. Fine, said Robin, who wanted to maintain her heroic status in his eyes. Taking deep lungfuls of the frosty air, she followed Strike, surprisingly nimble on his crutches, up the gravel path towards the entrance. Their young passenger had disappeared without another word to them. Daniel Chard opened the front door himself. He was wearing a mandarin-collared, smock-like shirt in chartreuse silk and loose linen trousers. Like Strike, he was on crutches, his left foot and calf encased in a thick surgical boot and strapping. Chard looked down at Strike's dangling empty trouser leg and for several painful seconds did not seem able to look away. And you thought you had problems, said Strike holding out his hand. The small joke fell flat. Chard did not smile. The aura of awkwardness, of otherness, that had surrounded him at his firm's party clung to him still. He shook Strike's hand without looking at him in the eye, and his welcoming words were, I've been expecting you to cancel all morning. No, we made it, said Strike unnecessarily. This is my assistant, Robin, who's driven me down. I hope... No, she can't sit outside in the snow, said Chard though without noticeable warmth. Come in. He backed away on his crutches to let them move over the threshold onto the highly polished floorboards the colour of honey. Would you mind removing your shoes? A stocky, middle-aged Filipina woman with her black hair in a bun emerged from a pair of swing doors set into the brick wall on their right. She was clothed entirely in black and holding two white linen bags into which Robin and Strike were evidently expected to put their footwear. Robin handed hers over. It made her feel strangely vulnerable to feel the boards beneath her soles. Strike merely stood there on his single foot. Oh, said Chard, staring again. No, I suppose. Mr. Strike had better keep his shoe on, Anita. The woman retired wordlessly into the kitchen. Somehow, the interior of Tithe Barn House increased Robin's unpleasant sensation of vertigo. No walls divided its vast interior. The first floor which was reached by a steel and glass spiral staircase, was suspended on thick metal cables from the high ceiling. Chard's huge double bed, which seemed to be of black leather, was visible high above them, with what looked like a huge crucifix of barbed wire hanging over it on the brick wall. Robin dropped her gaze hastily, feeling sicker than ever. Most of the furniture on the lower level comprised cubes of white or black leather. Vertical steel radiators were interspersed with artfully simple bookshelves of more wood and metal. The dominant feature of the underfurnished room was a life-size white marble sculpture of an angel, perched on a rock and partially dissected to expose half of her skull, a portion of her guts, and a slice of the bone in her leg. Her breast, Robin saw, unable to tear her eyes away, was revealed as a mound of flat globules sitting on a circle of muscle that resembled the gills of a mushroom. Ludicrous to feel sick when the dissected body was made of cold, pure stone, mere insentient albacence, nothing like the rotting carcass preserved on Strike's mobile. Don't think about that. She ought to have made Strike leave at least one biscuit. Sweat had broken out on her upper lip, her scalp. You all right, Robin? asked Strike sharply. She knew she must have changed colour from the look on the two men's faces, and to her fear that she might pass out, was added embarrassment that she was being a liability to strike. Sorry, she said through numb lips. Long journey. If I could have a glass of water. Uh, very well, said Chard, as though water were in short supply. Nanita, the woman in black, reappeared. The young lady needs a glass of water, said Chard. Nanita gestured to Robin to follow her. Robin heard the publisher's crutches making a gentle thump-thump behind her on the wooden floor as she entered the kitchen. 
she had a brief impression of steel surfaces and whitewashed walls, and the young man to whom she had given a lift prodding at a large saucepan, then found herself sitting on a low stool. Robin had assumed that Chard had followed to see that she was all right, but as Nanita pressed a cold glass into her hand, she heard him speak somewhere above her. Thanks for fixing the gates, Manny. The young man did not reply. Robin heard the clunk of Chard's crutches recede and the swinging of the kitchen doors. That's my fault, Strike told Chard, when the publisher rejoined him. He felt truly guilty. I ate all the food she brought for the journey. And Anita can give her something, said Chard. Shall we sit down? Strike followed him past the marble angel, which was reflected mistily in the warm wood below, and they headed on their four crutches to the end of the room, where a black iron wood burner made a pool of welcome warmth. Great place, said Strike, lowering himself onto one of the larger cubes of black leather and laying his crutches beside him. The compliment was insincere. His preference was for utilitarian comfort, and Chard's house seemed to him to be all surface and show. Yes, I work closely with the architects, said Chard, with a small flicker of enthusiasm. There's a studio, he pointed through another discreet pair of doors, and a pool. He too sat down, stretching out the leg that ended in the thick, strapped boot in front of him. How did it happen? Strike asked, nodding towards the broken leg. Chard pointed with the end of his crutch at the metal and glass spiral staircase. Painful, said Strike, eyeing the drop. The crack echoed all through the place, said Chard, with an odd relish. I hadn't realized one can actually hear it happening. Would you like a tea or coffee? Tea would be great. Strike saw Chard place his uninjured foot on a small brass plate beside his seat. Slight pressure, and Manny emerged again from the kitchen. Tea, please, Manny, said Chard, with a warmth conspicuously absent in his usual manner. The young man disappeared again, sullen as ever. Is that St. Michael's Mount? Strike asked, pointing to a small picture hanging near the wood burner. It was a naive painting on what seemed to be bored. An Alfred Wallace, said Chard, with another minor glow of enthusiasm. The simplicity of the forms, primitive and naive. My father knew him. Wallace only took up painting seriously in his seventies. You know, Cornwall, I grew up there, said Strike. But Chard was more interested in talking about Alfred Wallace. He mentioned again that the artist had only found his true métier late in life and embarked on an exposition of the artist's works. Strike's total lack of interest in the subject went unnoticed. Chard was not fond of eye contact. The publisher's eyes slid from the painting to spots around the large brick interior, seeming to glance at Strike only incidentally. You're just back from New York, aren't you? asked Strike when Chard drew breath. A three-day conference, yes, said Chard and the flare of enthusiasm faded. He gave the impression of repeating stop phrases as he said, Challenging times. The arrival of electronic reading devices has been a game-changer. Do you read? he asked Strike, point-blank. Sometimes, said Strike. There was a battered James Elroy in his flat that he had been intending to finish for four weeks, but most nights he was too tired to focus. His favorite book lay in one of the unpacked boxes of possessions on the landing. It was twenty years old and he had not opened it for a long time. We need readers, muttered Daniel Chard. More readers, fewer writers. Strike suppressed the urge to retort. Well, you got rid of one of them at least. Manny reappeared bearing a clear perspex tray on legs, which he set down in front of his employer. Chard leaned forward to pour the tea into tall white porcelain mugs. His leather furniture, Strike noted, did not emit the irritating sounds his own office sofa did. But then... It had probably cost ten times as much. The backs of Chard's hands were as raw and painful-looking as they had been at the company party, and in the clear overhead lighting, set into the underside of the hanging first floor, he looked older than he had at a distance. Sixty, perhaps, yet the dark, deep-set eyes, the hawkish nose, and the thin mouth were handsome still in their severity. He's forgotten the milk, said Chard, scrutinizing the tray. Do you take milk? Yeah said Strike. Chard sighed, but instead of pressing the brass plate on the floor, he struggled back onto his one sound foot and his crutches, and swung off towards the kitchen, leaving Strike staring thoughtfully after him. Those who worked with him found Daniel Chard peculiar, although Nina had described him as shrewd. His uncontrolled rages about Bombix Mori 
had sounded to strike like the reaction of an oversensitive man of questionable judgment. He remembered the slight sense of embarrassment emanating from the crowd as Chard mumbled his speech at the anniversary party. An odd man, hard to read. Strike's eyes drifted upwards. Snow was falling gently onto the clear roof high above the marble angel. The glass must be heated in some way to prevent the snow settling, Strike concluded. And the memory of Quine, eviscerated and trussed, burned and rotting beneath a great vaulted window returned to him. Like Robin, he suddenly found the high glass ceiling of Tithe Barn House unpleasantly reminiscent. Chard re-emerged from the kitchen and swung back across the floor on his crutches, a small jug of milk held precariously in his hand. You'll be wondering why I asked you to come here, said Chard finally, when he had sat back down, and each of them held his tea at last. Strike arranged his features to look receptive. I need somebody I can trust, said Chard, without waiting for Strike's answer. Someone outside the company. One darting glance at Strike, and he fixed his eyes safely on his Alfred Wallace again. I think, said Chard, I may be the only person who's realized that Owen Quine did not work alone. He had an accomplice. An accomplice? Strike repeated at last, as Chard seemed to expect a response. Yes, said Chard fervently. Oh, yes. You see, the style of Bombix Mori is Owen's, but somebody else was in on it. Someone helped him. Chard's sallow skin had flushed. He gripped and fondled the handle of one of the crutches beside him. The police will be interested, I think, if this can be proven, said Chard, managing to look striped full in the face. If Owen was murdered because of what was written in Bombix Mori, wouldn't an accomplice be culpable? Culpable? repeated Strike. You think this accomplice persuaded Quine to insert material in the book in the hope that a third party would retaliate murderously? I... well, I'm not sure said Chard, frowning. He might not have expected that to happen precisely, but he certainly intended to wreak havoc. His knuckles were whitening as they tightened on the handle of his crutch. What makes you think Quine had help? asked Strike. Owen couldn't have known some of the things that are insinuated in Bombix Mori unless he'd been fed information, said Chard, now staring at the side of his stone angel. I think the police's main interest in an accomplice, said Strike slowly, would be because he or she might have a lead on the killer. It was the truth, but it was also a way of reminding Chard that a man had died in grotesque circumstances. The identity of the murderer did not seem to be of pressing interest to Chard. Do you think so? asked Chard with a faint frown. Yes, said Strike. I do. And they'd be interested in an accomplice if they were able to shed light on some of the more oblique passages in the book. One of the theories the police are bound to be following is that someone killed Quine to stop him revealing something that he had hinted at in Bombix Mori. Daniel Chard was staring at Strike with an arrested expression. Yes, I hadn't. Yes. To Strike's surprise, the publisher pulled himself up on his crutches and began to move a few paces backwards and forwards, swinging on his crutches in a parodic version of those first tentative physiotherapy exercises Strike had been given years previously at Selly Oak Hospital. Strike saw now that he was a fit man, that biceps rippled beneath the silk sleeves. The killer, then, Chard began, and then, what? He snapped suddenly, staring over Strike's shoulder. Robin had re-emerged from the kitchen, a much healthier colour. I'm sorry, she said, pausing, unnerved. This is confidential, said Chard. No, I'm sorry. Could you return to the kitchen, please? I... all right, said Robin, taken aback. And Strike could tell, offended. She threw him a look, expecting him to say something, but he was silent. When the swing doors had closed behind Robin, Chard said angrily, Now I've lost my train of thought. Entirely lost. You were saying something about the killer. Yes, yes, said Chard manically resuming his backwards and forwards motion, swinging on his crutches. The killer, then, if they knew about the accomplice, might want to target him, too. And perhaps that's occurred to him, said Chard, more to himself than to strike, his eyes on his expensive floorboards. Perhaps that accounts... Yes. The small window in the wall nearest strike showed only the dark face of the wood close by the house, white flecks falling dreamily against the black. Disloyalty said Chard suddenly. Cuts at me like nothing else. 
He stopped his agitated thumping up and down and turned to face the detective. If, he said, I told you who I suspect to have helped Owen and asked you to bring me proof, would you feel obliged to pass that information to the police? It was a delicate question, thought Strike, running a hand absently over his chin, imperfectly shaved in the haste of leaving that morning. If you're asking me to establish the truth of your suspicions, said Strike slowly. Yes, said Chard. Yes, I am. I would like to be sure. Then no, I don't think I'd need to tell the police what I'm up to. But if I uncovered the fact that there was an accomplice, and it looked like they might have killed Quine, or knew who had done it, I'd obviously consider myself duty-bound to inform the police. Chard lowered himself back onto one of the large leather cubes, dropping his crutches with a clatter on the floor. Damn, he said, his displeasure echoing off the many hard surfaces around them as he leaned over to check that he had not dented the varnished wood. You know I've also been engaged by Quine's wife to try and find out who killed him, Strike asked. I had heard something of the sort, said Chard, still examining his teak floorboards for damage. That won't interfere with this line of inquiry, though. His self-absorption was remarkable, Strike thought. He remembered Chard's copperplate writing on the card with the painting of violets. Do let me know if there is anything you need. Perhaps his secretary had dictated it to him. Would you like to tell me who the alleged collaborator is? asked Strike. This is extremely painful, mumbled Chard, his eyes flitting from Alfred Wallace to the stone angel and up to the spiral stairs. Strike said nothing. It's Jerry Waldegrave said Chard, glancing at Strike and away again. And I'll tell you why I suspect, how I know. His behavior has been strange for weeks. I first noticed it when he telephoned me about Bombix Mori to tell me what Quine had done. There was no embarrassment, no apology. Would you have expected Walter Grave to apologize for something Quine had written? The question seemed to surprise Chard. Well, Owen was one of Jerry's authors, so yes, I would have expected some regret that Owen had depicted me in that, in that way. And Strike's unruly imagination again showed him the naked Phallus Impudicus standing over the body of a dead young man emitting supernatural light. Are you and Waldegrave on bad terms? he asked. I've shown Jerry Waldegrave a lot of forbearance, a considerable forbearance, said Chard, ignoring the direct question. I kept him on full pay while he went to a treatment facility a year ago. Perhaps he feels hard done by, said Chard. But I've been on his side, yes, on occasions when many another man, a more prudent man, might have remained neutral. Jerry's personal misfortunes are not of my making. There is resentment. Yes, I would say there is definite resentment, however unjustified. Resentment about what? asked Strike. Jerry isn't fond of Michael Fancourt, mumbled Chard his eyes on the flames in the wood burner. Michael had a, a flirtation a long time ago with Fenella, Jerry's wife. As it happens, I actually warned Michael off because of my friendship with Jerry. Yes, said Chard, nodding, deeply impressed by the memory of his own actions. I told Michael it was unkind and unwise, even in his state of... because Michael had lost his first wife, you see, not very long before. Michael didn't appreciate my unsolicited advice. He took offence. He took off for a different publisher. The board was very unhappy, said Chard. It's taken us twenty-odd years to lure Michael back. But after all this time, Chard said, his bald pate merely one more reflective surface among the glass, polished wood and steel, Jerry can hardly expect his personal animosities to govern company policy. Ever since Michael agreed to come back to Roper Chard, Jerry has made it his business to, to undermine me, subtly, in a hundred little ways. What I believe happened is this, said Chard, glancing from time to time at Strike, as though to gauge his reaction. Jerry took Owen into his confidence about Michael's deal, which we were trying to keep under wraps. Owen had, of course, been an enemy of Fancourt's for a quarter of a century. Owen and Jerry decided to concoct this, this dreadful book in which Michael and I are subjected to, to disgusting calumnies, as a way of drawing attention away from Michael's arrival and as an act of revenge on both of us, on the company, on anyone else they cared to denigrate. And most tellingly, said Chard, his voice echoing now through the empty space, after I told Jerry explicitly to make sure the manuscript was locked safely away, 
he allowed it to be read widely by anyone who cared to do so, and having made sure it's being gossiped about all over London, he resigns and leaves me looking— When did Waldegrave resign? asked Strike. The day before yesterday, said Chard, before plunging on. And he was extremely reluctant to join me in legal action against Quine. That itself shows— Perhaps he thought bringing in lawyers would draw more attention to the book, Strike suggested. Walter Graves in Bombix Murray himself, isn't he? That, said Chard, and sniggered. It was the first sign of humour Strike had seen in him, and the effect was unpleasant. You don't want to take everything at face value, Mr. Strike. Owen never knew about that. About what? The Cutter character is Jerry's own work. I realised it on a third reading, said Chard. Very, very clever. It looks like an attack on Jerry himself, but it's really a way of causing Fenella pain. They are still married, you see, but very unhappily. Very unhappily. Yes, I saw it all on rereading, said Chard. The spotlights in the hanging ceiling made rippled reflections on his skull as he nodded. Owen didn't write the cutter. He barely knows Fenella. He didn't know about that old business. So what exactly are the bloody sack and the dwarf supposed to? Get it out of Jerry, said Chard. Make him tell you. Why should I help him spread slander around? I've been wondering, Strike said, obediently dropping that line of inquiry, why Michael Fancourt agreed to come to rope a Chard when Quine was working for you given that they were on such bad terms. There was a short pause. We were under no legal obligation to publish Owen's next book, said Chard. We had a first-look option, that was all. So you think Jerry Waldegrave told Quine that he was about to be dropped, to keep Fancourt happy? Yes, said Chard, staring at his own fingernails. I do. Also, I had offended Owen the last time I saw him, so the news that I might be about to drop him no doubt swept away any last vestige of loyalty he might have once felt towards me because I took him on when every other publisher in Britain had given up on. How did you offend him? Oh, it was when he last came into the office. He brought his daughter with him. Orlando. Named, he told me, for the eponymous protagonist of the novel by Virginia Woolf. Chard hesitated, his eyes flickering to strike and then back to his nails. She's not quite right, his daughter. Really? said strike. In what way? Mentally, mumbled Chard. I was visiting the art department when they came in. Owen told me he was showing her around, something he had no business doing, but Owen always made himself at home. Great sense of entitlement and self-importance, always. His daughter grabbed at a mock-up cover, grubby hands. I seized her wrist to stop her ruining it. He mimed the action in mid-air. With the remembrance of this act of near desecration came a look of distaste. It was instinctive, you know, a desire to protect the image— but it upset her very much. There was a scene, very embarrassing and uncomfortable, mumbled Chard, who seemed to suffer again in retrospect. She became almost hysterical. Owen was furious. That, no doubt, was my crime. That, and bringing Michael Fancourt back to Roper Chard. Who, Strike asked, would you think had most reason to be upset at their depiction in Bombix Mori? I really don't know, said Chard. After a short pause, he said, well, I doubt Elizabeth Tassel was delighted to see herself portrayed as parasitic after all the years of shepherding Owen out of parties to stop him making a drunken fool of himself. But I'm afraid, said Chard coldly, I haven't got much sympathy for Elizabeth. She allowed that book to go out unread. Criminal carelessness. Did you contact Fancourt after you'd read the manuscript? asked Strike. He had to know what Quine had done, said Chard. Better by far that he heard it from me. He was just home from receiving the pre prevo in Paris. I did not make that call with relish. How did he react? Michael's resilient, muttered Chard. He told me not to worry, said that Owen had done himself more harm than he had done us. Michael rather enjoys his enmities. He was perfectly calm. Did you tell him what Quine had said or implied about him in the book? Of course, said Chard. I wouldn't let him hear it from anyone else. And he didn't seem upset. He said... The last word will be mine, Daniel. The last word will be mine. What did you understand by that? Oh, well, Michael's a famous assassin, said Chard with a small smile. He can flay anyone alive in five well-chosen. When I say assassin, said Chard, suddenly and comically anxious, 
Naturally, I'm talking in literary. Of course, Strike reassured him. Did you ask Fancourt to join you in legal action against Quine? Michael despises the courts as a means of redress in such matters. You knew the late Joseph North, didn't you? Asked Strike conversationally. The muscles in Chard's face tightened, a mask beneath the darkening skin. That was a very long time ago. North was a friend of Quine's, wasn't he? I turned down Joe North's novel, said Chard. His thin mouth was working. That's all I did. Half a dozen other publishers did the same. It was a mistake, commercially speaking. It had some success, posthumously. Of course, he added dismissively, I think Michael largely rewrote it. Quine resented you turning his friend's book down. Yes, he did. He made a lot of noise about it. But he came to rope a chard anyway. There was nothing personal in my turning down Joe North's book, said Chard, with heightened colour. Owen came to understand that, eventually. There was another uncomfortable pause. So, when you're hired to find a criminal of this type, said Chard, changing subject with palpable effort, do you work with the police on that, or— Oh, yeah, said Strike, with a wry remembrance of the animosity he had recently encountered from the force, but delighted that Chard had played so conveniently into his hands. I've got great contacts at the Met. Your movements don't seem to be giving them any cause for concern, he said, with faint emphasis on the personal pronoun. The provocative, slippery phrasing had its full effect. The police have looked into my movements. Chard spoke like a frightened boy, unable to muster even a pretense of self-protective sang-froid. Well, you know, everyone depicted in Bombix Mori was bound to come in for scrutiny from the police, said Strike casually, sipping his tea. And everything you people did after the fifth, when Quine walked out and his wife, taking the book with him, will be of interest to them. And to Strike's great satisfaction, Chard began at once to review his own movements aloud, apparently for his own reassurance. Well, I didn't know anything about the book at all until the seventh, he said, staring at his bound-up foot again. I was down here when Jerry called me. I headed straight back to London. Manny drove me. I spent the night at home. Manny and Nanita can confirm that. On the Monday I met with my lawyers at the office, talked to Jerry. I was at a dinner party that night, close friends in Notting Hill, and again Manny drove me home. I turned in early on Tuesday because on Wednesday morning I was going to New York. I was there until the 13th, home all day the 14th, on the 15th. Chard's mumbling deteriorated into silence. Perhaps he had realised that there was not the slightest need for him to explain himself to strike. The darting look he gave the detective was suddenly cagey. Chard had wanted to buy an ally. Strike could tell that he had suddenly awoken to the double-edged nature of such a relationship. Strike was not worried. He had gained more from the interview than he had expected. To be unhired now would cost him only money. Manny came padding back across the floor. You want lunch? he asked Chard curtly. In five minutes, said Chard with a smile. I must say goodbye to Mr. Strike first. Manny stalked away on rubber-soled shoes. He's sulking, Chard told Strike with an uncomfortable half-laugh. They don't like it down here. They prefer London. He retrieved his crutches from the floor and pushed himself back up into a standing position. Strike, with more effort, imitated him. And how is, um, Mrs. Quine? Chart said, with an air of belatedly ticking off the proprieties as they swung, like strange three-legged animals, back towards the front door. Big red-headed woman, yes? No, said Strike. Thin, greying hair. Oh, said Chard without much interest. I met someone else. Strike paused beside the swing doors that led to the kitchen. Chard halted too, looking aggrieved. I'm afraid I need to get on, Mr. Strike. So do I, said Strike pleasantly. But I don't think my assistant would thank me for leaving her behind. Chard had evidently forgotten the existence of Robin, whom he had so peremptorily dismissed. Oh, yes, of course. Manny! Nanita, she's in the bathroom, said the stocky woman, emerging from the kitchen holding the linen bag containing Robin's shoes. The wait passed in a faintly uncomfortable silence. At last Robin appeared, her expression stony, and slipped her feet back into her shoes. The cold air bit their warm faces as the front door swung open, while Strike shook hands with Chard. Robin moved directly to the car and climbed into the driver's seat without speaking to anyone. Manny reappeared in his thick coat. I'll come down with you, he told Strike, to check the gates. 
They can buzz the house if they're stuck, Manny, said Chard, but the young man paid no attention, clambering into the car as before. The three of them rode in silence back down the black and white drive, through the falling snow. Manny pressed the remote control he had brought with him, and the gate slid open without difficulty. Thanks, said Strike, turning to look at him in the back seat. Afraid you've got a cold walk back. Manny sniffed, got out of the car, and slammed the door. Robin had just shifted into first gear when Manny appeared at Strike's window. She applied the brake. Yeah, said Strike, winding the window down. I didn't push him, said Manny fiercely. Sorry? Down the stairs, said Manny. I didn't push him. He's lying. Strike and Robin stared at him. You will believe me? Yeah, said Strike. Okay, then, said Manny, nodding at them. Okay. He turned and walked, slipping a little in his rubber-soled shoes, back up to the house. Chapter 30 As an earnest of friendship and confidence, I'll acquaint you with a design that I have, to tell truth, and speak openly one to another. William Congreve, Love for Love At Strike's insistence, they stop for lunch at the Burger King at Tiverton Services. You need to eat something before we go up the road. Robin accompanied him inside with barely a word, making no reference even to Manny's recent startling assertion. Her cold and slightly martyred air did not entirely surprise Strike, but he was impatient with it. She queued for their burgers, because he could not manage both tray and crutches, and when she had set down the loaded tray at the small formica table, he said, trying to diffuse the tension, Look, I know you expected me to tell Chard off for treating you like staff. I didn't, Robin contradicted him automatically. Hearing him say it aloud made her feel petulant, childish. Have it your own way, said Strike, with an irritable shrug, taking a large bite of his first burger. They ate in disgruntled silence for a minute or two, until Robin's innate honesty reasserted itself. All right, I did, a bit, she said. Mellowed by greasy food and touched by her admission, Strike said, I was getting good stuff out of him, Robin. You don't start picking arguments with interviewees when they're in full flow. Sorry for my amateurishness, she said, stung all over again. Oh, for Christ's sake, he said. Who's calling you? What were you intending when you took me on? She demanded suddenly, letting her unwrapped burger fall back into the tray. The latent resentment of weeks had suddenly burst its bounds. She did not care what she heard. She wanted the truth. Was she a typist and a receptionist, or was she something more? Had she stayed with Strike and helped him climb out of penury merely to be shunted aside like domestic staff? Intending? repeated Strike, staring at her. What do you mean, intent? I thought you meant me to be... I thought I was going to get some, some training, said Robin, pink-cheeked and unnaturally bright-eyed. You've mentioned it a couple of times, but then lately you've been talking about getting someone else in. I took a pay cut, she said tremulously. I turned down better paid jobs. I thought you meant me to be... Her anger, so long suppressed, was bringing her to the verge of tears, but she was determined not to give in to them. The fictional partner whom she had been imagining for strike would never cry. Not that no-nonsense ex-policewoman, tough and unemotional through every crisis. I thought you meant me to be... I didn't think I was just going to answer the phone. You don't just answer the phone, said Strike, who had just finished his first burger and was watching her struggle with her anger from beneath his heavy brows. You've been casing murder suspects' houses with me this week. You just saved both our lives on the motorway. But Robin was not to be deflected. What were you expecting me to do when you kept me on? I don't know that I had any particular plan, Strike said slowly and untruthfully. I didn't know you were this serious about the job, looking for training. How could I not be serious? demanded Robin loudly. A family of four in the corner of the tiny restaurant was staring at them. Robin paid them no attention. She was suddenly livid. The long, cold journey, Strike eating all the food, his surprise that she could drive properly, her relegation to the kitchen with charred servants, and now this. You give me half, half what that human resources job would have paid. Why do you think I stayed? I helped you. I helped you solve the Lula Landry. Okay, said Strike, holding up a large, hairy-backed hand. Okay, here it is. But don't blame me if you don't like what you're about to hear. She stared at him, flushed, straight-backed on her plastic chair, her food untouched. I did take you on thinking I could train you up. I didn't have any money for courses, but I thought you could learn on the job until I could afford it. 
Refusing to feel mollified until she heard what was coming next, Robin said nothing. You've got a lot of aptitude for the job, said Strike. But you're getting married to someone who hates you doing it. Robin opened her mouth and closed it again. A sensation of having been unexpectedly winded had robbed her of the power of speech. You leave on the dot every day. I do not, said Robin, furious. In case you hadn't noticed, I turned down a day off to be here now, driving you all the way to Devon. Because he's away, said Strike. Because he won't know. The feeling of having been winded intensified. How could Strike know that she had lied to Matthew, if not in fact, then by omission? Even then, whether that's true or not, she said unsteadily, it's up to me what I do with my... It's not up to Matthew what career I have. I was with Charlotte sixteen years, on and off, said Strike, picking up his second burger. Mostly off. She hated my job. It's what kept breaking us up. One of the things that kept breaking us up, he corrected himself, scrupulously honest. She couldn't understand a vocation. Some people can't. At best, work's about status and paychecks for them. It hasn't got value in itself. He began unwrapping the burger while Robin glared at him. I need a partner who can share the long hours, said Strike. Someone who's okay with weekend work. I don't blame Matthew for worrying about you. He doesn't. The words were out of her mouth before Robin could consider them. In her blanket desire to refute everything that Strike was saying, she had let an unpalatable truth escape her. The fact was that Matthew had very little imagination. He had not seen Strike covered in blood after the killer of Lula Landry had stabbed him. Even her description of Owen Quine lying trussed and disemboweled seemed to have been blurred for him by the thick miasma of jealousy through which he heard everything connected to Strike. His antipathy for her job owed nothing to protectiveness, and she had never admitted as much to herself before. It can be dangerous, what I do, said Strike, through another huge bite of burger, as though he had not heard her. I've been useful to you, said Robin, her voice thicker than his, though her mouth was empty. I know you have. I wouldn't be where I am now if I hadn't had you said Strike. Nobody was ever more grateful than me for a temping agency's mistake. You've been incredible. I couldn't have... Don't bloody cry. That family's gawping enough already. I don't give a monkeys, said Robin, into a handful of paper napkins, and Strike laughed. If it's what you want, he told the top of her red-gold head, you can go on a surveillance course when I've got the money. But if you're my partner in training... There'll be times that I'm going to have to ask you to do stuff that Matthew might not like. That's all I'm saying. You're the one who's going to have to work it out. And I will, said Robin, fighting to contain the urge to bawl. That's what I want. That's why I stayed. Then cheer the fuck up and eat your burger. Robin found it hard to eat with a huge lump in her throat. She felt shaken but elated. She had not been mistaken. Strike had seen in her what he possessed himself. They were not people who worked merely for the paycheck. So, tell me about Daniel Chard, she said. He did so while the nosy family of four gathered up their things and left, still throwing covert glances at the couple they could not quite work out. Had it been a lover's tiff, a family row, how had it been so speedily resolved? Paranoid but eccentric, self-obsessed, concluded Strike five minutes later. But there might be something in it. Jerry Waldegrave could have collaborated with Quine. On the other hand, he might have resigned because he'd had enough of Chard, who I don't think would be an easy bloke to work for. Do you want a coffee? Robin glanced at her watch. The snow was still falling. She feared delays on the motorway that would prevent her catching the train to Yorkshire, but after their conversation, she was determined to demonstrate her commitment to the job, so she agreed to one. In any case... There were things she wished to say to Strike while she was still sitting opposite him. It would not be nearly as satisfying to tell him while in the driver's seat, where she could not watch his reaction. I found out a bit about Chard myself, she said, when she had returned with two cups and an apple pie for Strike. Servants gossip? No, said Robin. They barely said a word to me while I was in the kitchen. They both seemed in foul moods. According to Chard, they don't like it in Devon, prefer London. Are they brother and sister? Mother and son, I think, said Robin. He called her Mamo. Anyway, I asked to go to the bathroom and the staff lose just next to an artist's studio. Daniel Chard knows a lot about anatomy, said Robin. 
There are prints of Leonardo da Vinci's anatomical drawings all over the walls, and an anatomical model in one corner. Creepy, wax. And on the easel, she said, was a very detailed drawing of Manny the manservant, lying on the ground, in the nude. Strike put down his coffee. Those are very interesting pieces of information, he said slowly. I thought you'd like them, said Robin, with a demure smile. Shines an interesting sidelight on Manny's assurance that he didn't push his boss down the stairs. They really didn't like you being there, said Robin, but that might have been my fault. I said you were a private detective, but Nanita, her English isn't as good as Manny's, didn't understand, so I said you were a kind of policeman, leading them to assume that Chard had invited me over to complain about Manny's violence towards him. Did Chard mention it? Not a word, said Strike. Much more concerned about Walder Graves' alleged treachery. After visits to the bathroom, they returned to the cold, where they had to screw up their eyes against oncoming snow as they traversed the car park. A light frosting had already settled over the top of the Toyota. You're going to make it to King's Cross, right? said Strike, checking his watch. Unless we hit trouble on the motorway, said Robin, surreptitiously touching the wood trim on the door's interior. They had just reached the M4, where there were weather warnings on every sign, and where the speed limit had been reduced to sixty, when Strike's mobile rang. Ill, sir, what's going on? Hi, Corm. Well, it could be worse. They haven't arrested her, but there was some intense questioning. Strike turned the mobile onto speakerphone for Robin's benefit, and together they listened, similar frowns of concentration on their faces as the car moved through a vortex of swirling snow, rushing the windscreen. They definitely think it's her, said Ilsa. Based on what? Opportunity, said Ilsa, and her manner. She really doesn't help herself. Very grumpy at being questioned and kept talking about you, which put their backs up. She said you'll find out who really did it. Bloody hell, said Strike, exasperated. And what was in the lockup? Oh, yeah, that. It was a burned, blood-stained rag in among a pile of junk. Big effing deal, said Strike. Could have been there for years. Forensics will find out, but I agree. It's not much to go on, seeing as they haven't even found the guts yet. You know about the guts. Everyone knows about the guts now, Corm. It's been on the news. Strike and Robin exchanged fleeting looks. When? Lunchtime. I think the police knew it was about to break and brought her in to see if they could squeeze anything out of her before it all became common knowledge. It's one of their lot who leaked it, said Strike angrily. That's a big accusation. I had it from the journalist who was paying the copper to talk. Know some interesting people, don't you? Comes with the territory. Thanks for letting me know, Ilsa. No problem. Try and keep her out of jail, Corm. I quite like her. Who is that? Robin asked, as Ilsa hung up. Old school friend from Cornwall, lawyer. She's married to one of my London mates, said Strike. I put Leonora onto her because... Shit. They had rounded a bend to find a huge tailback ahead of them. Robin applied the brake, and they drew up behind a Peugeot. Shit repeated Strike, with a glance at Robin's set profile. Another accident, said Robin. I can see flashing lights. Her imagination showed her Matthew's face if she had to telephone him and say she was not coming, that she had missed the sleeper, his mother's funeral. Who misses a funeral? She should have been there already, at Matt's father's house, helping with arrangements, taking some of the strain. Her weekend bag ought already to have been sitting in her old bedroom at home, her funeral clothes pressed and hanging in her old wardrobe, everything ready for the short walk to the church the following morning. They were burying Mrs. Cunliffe, her future mother-in-law, but she had chosen to drive off into the snow with Strike, and now they were gridlocked, two hundred miles from the church, where Matthew's mother would be laid to rest. He'll never forgive me. He'll never forgive me if I miss the funeral because I did this. Why did she have to have been presented with such a choice, today of all days? Why did the weather have to be so bad? Robin's stomach churned with anxiety, and the traffic did not move. Strike said nothing, but turned on the radio. The sound of Take That filled the car, singing about there being progress now, where once there was none. The music grated on Robin's nerves, but she said nothing. The line of traffic moved forward a few feet. Oh, please, God, let me get to King's Cross on time, prayed Robin inside her head. For three quarters of an hour they crawled through the snow, the afternoon light fading fast around them. What had seemed a vast ocean of time until the departure of the night train was starting to feel to Robin 
like a rapidly draining pool in which she might shortly be sitting alone, marooned. Now they could see the crash ahead of them. The police, the lights, a mangled polo. You'll make it, said Strike, speaking for the first time since he had turned on the radio as they waited their turn to be waved forwards by the traffic cop. It'll be tight, but you'll make it. Robin did not answer. She knew it was all her fault, not his. He had offered her the day off. It was she who had been insistent on coming with him to Devon. She who had lied to Matthew about the availability of train seats today. She ought to have stood all the way from London to Harrogate, rather than miss Mrs. Cunliffe's funeral. Strike had been with Charlotte sixteen years, on and off, and the job had broken them. She did not want to lose Matthew. Why had she done this? Why had she offered to drive Strike? The traffic was dense and slow. By five o'clock they were travelling in thick rush-hour traffic outside Reading, and crawled to a halt again. Strike turned up the news when it came on the radio. Robin tried to care what they would say about Quine's murder, but her heart was in Yorkshire now, as though it had leapfrogged the traffic and all the implacable snowy miles between her and home. The police have confirmed today that murdered author Owen Quine, whose body was discovered six days ago in a house in Barons Court, London, was murdered in the same way as the hero of his last unpublished book. No arrest has yet been made in the case. Detective Inspector Richard Anstis, who was in charge of the investigation, spoke to reporters earlier this afternoon. Anstis, Strike noted, sounded stilted and tense. This was not the way he would have chosen to release the information. We're interested in hearing from everyone who had access to the manuscript of Mr. Quine's last novel. Can you tell us exactly how Mr. Quine was killed, Detective Inspector? asked an eager male voice. We're waiting for a full forensic report, said Anstis, and he was cut across by a female reporter. Can you confirm that parts of Mr. Quine's body were removed by the killer? Part of Mr. Quine's intestines were taken away from the scene, said Anstis. We're pursuing several leads, but we would appeal to the public for any information. This was an appalling crime, and we believe the perpetrator to be extremely dangerous. Not again, said Robin desperately and Strike looked up to see a wall of red lights ahead. Not another accident. Strike slapped off the radio, unwound his window, and stuck his head out into the whirling snow. No, he shouted to her. Someone's stuck at the side of the road, in a drift. We'll be moving again in a minute, he reassured her. But it took another forty minutes for them to clear the obstruction. All three lanes were packed, and they resumed their journey at little more than a crawl. I'm not going to make it, said Robin her mouth dry, as they finally reached the edge of London. It was twenty past ten. You are, said Strike. Turn that bloody thing off, he said, thumping the sat nad into silence, and don't take that exit. But I got to drop you. Forget me. You don't need to drop me. Next left. I can't go down there. It's one way. Left, he bellowed, tugging the wheel. Don't do that. It's dead. Do you want to miss this bloody funeral? Put your foot down. First right. Where are we? I know what I'm doing, said Strike, squinting through the snow. Straight on. My mate Nick's dad's a cabbie. He taught me some stuff. Right again. Ignore the bloody no-entry sign. Who's coming out of there on a night like this? Straight on and left at the lights. I can't just leave you at King's Cross, she said, obeying his instructions blindly. You can't drive it. What are you going to do with it? Sod the car, I'll think of something. Up here. Take the second right. At five to eleven... The towers of St. Pancras appeared to Robin like a vision of heaven through the snow. Pull over, get out and run, said Strike. Call me if you make it. I'll be here if you don't. Thank you. And she had gone, sprinting over the snow with her weekend bag dangling from her hand. Strike watched her vanish into the darkness, imagined her skidding a little on the slippery floor of the station, not falling, looking wildly around for the platform. She had left the car, on his instructions, at the curb on a double line. If she made the train, he was stranded in a higher car he couldn't drive, and which would certainly be towed. The golden hands on the St. Pancras clock moved inexorably towards eleven o'clock. Strike saw the train door slamming shut in his mind's eye, Robin sprinting up the platform, red-gold hair flying. One minute passed. He fixed his eyes on the station entrance and waited. She did not reappear. Still he waited. Five minutes passed. Six minutes passed. His mobile rang. Did you make it? By the skin of me teeth, it was just about to leave. Cormoran, thank you, thank you so much. No problem, he said, 
looking around at the dark icy ground, the deepening snow. Have a good journey. I better sort myself out. Good luck for tomorrow. Thank you, she called as he hung up. He had owed her, Strike thought, reaching for his crutches. But that did not make the prospect of a journey across snowy London on one leg, or a hefty fine for abandoning a hire car in the middle of town, much more appealing. Chapter 31 Danger, the Spur of All Great Minds George Chapman, The Revenge of Bussy Dambois Daniel Chard would not have liked the tiny rented attic flat in Denmark Street, Strike thought, unless he could have found primitive charm in the lines of the old toaster or desk lamp, but there was much to say for it if you happened to be a man with one leg. His knee was still not ready to accept a prosthesis on Saturday morning, but surfaces were within grabbing reach. Distances could be covered in short hops. There was food in the fridge, hot water, and cigarettes. Strike felt a genuine fondness for the place today, with the window steamy with condensation and blurry snow visible on the sill beyond. After breakfast he lay on his bed, smoking, a mug of dark brown tea beside him on the box that served as a bedside table, glowering not with bad temper, but concentration. Six days, and nothing. No sign of the intestines that had vanished from Quine's body, nor of any forensic evidence that would have pegged the potential killer, for he knew that a rogue hair or print would surely have prevented yesterday's fruitless interrogation of Leonora. No appeals for further sightings of the concealed figure who had entered the building shortly before Quine had died, did the police think it a figment of the thick-lensed neighbor's imagination. No murder weapon, no incriminating footage of unexpected visitors to Talgarth Road, no suspicious ramblers noticing freshly turned earth, no mound of rotting guts revealed, wrapped in a black burqa, no sign of Quine's hold-all containing his notes for Bombix Mori. Nothing. Six days. He had caught killers in six hours, though admittedly those had been slapdash crimes of rage and desperation, where fountains of clues had gushed with the blood and the panicking, or incompetent culprits had splattered everyone in their vicinity with their lies. Quine's killing was different, stranger, and more sinister. As Strike raised his mug to his lips, he saw the body again as clearly as though he had viewed the photograph on his mobile. It was a theatre piece, a stage set. In spite of his strictures to Robin, Strike could not help asking himself, why had it been done? Revenge? Madness? Concealment? Of what? Forensic evidence obliterated by the hydrochloric acid, time of death obscured, Entrance and departure of the crime scene achieved without detection. Planned meticulously, every detail thought out. Six days and not a single lead. Strike did not believe Anstice's claim to have several. Of course, his old friend was no longer sharing information, not after the tense warnings to Strike to butt out, to keep away. Strike brushed ash absently off the front of his old sweater and lit a fresh cigarette from the stub of the old one. We believe the perpetrator to be extremely dangerous, Anstis had said to the reporters, a statement in Strike's view that was both painfully obvious and strangely misleading. And a memory came to him, the memory of the great adventure of Dave Polworth's eighteenth birthday. Polworth was Strike's very oldest friend. They had known each other since nursery. Through childhood and adolescence, Strike had moved away from Cornwall regularly and then returned, the friendship picking up again wherever Strike's mother and her whims had last interrupted it. Dave had an uncle who had left for Australia in his teens and was now a multimillionaire. He had invited his nephew to come and stay for his eighteenth birthday and to bring a mate. Across the world the two teenagers had flown. It had been the best adventure of their young lives. They had stayed in Uncle Kevin's massive beachside house, all glass and shining wood, with a bar in the sitting room. Diamond sea spray in a blinding sun and enormous pink prawns on a barbecue skewer. The accents, the beer, more beer, the sort of butterscotch limb blondes you never saw in Cornwall, and then, on Dave's actual birthday, the shark. They're only dangerous if they're provoked, said Uncle Kevin, who liked his scuba diving. No touching, lads, all right? No arsing around. But for Dave Polworth, who loved the sea, who surfed, fished, and sailed at home, arsing around was a way of life. A killer born, with its flat dead eyes and its ranks of stiletto teeth, but Strike had witnessed the black tip's lazy indifference as they swam over it, awed by its sleek beauty. 
It would have been content to glide away through the azure gloom, he knew that, but Dave was determined to touch. He had the scar still. The shark had torn away a tidy chunk of his forearm, and he had only partial feeling in his right thumb. It had not affected his ability to do his job. Dave was a civil engineer in Bristol now, and they called him Chum in the Victory Inn where he and Strike still met to drink Doombar on their visits home. Stubborn, reckless, a thrill-seeker to his core, Polworth still scuba-dived in his free time, though he left the basking sharks of the Atlantic well alone. There was a fine crack on the ceiling over Strike's bed. He did not think he had ever noticed it before. His eyes followed it as he remembered the shadow on a seabed and a sudden cloud of black blood, the thrashing of Dave's body in a silent scream. The killer of Owen Quine was like that black tip, he thought. There were no frenzied, indiscriminate predators among the suspects in this case. None of them had a known history of violence. There was not, as so often when bodies turned up, a trail of past misdemeanors leading to the door of a suspect, no blood-stained past dragging behind any of them like a bag of offal for hungry hounds. This killer was a rarer, stranger beast, the one who concealed their true nature until sufficiently disturbed. Owen Quine, like Dave Polworth, had recklessly taunted a murderer in waiting and unleashed horror upon himself. Strike had heard the glib assertion many times that everyone had it in them to kill, but he knew this to be a lie. There were undoubtedly those to whom killing was easy and pleasurable. He had met a few such. Millions had been successfully trained to end others' lives. He, Strike, was one of them. Humans killed opportunistically for advantage and in defense, discovering in themselves the capacity for bloodshed when no alternative seemed possible. But there were also people who were drawn up short, even under the most intense pressure, unable to press their advantage, to seize the opportunity to break the final and greatest taboo. Strike did not underestimate what it had taken to bind, batter, and slice open Owen Quine. The person who had done it had achieved their goal without detection, successfully disposed of the evidence, and appeared not to be exhibiting sufficient distress or guilt to alert anyone. All of this argued a dangerous personality, a highly dangerous personality, if disturbed. While they believed themselves to be undetected and unsuspected, there was no danger to anybody around them. But if touched again, touched perhaps in the place where Owen Quine had managed to touch them. Fuck, murmured Strike, dropping his cigarette hastily into the ashtray beside him. It had burned down to his fingers without him noticing. So what was he to do next? If the trail away from the crime was practically non-existent, Strike thought, he must pursue the trail towards the crime. If the aftermath of Quine's death was unnaturally devoid of clues, it was time to look at his last few days of life. Strike picked up his mobile and sighed deeply, looking at it. Was there, he asked himself, any other way of getting at the first piece of information he sought? He ran through his extensive list of acquaintances in his head, discarding options as quickly as they occurred. Finally, and without much enthusiasm, he concluded that his original choice was most likely to bring in the goods, his half-brother Alexander. They shared a famous father, but had never lived under the same roof. Al was nine years younger than Strike, and was Johnny Rokeby's legitimate son, which meant that there was virtually no point of coincidence in their lives. Al had been privately educated in Switzerland, and he might be anywhere right now, in Rokeby's L.A. residence, on a rapper's yacht, even a white Australian beach, for Rokeby's third wife was from Sydney. And yet of his half-siblings on his father's side, Al had shown himself more willing than any of the others to forge a relationship with his older brother. Strike remembered Al visiting him in hospital after his leg had been blown off, an awkward encounter, but touching in retrospect. Al had brought with him to Selly Oak an offer from Rokeby that could have been made by mail, financial help in starting Strike's detective business. Al had announced the offer with pride, considering it evidence of his father's altruism. Strike had been sure that it was no such thing. He suspected that Rokeby or his advisers had been nervous about the one-legged, decorated veteran selling his story. The offer of a gift was supposed to stop his mouth. Strike had turned down his father's largesse, and then been refused by every single bank to which he applied for a loan. He had called Al back with immense reluctance, refusing to take the money as a gift, 
turning down a proffered meeting with his father, but asking whether he could have a loan. This had evidently caused offence. Rokeby's lawyer had subsequently pursued Strike for his monthly payments with all the zeal of the most rapacious bank. Had Strike not chosen to keep Robin on his payroll, the loan would have already been cleared. He was determined to repay it before Christmas, determined not to be beholden to Johnny Rokeby, which was why he had taken on a workload that had lately seen him working eight or nine hours, seven days a week. None of this made the prospect of calling his younger brother for a favour any more comfortable. Strike could understand Al's loyalty to a father whom he clearly loved, but any mention between them of Rokeby was necessarily charged. Al's number rang several times, and finally went to voicemail. As relieved as he was disappointed, Strike left a brief message asking Al to call him and hung up. Lighting his third cigarette since breakfast, Strike reverted to his contemplation of the crack in the ceiling. The trail towards the crime. So much depended on when the killer had seen the manuscript, had recognized its potential as a blueprint for murder. And, once again, he flicked through the suspects as though they were a hand of cards he had been dealt, examining their potentialities. Elizabeth Tassel, who made no secret of the rage and pain Bombix Mori had caused her. Catherine Kent, who claimed not to have read it at all. The still unknown Pippa 2011, to whom Quine had read parts of the book back in October. Jerry Waldegrave, who had had the manuscript on the 5th, but might, if Chard was to be believed, have known what was in there way before. Daniel Chard, who claimed that he had not seen it until the 7th. And Michael Fancourt, who had heard about the book from Chard. Yes, there were sundry others, peeking and peering and giggling at the most salacious parts of the book, emailed all over London by Christian Fisher. But Strike found it very hard to work up even the vaguest of cases against Fisher, young Ralph in Tassel's office, or Nina Lascelles, none of whom were featured in Bombix Mori, nor had really known Quine. He needed, Strike thought, to get closer. Close enough to ruffle the people whose lives had already been mocked and distorted by Owen Quine. With only a little more enthusiasm than he had brought to the task of calling Al, he scrolled through his contact list and called Nina Lascelles. It was a brief call. She was delighted. Of course he could come over tonight. She cooked. Strike could think of no other way to probe for further details of Jerry Waldegrave's private life, or for Michael Fancourt's reputation as a literary assassin, but he did not look forward to the painful process of reattaching his prosthesis, not to mention the effort it would require to detach himself again, tomorrow morning, from Nina Lascelles hopeful clutches. However, he had Arsenal versus Aston Villa to watch before he needed to leave. Painkillers, cigarettes, bacon and bread. Preoccupied with his own comfort, a mixture of football and murder on his mind, it did not occur to strike to glance down into the snowy street where shoppers, undeterred by the freezing weather, were gliding in and out of the music stores, the instrument makers and the cafes. Had he done so, he might have seen the willowy hooded figure in the black coat leaning against the wall between numbers six and eight, staring up at his flat. Good as his eyesight was, however, he would have been unlikely to spot the Stanley knife being turned rhythmically between long, fine fingers. Chapter 32 Rise, my good angel, whose holy tunes beat from me that evil spirit which jogs mine elbow. Thomas Decker, the noble Spanish soldier. Even with snow chains on its tires, the old family Land Rover driven by Robin's mother had had a hard job of it between York Station and Massam. The wipers made fan-shaped windows, swiftly obliterated, onto roads familiar to Robin since childhood, now transformed by the worst winter she had seen in many years. The snow was relentless and the journey, which should have taken an hour, lasted nearly three. There had been moments when Robin had thought she might yet miss the funeral. At least she had been able to speak to Matthew on her mobile, explaining that she was close. He had told her that several others were still miles away, that he was afraid his aunt from Cambridge might not make it at all. At home, Robin had dodged the slobbering welcome of their old chocolate Labrador and hurtled upstairs to her room, pulling on the black dress and coat without bothering to iron them, laddering her first pair of tights in her haste, then running back downstairs to the hall where her parents and brothers were waiting for her. They walked together through the swirling snow beneath black umbrellas, 
Up the gentle hill Robin had climbed every day of her primary school years, and across the wide square that was the ancient heart of her tiny hometown, their backs to the giant chimney of the local brewery. The Saturday market had been cancelled. Deep channels had been made in the snow by those few brave souls who had crossed the square that morning, footprints converging near the church, where Robin could see a crowd of black-coated mourners. The roofs of the pale gold Georgian houses lining the square wore mantles of bright, frozen icing, and still the snow kept coming. A rising sea of white was steadily burying the large square tombstones in the cemetery. Robin shivered as the family edged towards the doors of St. Mary the Virgin, past the remnant of a ninth-century round-shafted cross that had a curiously pagan appearance. And then, at last, she saw Matthew, standing in the porch with his father and sister, pale and heart-stoppingly handsome in his black suit. As Robin watched, trying to catch his eye over the queue, a young woman reached up and embraced him. Robin recognized Sarah Shadlock, Matthew's old friend from university. Her greeting was a little more lascivious, perhaps, than was appropriate in the circumstances. But Robin's guilt about having come within ten seconds of missing the overnight train, about not having seen Matthew in nearly a week, made her feel she had no right to resent it. Robin, he said urgently when he saw her, and he forgot to shake three people's hands as he held out his arms to her. As they hugged, she felt tears prickle beneath her eyelids. This was real life after all. Matthew, and home. Go and sit at the front, he told her, and she obeyed, leaving her family at the back of the church to sit in the front pew with Matthew's brother-in-law, who was dandling his baby daughter on his knee and greeted Robin with a morose nod. It was a beautiful old church, and Robin knew it well from the Christmas, Easter, and harvest services she had attended all her life with her primary school and family. Her eyes travelled slowly from familiar object to familiar object, High above her, over the chancel arch, was a painting by Sir Joshua Reynolds, or at least the school of Joshua Reynolds, and she fixed upon it, trying to compose her mind. A misty, mystical image, the boy angel contemplating the distant vision of a cross emitting golden rays. Who had really done it, she wondered? Reynolds, or some studio acolyte? And then, she felt guilty that she was indulging her perennial curiosity, instead of feeling sad about Mrs. Cunliffe. She had thought that she would be marrying here in a few weeks' time. Her wedding dress was hanging ready in the spare room's wardrobe, but instead, here was Mrs. Cunliffe's coffin coming up the aisle, shining black, with silver handles. Owen Quine still in the morgue, no shiny coffin for his disemboweled body yet, rotted and burned. Don't think about that, she told herself sternly, as Matthew sat down beside her, the length of his leg warm against hers. The last twenty-four hours had been so packed with incident that it was hard for Robin to believe she was here, at home. She and Strike might have been in hospital. They had come close to slamming head first into that overturned lorry. The driver covered in blood. Mrs. Cunliffe was probably unscathed in her silk-lined box. Don't think about that. It was as though her eyes were being stripped of a comfortable soft focus. Maybe seeing things like bound and disemboweled bodies did something to you, changed the way you saw the world. She knelt a little late for prayer, the cross-stitched hassock rough beneath her freezing knees. Poor Mrs. Connor, except that Matthew's mother had never much liked her. Be kind, Robin implored herself, even though it was true. Mrs. Cunliffe had not liked the idea of Matthew being tied to the same girlfriend for so long. She had mentioned within Robin's hearing how good it was for young men to play the field, sow their wild oats. The way in which Robin had left university had tainted her, she knew, in Mrs. Cunliffe's eyes. The statue of Sir Marmaduke Wyville was facing Robin from mere feet away. As she stood for the hymn, he seemed to be staring at her in his Jacobean dress, life-sized and horizontal on his marble shelf, propped up at his elbow to face the congregation. His wife lay beneath him in an identical pose. They were oddly real in their irreverent poses, cushions beneath their elbows to keep their marble bones comfortable, and above them, in the spandrels, allegorical figures of death and mortality, till death was be part, and her thoughts drifted again. She and Matthew, tied together forever until they died. No, not tied. Don't think tied. What's wrong with you? She was exhausted. The train had been overheated and jerky, 
She had woken on the hour, afraid that it would get stuck in the snow. Matthew reached for her hand, and squeezed her fingers. The burial took place as quickly as decency allowed, the snow falling thick around them. There was no lingering at the graveside, Robin was not the only one perceptibly shivering. Everyone went back to the Cunliffe's big brick house, and milled around in the welcome warmth. Mr. Cunliffe, who was always a little louder than the occasion warranted, kept filling glasses, and greeting people as though it were a party. I've missed you, Matthew said. It's been horrible without you. Me too, said Robin. I wish I could have been here. Lying again. Auntie Sue's staying tonight, said Matthew. I thought I could maybe come over to your place. Be good to get away for a bit. It's been full on this week. Great, yes, said Robin, squeezing his hand. Grateful that she would not have to stay at the Cunliffe's. She found Matthew's sister hard work, and Mr. Cunliffe overbearing. But you could have put up with it for a night, she told herself sternly. It felt like an undeserved escape. And so they returned to the Ellicott's house, a short walk from the square. Matthew liked her family. He was glad to change out of his suit into jeans, to help her mother lay the kitchen table for dinner. Mrs. Ellicott, an ample woman with Robin's red-gold hair, tucked up in an untidy bun, treated him with gentle kindness. She was a woman of many interests and enthusiasms, currently doing an open university degree in English literature. How are the studies going, Linda? Matthew asked, as he lifted the heavy casserole dish out of the oven for her. We're doing Webster, the Duchess of Malfi, and I'm grown mad with it. Difficult, is it? asked Matthew. That's a quotation, love. Oh. She dropped the serving spoons onto the side with a clatter. That reminds me. I bet I've missed it. She crossed the kitchen and snatched up a copy of the Radio Times, always present in their house. No, it's on at nine. There's an interview with Michael Fancourt I want to watch. Michael Fancourt? said Robin, looking round. Why? He's very influenced by all those revenge tragedians, said her mother. I'm hoping he'll explain the appeal. Seen this, said Robin's youngest brother, Jonathan, fresh back from the corner shop with the extra milk requested by his mother. It's on the front page, Rob, that writer with his guts ripped out. John, said Mrs. Ellicott sharply. Robin knew that her mother was not reprimanding her son out of any suspicion that Matthew would not appreciate mention of her job, but because of a more general aversion to discussing sudden death in the aftermath of the burial. What? said Jonathan, oblivious to the proprieties, shoving the Daily Express under Robin's nose. Quine had made the front page, now that the press knew what had been done to him. Horror author wrote own murder. Horror author, Robin thought. He was hardly that, but it makes a good headline. Is your boss going to solve it, do you reckon? Jonathan asked her, thumbing through the paper. Show up the Met again? She began to read the account over Jonathan's shoulder, but caught Matthew's eye and moved away. A buzzing issued from Robin's handbag, discarded in a sagging chair in the corner of the flag kitchen, as they ate their meal of stew and baked potatoes. She ignored it. Only when they had finished eating and Matthew was dutifully helping her mother clear the table, did Robin wander to her bag to check her messages. To her great surprise, she saw a missed call from Strike, with a surreptitious glance at Matthew, who was busily stacking plates in the dishwasher. She called voicemail while the others chatted. You have one new message. Received today at 7.20 p.m. The crackle of an open line, but no speech. Then a thud, a yell in the distance from Strike. No, you don't, you fucking— A bellow of pain. Silence. The crackle of the open line. Indeterminate crunching, dragging sounds. Loud panting. A scraping noise. The line dead. Robin stood aghast. The phone pressed against her ear. What's the matter? asked her father glasses halfway down his nose, as he paused on the way to the dresser, knives and forks in his hand. I think, I think my boss has, has had an accident. She pressed Strike's number with shaking fingers. The call went straight to voicemail. Matthew was standing in the middle of the kitchen watching her, his displeasure undisguised. Chapter 33 Hard Fate When Women Are Compelled to Woo Thomas Decker and Thomas Middleton, The Honest Whore Strike did not hear Robin calling because, unbeknownst to him, his mobile had been knocked onto silent when it had hit the ground fifteen minutes previously. Nor was he aware that his thumb had hit Robin's number as the phone slipped through his fingers. He had only just left his building when it happened. 
The door onto the street had swung shut behind him, and he had had two seconds, with his mobile in his hand, waiting for a ring back from the cab he had reluctantly ordered, when the tall figure in the black coat had come running at him through the darkness. A blur of pale skin beneath a hood and a scarf, her arm outstretched, inexpert but determined, with the knife pointing directly at him in a wavering clutch. Bracing himself to meet her, he had almost slipped again, but, slamming his hand to the door, he steadied himself and the mobile fell. Shocked and furious with her, whoever she was, for the damage her pursuit had already done to his knee, he bellowed. She checked for a split second, then came at him once more. As he swung his stick at the hand in which he had already seen the Stanley knife, his knee twisted again. He let out a roar of pain, and she let back, as though she had stabbed him without knowing it, and then, for the second time, she had panicked and taken flight, sprinting away through the snow, leaving a furious and frustrated strike unable to give chase, and with no choice but to scrabble around in the snow for his phone. Fuck this leg! When Robin called him, he was sitting in a crawling taxi, sweating with pain. It was small consolation that the tiny triangular blade he had seen glinting in his pursuer's hand had not pierced him. His knee, to which he had felt obliged to fit the prosthesis before setting up for Nina's, was excruciating once more, and he was burning with rage at his inability to give chase to his mad stalker. He had never hit a woman, never knowingly hurt one, but the sight of the knife coming at him through the dark had rendered such scruples void. For the consternation of the taxi driver, who was watching his large, furious-looking passenger in the rear-view mirror, Strike kept twisting in his seat, in case he saw her walking along the busy Saturday night pavements, round-shouldered in her black coat, her knife concealed in her pocket. The cab was gliding beneath the Christmas lights of Oxford Street, large, fragile parcels of silver wrapped with golden bows, and Strike fought his ruffled temper as they travelled, feeling no pleasure at the thought of his imminent dinner date. Again and again Robin called him, but he could not feel the mobile vibrating because it was deep in his coat pocket, which lay beside him on the seat. Hi, said Nina with a forced smile, when she opened the door to her flat half an hour after the agreed time. Sorry I'm late, said Strike, limping over the threshold. I had an accident leaving the house. My leg. He had not brought her anything, he realized, standing there in his overcoat. He should have brought wine or chocolates, and he felt her notice it as her big eyes roved over him. She had good manners herself, and he felt suddenly a little shabby. And I've forgotten the wine I'd bought you, he lied. This is crap. Chuck me out. As she laughed, though unwillingly, Strike felt the phone vibrate in his pocket and automatically pulled it out. Robin. He could not think why she wanted him on a Saturday. Sorry, he told Nina. Gotta take this. Urgent. It's my assistant. Her smile slipped. She turned and walked out of the hall, leaving him there in his coat. Robin? Are you all right? What happened? How did you— I've got a voicemail that sounds like a recording of you being attacked. Christ, did I call you? Must have been when I dropped the phone. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. Five minutes later, having told Robin what had happened, he hung up his coat and followed his nose to the sitting room, where Nina had laid a table for two. The room was lamplit. She had tidied, put fresh flowers around the place. A strong smell of burnt garlic hung in the air. Sorry, he repeated as she returned, carrying a dish. Wish I had a nine-to-five job sometimes. Help yourself to wine, she said coolly. The situation was deeply familiar. How often had he sat opposite a woman who was irritated by his lateness, his divided attention, his casualness? But here at least it was being played out in a minor key. If he had been late for dinner with Charlotte, and taken a call from another woman as soon as he had arrived, he might have expected a full face of wine and flying crockery. That thought made him feel more kindly towards Nina. Detectives make shit dates, he told her as he sat down. I wouldn't say shit, she replied, softening. I don't suppose it's the sort of job you can leave behind. She was watching him with her huge, mouse-like eyes. I had a nightmare about you last night, she said. Getting off to a flying start, aren't we? said Strike and she laughed. Well, not really about you. We were together looking for Owen Quine's intestinal tract. She took a big swig of wine, gazing at him. Did we find it? Strike asked, trying to keep things light. Yes. Where? 
I'll take any leads at this point. In Jerry Waldergrave's bottom desk drawer, said Nina, and he thought he saw her repress a shudder. It was horrible, actually. Blood and guts when I opened it, and you hit Jerry. It woke me up, it was so real. She drank more wine, not touching her food. Strike, who had already taken several hearty mouthfuls, far too much garlic, but he was hungry, felt he was being insufficiently sympathetic. He swallowed hastily and said, Sounds creepy. It's because of what was on the news yesterday, she said, watching him. Nobody realized, nobody knew he'd, he'd been killed like that, like Bombex Mori. You didn't tell me, she said, and a whiff of accusation reached him through the garlic fumes. I couldn't, said Strike. It's up to the police to release that kind of information. It's on the front page of the Daily Express today. He'd have liked that, Owen, being a headline. But I wish I hadn't read it, she said, with a furtive look at him. He had met these qualms before. Some people recoiled once they realized what he had seen, or done, or touched. It was as though he carried the smell of death on him. There were always women who were attracted by the soldier, the policeman. They experienced a vicarious thrill, a voluptuous appreciation that the violence a man might have seen or perpetrated. Other women were repelled. Nina, he suspected, had been one of the former, but now that the reality of cruelty, sadism, and sickness had been forced on her, she was discovering that she might, after all, belong in the second camp. It wasn't fun at work yesterday, she said. Not after we'd heard that. Everyone was... It's just, if he was killed that way, if the killer copied the book, it limits the possible suspects, doesn't it? Nobody's laughing about Bombix Mori anymore, I can tell you that. It's like one of Michael Fancourt's old plots, back when the critics said he was too grisly, and Jerry's resigned. I heard. I don't know why, she said restlessly. He's been at Roper Chart ages. He's not being himself at all, angry all the time, and he's usually so lovely. And he's drinking again. A lot. She was still not eating. Was he close to Quine? Strike asked. I think he was closer than he thought he was, said Nina slowly. They'd worked together quite a long time. Owen drove him mad. Owen drove everyone mad. But Jerry's really upset, I can tell. I can't imagine Quine enjoying being edited. I think he was tricky sometimes, said Nina. But Jerry won't hear a word against Owen now. He's obsessed by his breakdown theory. You heard him at the party. He thinks Owen was mentally ill and Bombix Mori wasn't really his fault. And he's still raging against Elizabeth Tassel for letting the book out. She came in the other day to talk about one of her other authors. Dorcas Pengelly, Strike asked, and Nina gave a little gasp of laughter. You don't read that crap? Heaving bosoms and shipwrecks. The name stuck in my mind, said Strike, grinning. Go on about Waldegrave. He saw Liz coming and slammed his office door as she walked past. You've seen it. It's glass, and he nearly broke it. Really unnecessary and obvious. It made everyone jump out of their skins. She looks ghastly, added Nina. Liz Tassel. Awful. If she'd been on form, she'd have stormed into Jerry's office and told him not to be so bloody rude. Would she? Are you crazy? Liz Tassel's temper is legendary. Nina glanced at her watch. Michael Fancourt's being interviewed on the telly this evening. I'm recording it, she said, refilling both their glasses. She still had not touched her food. Wouldn't mind watching that, said Strike. She threw him an oddly calculating look, and Strike guessed that she was trying to assess how much his presence was due to a desire to pick her brains, how much designs on her slim, boyish body. His mobile rang again. For several seconds he weighed the offence he might cause if he answered it, versus the possibility that it might herald something more useful than Nina's opinions about Jerry Waldegrave. Sorry he said, and pulled it out of his pocket. It was his brother, Al. Coram, said the voice over a noisy line. Great to hear from you, bruv. Hi, said Strike repressively. How are you? Great. I'm in New York. Only just got your message. What do you need? He knew that Strike would only call if he wanted something, but unlike Nina, Al did not seem to resent the fact. Wondering if you fancied dinner this Friday, said Strike. But if you're in New York... I'm coming back Wednesday. That'd be cool. Want me to book somewhere? Yeah, said Strike. It's got to be the River Cafe. I'll get on it, said Al, without asking why. Perhaps he assumed that Strike merely had a yen for good Italian. Text you the time, yeah? Look forward to it. Strike hung up, the first syllable of an apology already on his lips, but Nina had left for the kitchen. The atmosphere had undoubtedly curdled.
Chapter 34 O Lord, what have I said, my unlucky tongue? William Congreve, Love for Love Love is a mirage, said Michael Fancourt on the television screen. A mirage, a chimera, a delusion. Robin was sitting between Matthew and her mother on the faded, sagging sofa. The chocolate Labrador lay on the floor in front of the fire, his tail thumping lazily on the rug in his sleep. Robin felt drowsy after two nights of very little sleep and days of unexpected stresses and emotion, but she was trying hard to concentrate on Michael Fancourt. Beside her, Mrs. Ellicott, who had expressed the optimistic hope that Fancourt might let drop some bon mots that would help with her essay on Webster, had a notebook and pen on her lap. Surely, began the interviewer, but Fancourt talked over him. We don't love each other. We love the idea we have of each other. Very few humans understand this or can bear to contemplate it. They have blind faith in their own powers of creation. All love, ultimately, is self-love. Mr. Ellicott was asleep, his head back in the armchair closest to the fire and the dog. Gently he snored, with his spectacles halfway down his nose. All three of Robin's brothers had slid discreetly from the house. It was Saturday night, and their mates were waiting in the bay horse on the square. John had come home from university for the funeral, but did not feel he owed it to his sister's fiancé to forego a few pints of black sheep with his brothers, sitting in the dimpled copper tables by the open fire. Robin suspected that Matthew had wanted to join them, but that he had felt it would be unseemly. Now he was stuck watching a literary program he would never have tolerated at home. He would have turned over without asking her, taking it for granted that she could not possibly be interested in what this sour-looking, sententious man was saying. It was not easy to like Michael Fancourt, thought Robin. The curve of both his lip and his eyebrows implied an ingrained sense of superiority. The presenter, who was well known, seemed a little nervous. And that is the theme of your new... One of the themes, yes. Rather than castigating himself for his foolishness, when the hero realizes that he has simply imagined his wife into being, he seeks to punish the flesh-and-blood woman whom he believes has duped him. His desire for revenge drives the plot. Aha, said Robin's mother softly, picking up her pen. Many of us, most, perhaps, said the interviewer, consider love a purifying ideal, a source of selflessness rather than a self-justifying lie, said Fancourt. We are mammals who need sex, need companionship, who seek the protective enclave of the family for reasons of survival and reproduction. We select a so-called loved one for the most primitive reasons. My hero's preference for a pear-shaped woman is self-explanatory, I think. The loved one laughs or smells like the parent who gave one youthful sucker, and all else is projected. All else is invented. Friendship, began the interviewer a little desperately. If I could have brought myself to have sex with any of my male friends, I would have had a happier and more productive life said Fancourt. Unfortunately, I'm programmed to desire the female form, however fruitlessly. And so I tell myself that one woman is more fascinating, more attuned to my needs and desires than another. I am a complex, highly evolved, and imaginative creature who feels compelled to justify a choice made on the crudest grounds. This is the truth that we've buried under a thousand years of courtly bullshit. Robin wondered what on earth Fancourt's wife, for she seemed to remember that he was married, would make of this interview. Beside her, Mrs. Ellicott had written a few words on her notepad. He's not talking about revenge, Robin muttered. Her mother showed her the notepad. She had written, What a shit he is. Robin giggled. Beside her, Matthew leaned over to the Daily Express that Jonathan had left abandoned on a chair. He turned past the front three pages, where Strike's name appeared several times in the text alongside Owen Quine's, and began to read a piece on how a high street chain of stores had banned Cliff Richard's Christmas songs. You've been criticized, said the interviewer bravely, for your depiction of women, most particularly... I can hear the critics cockroach-like scurrying for their pens as we speak, said Fancourt, his lip curling in what passed for a smile. 
I can think of little that interests me less than what critics say about me or my work. Matthew turned a page of the paper. Robin glanced sideways at a picture of an overturned tanker, an upside-down Honda Civic, and a mangled Mercedes. That's the crash we were nearly in. What? said Matthew. She had said it without thinking. Robin's brain froze. That happened on the M4, Matthew said, half laughing at her for thinking she could have been involved, that she could not recognize a motorway when she saw one. Oh, oh, yes, said Robin, pretending to peer more closely at the text beneath the picture. But he was frowning now, catching up. Were you nearly in a car crash yesterday? He was speaking quietly, trying not to disturb Mrs. Ellicott, who was following Fancourt's interview. Hesitation was fatal. Choose. Yes, I was. I didn't want to worry you. He stared at her. On Robin's other side, she could feel her mother making more notes. This one, he said, pointing at the picture. And she nodded. Why were you on the M4? I had to drive Cormer into an interview. I'm thinking of women, said the interviewer. Your views on women. Where the hell was the interview? Devon, said Robin. Devon? He's boogered his leg again. He couldn't have got there by himself. You drove him to Devon. Yes, Matt, I drove him to... So that's why you didn't come up yesterday. So you could... Matt, of course not. He flung down the paper, pulled himself up, and strode from the room. Robin felt sick. She looked around at the door, which he had not slammed, but closed firmly enough to make her father stir and mutter in his sleep, and the Labrador wake up. Leave him, advised her mother, her eyes still on the screen. Robin swung round, desperate. Cormoran had to get to Devon, and he couldn't drive with only one leg. There's no need to defend yourself to me, said Mrs. Ellicott. But now he thinks I lied about not being able to get home yesterday. Did you? her mother asked, her eyes still fixed beadily upon Michael Fancourt. Get down, Roundtree. I can't see over you. Well, I could have come if I got a first-class ticket, Robin admitted as the Labrador yawned, stretched and resettled himself on the hearthrug. But I'd already paid for the sleeper. Matt's always going on about how much more money you would have made if you'd taken that HR job, said her mother, her eyes on the TV screen. I'd have thought he'd appreciate you saving the pennies. Now shush, I want to hear about revenge. The interviewer was trying to formulate a question. But where women are concerned, you haven't always contemporary mores, so-called political correctness. I'm thinking particularly of your assertion that female writers... This again said Fancourt, slapping his knees with his hands. The interviewer perceptibly jumped. I said that the greatest female writers, with almost no exception, have been childless, a fact. And I have said that women generally, by virtue of their desire to mother, are incapable of the necessarily single-minded focus anyone must bring to the creation of literature. True literature. I don't retract a word. That is a fact. Robin was twisting her engagement ring on her finger, torn between her desire to follow Matt and persuade him she had done nothing wrong, and anger that any such persuasion should be required. The demands of his job came first, always. She had never known him apologise for late hours, for jobs that took him to the far side of London and brought him home at eight o'clock at night. I was going to say, the interviewer hurried on, with an ingratiating smile, that this book might give those critics pause. I thought the central female character was treated with great understanding, with real empathy. Of course, he glanced down at his notes and up again. Robin could feel his nerves. Parallels are bound to be drawn. In dealing with the suicide of a young woman, I expect you're braced. You must be expecting that stupid people will assume that I have written an autobiographical account of my first wife's suicide. Well, it's bound to be seen as... It's bound to raise questions. Then let me say this, said Fancourt, and paused. They were sitting in front of a long window, looking out onto a sunny, windswept lawn. Robin wondered fleetingly when the program had been filmed, before the snows had come clearly. But Matthew dominated her thoughts. She ought to go and find him, yet somehow she remained on the sofa. When F. Ellie died, began Fancourt, when she died, the close-up felt painfully intrusive. The tiny lines at the corner of his eyes deepened as he closed them. A square hand flew to conceal his face. Michael Fancourt appeared to be crying. So much for love being in Mirage and a chimera, 
sighed Mrs. Ellicott, as she tossed down her pen. This is no good. I wanted blood and guts, Michael. Blood and guts. Unable to stand in action any longer, Robin got up and headed for the sitting-room door. These were not normal circumstances. Matthew's mother had been buried that day. It behoved her to apologize, to make amends. Chapter 35 We are all liable to mistake, sir. If you own it to be so, there needs no farther apology. William Congreve, The Old Bachelor The Sunday broadsheets next day strove to find a dignified balance between an objective assessment of Owen Quine's life and work and the macabre, gothic nature of his death. A minor literary figure, occasionally interesting, tipping latterly into self-parody, eclipsed by his contemporaries, but continuing to blaze his own outmoded trail, said the Sunday Times, in a front-page column that led to a promise of much more excitement within. A sadist's blueprint, see pages 10 to 11. And, beside a thumbnail photograph of Kenneth Halliwell, Books and Bookmen, Literary Killers, page 3, Culture. Rumours about the unpublished book that allegedly inspired his murder are now spreading beyond London's literary circles, the Observer assured its readers. Were it not for the dictates of good taste, Roper Chard would have had an instant bestseller on its hands. Kinky writer disemboweled in sex game, declared the Sunday people. Strike had bought every paper on his way home from Nina Lascelles, difficult though it was to manage them all and his stick over snowy pavements. It occurred to him, as he struggled towards Denmark Street, that he was unwisely encumbered, should his would-be assailant of the previous evening reappear, that she was nowhere to be seen. Later that evening, he worked his way through the news stories while eating chips, lying on his bed with his prosthetic leg mercifully removed once more. Viewing the facts through the press's distorting lens was stimulating to his imagination. At last, having finished Culpepper's piece in the News of the World, sources close to the story confirm that Quine liked to be tied up by his wife, who denies that she knew the kinky writer had gone to stay in their second home. Strike slid the papers off his bed, reached for the notebook he kept by his bed, and scribbled himself a list of reminders for the following day. He did not add Anstice's initial to any of the tasks or questions. But Bookshop Man and M.F. when filmed were both followed by a capital R. He then texted Robin, reminding her to keep her eyes peeled for a tall woman in a black coat the following morning and not to enter Denmark Street if she was there. Robin saw nobody answering that description on her short journey from the tube and arrived at the office at nine o'clock next morning to find Strike sitting at her desk and using her computer. Morning. No nutters outside. No one, said Robin hanging up her coat. How's Matthew? Fine, lied Robin. The aftermath of their row about her decision to drive strike to Devon clung to her like fumes. The argument had simmered and erupted repeatedly all through their car journey back to Clapham. Her eyes were still puffy from crying and lack of sleep. Tough for him, muttered Strike, still frowning at the monitor. His mother's funeral? Hmm, said Robin, moving to fill the kettle and feeling annoyed that Strike chose to empathize with Matthew today, exactly when she would have welcomed an assurance that he was an unreasonable prick. What are you looking at? she asked, setting a mug of tea at Strike's elbow, for which he gave her muttered thanks. Trying to find out when Michael Fancourt's interview was filmed, he said. He was on telly on Saturday night. I watch that, said Robin. Me too, said Strike. Arrogant prat, said Robin, sitting down on the mock leather sofa, which for some reason did not emit farting noises when she did it. Perhaps, thought Strike, it was his weight. Notice anything funny when he was talking about his late wife? Strike asked. The crocodile tears were a bit much, said Robin, seeing how he'd just been explaining how love's an illusion and all that rubbish. Strike glanced at her again. She had the kind of fair, delicate complexion that suffered from excess emotion. The swollen eyes told their own story. Some of her animosity towards Michael Fancourt, he guessed, might be displaced from another and perhaps more deserving target. I thought he was faking, did you? Strike asked. Me too. He glanced at his watch. I've got Caroline Ingalls arriving in half an hour. I thought she and her husband had reconciled. Old news. She wants to see me something about a text she found over his phone over the weekend. So, said Strike, heaving himself up from the desk, I need you to keep trying to find out when that interview was filmed. 
while I go and look over the case notes so I look like I can remember what the hell she's on about. Then I've got lunch with Quine's editor. And I've got some news about what the doctor's surgery outside Catherine Kent's flat does with medical waste, said Robin. Go on, said Strike. A specialist company collects it every Tuesday. <sighs> I contacted them, said Robin, and Strike could tell by her sigh that the line of inquiry was about to fizzle out, and they didn't notice anything odd or unusual about the bags they collected the Tuesday after the murder. I suppose, she said, it was a bit unrealistic, thinking they wouldn't notice a bag of human intestines. They told me it's usually just swabs and needles, and they're all sealed up in special bags. Had to check it out, though, said Strike, bracingly. That's good detective work. Cross off all the possibilities. Anyway, there's something else I need doing, if you can face the snow. I'd love to get out, said Robin, brightening at once. What is it? The man in the bookshop in Putney who reckons he saw Quine on the 8th, said Strike. He should be back off his holidays. No problem, said Robin. She had not had an opportunity over the weekend to discuss with Matthew the fact that Strike wished to give her investigative training. It would have been the wrong time before the funeral, and after their row on Saturday night would have seemed provocative, even inflammatory. Today she yearned to get out onto the streets, to investigate, to probe, and to go home and tell Matthew matter-of-factly what she had done. He wanted honesty, she would give him honesty. Caroline Ingalls, who was a worn-out blonde, spent over an hour in Strike's office that morning. When finally she had departed, looking tear-stained but determined, Robin had news for Strike. That interview with Fancourt was filmed on the 7th of November, she said. I phoned the BBC. Took ages, but I got there in the end. The 7th, repeated Strike. That was a Sunday. Where was it filmed? A film crew went down to his house in Chew Magna, said Robin. What did you notice on the interview that's making you this interested? Watch it again, said Strike. See if you can get it on YouTube. Surprised you didn't spot it at the time. Stung, she remembered Matthew beside her, interrogating her about the crash on the M4. I'm going to change for Simpsons, said Strike. We'll lock up and leave together, shall we? They parted forty minutes later at the Tube, Robin heading for the Bridlington bookshop in Putney, Strike for the restaurant on the Strand, to which he intended to walk. Spent way too much on taxis lately he told Robin gruffly, unwilling to tell her how much it had cost him to take care of the Toyota Land Cruiser with which he had been stranded on Friday night. Plenty of time. She watched him for a few seconds as he walked away from her, leaning heavily on his stick and limping badly. An observant childhood spent in the company of three brothers had given Robin an unusual and accurate insight into the frequently contrary reaction of males to female concern, but she had wondered how much longer Strike could force his knee to support him before he found himself incapacitated for longer than a few days. It was almost lunchtime, and the two women opposite Robin on the train to Waterloo were chatting loudly, carrier bags full of Christmas shopping between their knees. The floor of the tube was wet and dirty, and the air full again of damp cloth and stale bodies. Robin spent most of her journey trying without success to view clips of Michael Fancourt's interview on her mobile phone. The Bridlington bookshop stood on a main road in Putney, its old-fashioned paned windows crammed from top to bottom with a mixture of new and second-hand books, all stacked horizontally. A bell tinkled as Robin crossed the threshold into a pleasant, mildewed atmosphere. A couple of ladders stood propped against shelves crammed with more horizontally piled books, reaching all the way to the ceiling. Hanging bulbs lit the space, dangling so low that Strike would have banged his head. Good morning, said an elderly gentleman in an overlarge tweed jacket, emerging with almost audible creaks from an office with a dimpled glass door. As he approached, Robin caught a strong whiff of body odour. She had already planned her simple line of inquiry, and asked at once whether he had any Owen Quine in stock. Ah, ah, he said knowingly. I needn't ask, I think, why the sudden interest. A self-important man in the common fashion of the unworldly and cloistered, he embarked without invitation into a lecture on Quine's style and declining readability as he led her into the depths of the shop. He appeared convinced, after two seconds' acquaintance, that Robin could only be asking for a copy of one of Quine's books because he had recently been murdered. While this was, of course, the truth, it irritated Robin. 
Have you got the Balzac brothers? she asked. You'd know better than to ask for Bombix Mori, then, he said, shifting a ladder with his doddery hands. Three young journalists I've had in here asking for it. Why a journalist coming here? asked Robin innocently, as he began to climb the ladder, revealing an inch of mustard-colored sock above his old brogues. Mr. Quine shopped here shortly before he died, said the old man, now peering at spines some six feet above Robin. Balzac brothers, Balzac brothers, should be here. Dear, dear, I'm sure I've got a copy. He actually came in here, to your shop, asked Robin. Oh, yes. I recognized him instantly. I was a great admirer of Joseph North, and they once appeared on the same bill at the Hay Festival. He was coming down the ladder now, feet trembling with every step. Robin was scared he might fall. I'll check the computer, he said, breathing heavily. I'm sure I've got a Balzac Brothers here. Robin followed him, reflecting that if the last time the old man had set eyes on Owen Quine had been in the mid-eighties, his reliability in identifying the writer again might be questionable. I don't suppose you could miss him, she said. I've seen pictures of him, very distinctive looking in his Tyrolean cloak. His eyes are different colors, said the old man, now gazing at the monitor of an early Macintosh classic that must, Robin thought, be twenty years old. Beige, boxy, big clunky keys like cubes of toffee. You see it close up, one hazel, one blue. I think the policeman was impressed by my powers of observation and recall. I was in intelligence during the war. He turned upon her with a self-satisfied smile. I was right. We do have a copy. Second hand. This way. He shuffled towards an untidy bin full of books. That's a very important bit of information for the police, said Robin, following him. Yes, indeed, he said complacently. Time of death. Yes, I could assure them that he was alive, still, on the 8th. I don't suppose you could remember what he came in here for, said Robin with a small laugh. I'd love to know what he read. Oh, yes, I remember, said her companion at once. He bought three novels, Jonathan Franzen's Freedom, Joshua Ferris's The Unnamed, and, and I forget the third, told me he was going away for a break and wanted reading matter. We discussed the digital phenomenon. He more tolerant of reading devices than I. Somewhere in here, he muttered, raking in the bin. Robin joined the search half-heartedly. The eighth, she repeated. How could you be so sure it was the eighth? For the days, she thought, must blend quite seamlessly into each other in this dim atmosphere of mildew. It was a Monday, he said. A pleasant interlude, discussing Joseph North, of whom he had very fond memories. Robin was still none the wiser as to why he believed this particular Monday to have been the 8th, but before she could inquire further, he had pulled an ancient paperback from the depths of the bin with a triumphant cry. There we are! There we are! I knew I had it! I can never remember dates, Robin lied, as they returned to the till with their trophy. I don't suppose you've got any Joseph North while I'm here. There was only one, said the old man, towards the mark. Now I know we've got that, one of my personal favourites. And he headed once more for the ladder. I confuse days all the time, Robin soldiered on bravely, as the mustard-coloured socks were revealed again. Many people do, he said smugly, but I am an adept at reconstructive deduction. Ha-ha! <laughs> I remembered that it was a Monday, because always on a Monday I buy fresh milk, and I had just returned from doing so, when Mr. Quine arrived at the shop. She waited while he scanned the shelves above her head. I explained to the police that I was able to date the particular Monday precisely, because that evening I went to my friend Charles's house, as I do most Mondays, but I distinctly remembered telling him about Owen Quine arriving in my bookshop and discussing the five Anglican bishops who had defected to Rome that day. Charles is a lay preacher in the Anglican church. He felt it deeply. I see, said Robin, who was making a mental note to check the date of such a defection. The old man had found North's book and was slowly descending the ladder. Yes, I remember, he said with a spurt of enthusiasm. Charles showed me some remarkable pictures of a sinkhole that appeared overnight in Schmalkalden, Germany. I was stationed near Schmalkalden during the war. 
Yes, that evening I remember my friend interrupted me telling him about Quine visiting the shop. His interest in writers is negligible. Weren't you in Schmalkalden, he said. The frail, knobbly hands were busy at the till now. And he told me a huge crater had appeared. Extraordinary pictures in the paper next day. Memory is a wonderful thing, he said complacently, handing Robin a brown paper bag containing her two books and receiving her ten-pound note in exchange. I remember that sinkhole, said Robin, which was another lie. She took a mobile out of her pocket and pressed a few buttons while he conscientiously counted the change. Yes, here it is. Schmalkalden. How amazing. That huge hole appearing out of nowhere. But that happened, she said, looking up at him. On the 1st of November, not the 8th, he blinked. No, it was the 8th, he said, with all the conviction a profound dislike of being mistaken could muster. But see here, said Robin, showing him the tiny screen. He pushed his glasses up his forehead to stare at it. You definitely remember discussing Owen Quine's visit and the sinkhole in the same conversation. Some mistake, he muttered and whether he referred to the Guardian website himself or Robin was unclear. He thrust her phone back at her. You don't remember? Is that all? he said loudly, flustered. Then good day to you. Good day. And Robin, recognizing the stubbornness of an offended old egoist, took her leave to the tinkling of the bell. Chapter 36 Mr. Scandal, I shall be very glad to confer with you about these things which he has uttered. His sayings are very mysterious and hieroglyphical. William Congreve, Love for Love. Strike had thought that Simpsons in the Strand was an odd place for Jerry Waldegrave to want to meet for lunch, and his curiosity increased as he approached the imposing stone facade, with its revolving wooden doors, its brass plaques, and hanging lantern. Chess motifs decorated the tiled surround of the entrance. He had never set foot in there, aged institution though it was. He had assumed it to be the home of well-heeled businessmen and out-of-towners treating themselves. Yet Strike felt at home as soon as he set foot inside the lobby. Once an eighteenth-century gentleman's chess club, Simpson spoke to Strike in an old and familiar language of hierarchy, order, and stately decorum. Here were the dark, sludgy clubland colors that men chose without reference to their womenfolk. Thick marble columns and solid leather armchairs that would support a drunken dandy, and glimpsed beyond the double doors, past the coat-check girl, a restaurant full of dark wood panelling. He might have been back in one of the sergeant's messes he had frequented during his military career. All that was needed to make the place feel truly familiar were regimental colours and a portrait of the Queen. Solid wood back chairs, snowy tablecloths, silver salvers on which enormous joints of beef reposed. As Strike sat down at a table for two beside the wall, he found himself wondering what Robin would make of the place, whether she would be amused or irritated by its ostentatious traditionalism. He had been seated for ten minutes before Waldegrave appeared, peering myopically around the dining room. Strike raised a hand, and Waldegrave made his way with a shambling walk towards their table. Hello, hello. Nice to see you again. His light brown hair was as messy as ever, and his crumpled jacket had a smear of toothpaste on the lapel. A faint gust of vinous fumes reached Strike across the small table. Good of you to see me, said Strike. Not at all. Want to help? Hope you don't mind coming here. I chose it, said Waldegrave, because we won't run into anyone I know. My father brought me here once years ago. Don't think they've changed a thing. Waldegrave's round eyes, framed by his horn-rimmed glasses, travelled over the heavy moulded plaster work at the top of the dark wood panelling. It was stained ochre as though tarnished by long years of cigarette smoke. You get enough of your co-workers due in office hours, do you? Strike asked. Nothing wrong with them, said Jerry Waldegrave, pushing his glasses up his nose and waving at a waiter. But the atmosphere's poisonous just now. Glass of red, please, he told the young man who had answered his wave. I don't care, anything. But the waiter, on whose front a small night chess piece was embroidered, answered repressively, I'll send over the wine waiter, sir and retreated. See the clock over the doors as you come in here, Waldegrave asked Strike, pushing his glasses up his nose again. They say it stopped when the first woman came here in 1984. Little in-joke. And on the menu it says, Bill of Fare. They wouldn't use menu, you see, because it was French. My father loved that stuff. I just got into Oxford, that's why he brought me here. 
He hated foreign food. Strike could feel Waldegrave's nervousness. He was used to having that effect on people. Now was not the moment to ask whether Waldegrave had helped Quine write the blueprint for his murder. What did you do at Oxford? English, said Waldegrave with a sigh. My father was putting a brave face on it. He wanted me to do medicine. The fingers of Waldegrave's right hand played an arpeggio on the tablecloth. Things tense at the office, are they? asked Strike. You could say that, replied Waldegrave, looking around again for the wine waiter. It's sinking in. Now we know how Owen was killed. People are raising emails like idiots, pretending they never looked at the book, don't know how it ends. It's not so funny now. Was it funny before? asked Strike. Well, yeah, it was. When people thought Owen had just done a runner. People love seeing the powerful ridiculed, don't they? They aren't popular men, either of them, Fancourt and Chard. The wine waiter arrived and handed the list to Waldegrave. I'll get a bottle, shall I? said Waldegrave, scanning it. I take it this is on you. Yeah, said Strike. Not without trepidation. Waldegrave ordered a bottle of Chateau Les Angars, which Strike saw with profound misgiving cost nearly fifty quid, though there were bottles on the list that cost nearly two hundred. So, said Waldegrave with sudden bravado, as the wine waiter retreated, any leads yet? Know who did it? Not yet, said Strike. An uncomfortable beat followed. Waldegrave pushed his glasses up his sweaty nose. Sorry, he muttered. Crass, defense mechanism. It's. I can't believe it. I can't believe it happened. No one ever can, said Strike. On a rush of confidence, Waldegrave said, I can't shake this mad bloody idea that Owen did it to himself, that he'd staged it. Really, said Strike, watching Waldegrave closely. I know he can't have done, I know that. The editor's hands were playing a deaf scale on the edge of the table now. It's so, so theatrical, how he was, how he was killed, so, so grotesque, and the awful thing. Best publicity any author ever got his book. God, Owen loved publicity. Poor Owen. He once told me, this isn't a joke, he once told me in all seriousness that he liked to get his girlfriend to interview him. Said it clarified his thought processes. I said, what do you use as a mic? Taking the mickey, you know. And you know what the silly sod said? Byros, mostly. Whatever's around. Waldegrave burst into panting chuckles that sounded very like sobs. Poor, poor bastard, he said. Poor Silly bastard. Lost it completely at the end, didn't he? Well, I hope Elizabeth Tassel's happy. Winding him up. Their original waiter returned with a notebook. What are you having? The editor asked Strike, focusing short-sightedly on his bill of fare. The beef, said Strike, who had had time to watch it being carved from the silver salver on a trolley that circulated the tables. He had not had Yorkshire pudding in years. Not, in fact, since the last time he had gone back to St. Moore's to see his aunt and uncle. Waldegrave ordered Dover Soul, then craned his neck again to see whether the wine-waiter was returning. When he caught sight of the man approaching with the bottle, he noticeably relaxed, sinking more comfortably into his chair. His glass filled, he drank several mouthfuls before sighing like a man who had received urgent medical treatment. You were saying Elizabeth Tassel wound Quine up, Strike said. Eh? said Waldegrave, cupping his right hand around his ear. Strike remembered his one-sided deafness. The restaurant was indeed filling up, becoming noisier. He repeated his question more loudly. Oh, yeah, said Waldegrave. Yeah, about Fancourt. The pair of them liked brooding on the wrongs Fancourt did them. What wrongs? asked Strike. And Waldegrave swigged more wine. Fancourt's been bad-mouthing them both for years. Waldegrave scratched his chest absent-mindedly through his creased shirt and drank more wine. Owen, because of that parody of his dead wife's novel. Liz, because she stuck by Owen. Mind you, nobody's ever blamed Fancourt for leaving Liz Tassel. The woman's a bitch. Down to about two clients now. Twisted. Probably spends her evenings working out how much she lost. Fifteen percent of Fancourt's royalties is big money. Book of dinners, film premieres. Instead, she gets Quine interviewing himself for the biro and burnt sausages in Dorcas Pengelly's back garden. How do you know there were burnt sausages? asked Strike. Dorcas told me, said Waldegrave, who had already finished his first glass of wine and was pouring a second. She wanted to know why Liz wasn't at the firm's anniversary party. When I told her about Bombix Mori, Dorcas assured me Liz was a lovely woman. Lovely. Couldn't have known what was in Owen's book. Never have heard anyone's feelings. Wouldn't hurt a bloody fly. Ah! You disagree. Bloody right I disagree. I've met people who got their start in Liz Tassel's office. 
They talk like kidnapped victims have been ransomed. Bully. Scary temper. You think she put Quine up to writing the book? Well, not directly, said Waldegrave. But you take a deluded writer who was convinced he wasn't a bestseller because people were jealous of him, or not doing their jobs right, and lock him in with Liz, who's always angry, bitter as sin, banging on about Fancourt doing them both down. And is it a surprise he gets wound up to fever pitch? She couldn't even be bothered to read his book properly. If he hadn't died, I'd say she got what she deserved. Silly mad bastard didn't just do over Fancourt, did he? Went after her as well. Ha <laughs> ha! Went after bloody Daniel, went after me, went after everyone. Everyone. In the manner of other alcoholics Strike had known, Jerry Waldegrave had crossed the line into drunkenness with two glasses of wine. His movements were suddenly clumsier, his manner more flamboyant. Do you think Elizabeth Tassel egged Quine on to attack Fancourt? Not a doubt of it, said Waldegrave. Not a doubt. But when I met her, Elizabeth Tassel said that what Quine wrote about Fancourt was a lie. Strike told Waldegrave. Eh? said Waldegrave again, cupping his ear. She told me, said Strike loudly, that what Quine writes in Bombix Murray about Fancourt is false, that Fancourt didn't write the parody that made his wife kill himself, that Quine wrote it. I'm not talking about that, said Waldegrave, shaking his head as though Strike were being obtuse. I don't mean forget it, forget it. He was more than halfway down the bottle already. The alcohol had induced a degree of confidence. Strike held back, knowing that to push would only induce the granite stubbornness of the drunk. Better to let him drift where he wanted to go, keeping one light hand on the tiller. Owen oh, liked me, Waldegrave told Strike. Oh, yeah. I knew how to handle him. Stoke that man's vanity, and you could get him to do anything you wanted. Half an hour's praise before you asked him to change anything in the manuscript. Another half hour's praise before you ask him to make another change. Only way. He didn't really want to hurt me. Wasn't thinking straight, silly bastard. Wanted to get back on the telly. Thought everyone was against him. Didn't realize he was playing with fire. Mentally ill. Waldegrave slumped in his seat, and the back of his head collided with that of a large, overdressed woman sitting behind him. Sorry. Sorry. While she glared over her shoulder, he pulled in his chair causing the cutlery to rattle on the tablecloth. So what? Strike asked. What was the cutter all about? Huh? said Waldegrave. This time, Strike felt sure that the cupped ear was a pose. The cutter. Cutter? Editor. Obvious, said Waldegrave. And the bloody sack and the dwarf you try and drone? Symbolic, said Waldegrave, with an airy wave of the hand that nearly upset his wine glass. Some idea of his I stifled some bit of lovingly crafted prose I wanted to kill off hurt his feelings. Strike, who had heard a thousand rehearsed answers, found the response too pat, too fluent, too fast. Just that? Well, said Waldegrave, with a gasp of a laugh, I've never drowned a dwarf, if that's what you're implying. Drunks were always tricky interviewees. Back in the SIB, intoxicated suspects or witnesses had been a rarity. He remembered the alcoholic major whose twelve-year-old daughter had disclosed sexual abuse at her school in Germany. When Strike had arrived at the family house, the major had taken a swing at him with a broken bottle. Strike had laid him out. But here in the civilian world, with the wine waiter hovering, this drunken, mild-mannered editor could choose to walk away, and there would be nothing Strike could do about it. He could only hope for a chance to double back to the subject of the cutter, to keep Waldegrave in his seat to keep him talking. The trolley now wended its stately way to strike side. A rib of Scottish beef was carved with ceremony, while Waldegrave was presented with Dover sole. No taxes for three months, Strike told himself sternly, salivating as his plate was heaped with Yorkshire puddings, potatoes and parsnips. The trolley trundled away again. Waldegrave, who was now two-thirds of the way down his bottle of wine, contemplated his fish as though he was not quite sure how it had ended up in front of him and put a small potato in his mouth with his fingers. Did Quine discuss what he was writing with you before he handed in his manuscripts? asked Strike. Never, said Waldegrave. The only thing he ever told me about Bombix Mori was that the silkworm was a metaphor for the writer, who has to go through agonies to get at the good stuff. That was it. He never asked for your advice or input. No, no, Owen always thought he knew best. Is that usual? Writers vary said Waldegrave. 
But Owen was always up the secretive end of the scale. He liked the big reveal, you know, appeal to his sense of drama. Police will have asked you about your movements after you got the book, I suppose, said Strike casually. Yeah, been through all that, said Waldegrave indifferently. He was attempting, without much success, to pry spines out of the Dover soul he had recklessly asked to be left on the bone. Got the manuscript on Friday. Didn't look at it until the Sunday. You were meant to be away, weren't you? Paris, said Waldegrave. Anniversary weekend. Didn't happen. Something came up. Waldegrave emptied the last of the wine into his glass. Several drops of the dark liquid fell onto the white tablecloth and spread. Had a row, a bloody awful row on the way to Heathrow. Turned round, went back home. Rough, said Strike. On the rocks for years, said Waldegrave, abandoning his unequal struggle with the soul and throwing down his knife and fork with a clatter that made nearby diners look round. Jojo's grown up, no point any more. Splitting up. I'm sorry to hear that, said Strike. Waldegrave shrugged lugubriously and took more wine. The lenses of his horn-rimmed glasses were covered in fingerprints, and his shirt collar was grubby and frayed. He had the look, thought Strike, who was experienced in such matters, of a man who has slept in his clothes. You went straight home after the row, did you? It's a big house. No need to see each other if we don't want to. The drops of wine were spreading like crimson blossoms on the snowy tablecloth. Black spot. That's what this reminds me of, said Waldegrave. Treasure Island, you know? Black spot. Suspicion on everyone who read that bloody book. Everyone looking sideways at everyone else. Everyone who knows the ending suspect. Police in my bloody office, everyone staring. I read it on Sunday, he said, lurching back to Strike's question. And I told Liz Tassel what I thought of her, and life went on. Owen not answering his phone. Thought he was probably having a breakdown. Had my own bloody problems. Daniel Chard going berserk. Fuck him. Resigned. Had enough. Accusations, no more. Being bloody balled out in front of the whole office. No more. Accusations? Asked Strike. His interview technique was starting to feel like the dexterous flicking of Sabutio football figures. The wobbling interviewee directed by the right light touch. Strike had had an arsenal set in the seventies. He had played Dave Polworth's custom-painted Plymouth Argyles, with both boys lying belly down on Dave's mum's hearth rug. Dan thinks I gossiped about him to Owen, bloody idiot. Thinks the world doesn't know. Been gossiped for years. Didn't have to tell Owen. Everyone knows. That Chard's gay. Gay? Who cares? Repressed. Not sure Dan even knows he's gay. But he likes pretty young men. Likes painting them in the nude. Common knowledge. Did he offer to paint you? Asked Strike. Christ, no, said Waldegrave. Joe North told me years ago. Ah! He had caught the wine waiter's eye. Another glass of this, please. Strike was only grateful he had not asked for a bottle. I'm sorry, sir, we don't do that by the... Anything, then, red, anything. Years ago this was, Waldegrave went on, picking up where he had left off. Dan wanted Joe to pose for him. Joe told him to piss off. Common knowledge for years. He leaned back, ramming the large woman behind him again, who unfortunately was now eating soup. Strike watched her angry dining companion summon a passing waiter to complain. The waiter bent down to Waldegrave and said apologetically, yet with firmness, Would you mind pulling in your chair, sir? The lady behind you. Sorry. Sorry. Waldegrave tugged himself near a strike, placed his elbows on the table, pushed his tangled hair out of his eyes and said loudly, Head up his bloody ass! Who? asked Strike, finishing with regret the best meal he had had in a long time. Dan! Handed the bloody company on a plate, rolling it in all his life. Let him live in the country and paint his house, boy, if that's what he wants. Had enough of it. Start my own, start my own bloody company. Waldegrave's mobile phone rang. It took him a while to locate it. He peered over his glasses at the caller's number before answering. What's up, Jojo? Busy though the restaurant was, Strike heard the response. Shrill, distant screaming down the line. Waldegrave looked horrified. Jojo, are you... But then, the doughy, amiable face became tauter than Strike could have believed. Veins stood out on Waldegrave's neck, and his mouth stretched in an ugly snarl. Fuck you, he said, and his voice carried loudly to all the surrounding tables, so that fifty heads jerked upwards, conversation stalled. 
Do not call me on Jojo's number. No, you drunken fucking... You heard me. I drink because I'm fucking married to you. That's why. The overweight woman behind Waldegrave looked around, outraged. Waiters were glaring. One had so far forgotten himself as to have paused with a Yorkshire pudding halfway to a Japanese businessman's plate. The decorous gentleman's club had doubtless seen other drunken brawls, but they could not fail to shock among the dark wood panels, the glass chandeliers, and the bills of fare, where everything was stolidly British, calm, and staid. Well, whose fucking fault's that? shouted Waldegrave. He staggered to his feet, ramming his unfortunate neighbour yet again, but this time there was no remonstrance from her companion. The restaurant had fallen silent. Waldegrave was weaving his way out of it, a bottle and a third to the bad, swearing into his mobile, and Strike, stranded at the table, was amused to find in himself some of the disapproval felt in the mess for a man who cannot hold his drink. Bill, please, said Strike to the nearest gaping waiter. He was disappointed that he had not gotten to sample the spotted dick, which he had noted on the bill of fare, but he must catch Waldegrave if he could. While the diners muttered and watched him out of the corners of their eyes, Strike paid, pulled himself up from the table, and, leaning on his stick, followed in Waldegrave's ungainly footsteps. From the outraged expression of the maitre d' and the sound of Waldegrave still yelling just outside the door, Strike suspected that Waldegrave had taken some persuasion to leave the premises. He found the editor propped up against the cold wall to the left of the doors. Snow was falling thickly all around them. The pavements were crunchy with it, passers-by muffled to the ears. The backdrop of solid grandeur removed. Waldegrave no longer looked like a vaguely scruffy academic. Drunk, grubby and crumpled, swearing into a phone disguised by his large hand, he might have been a mentally ill down-and-out. Not my fucking fault, you stupid bitch. Did I write the fucking thing, did I? You'd better fucking talk to her then, hadn't you? If you don't, I will. Don't you threaten me, you ugly fucking slut. If you kept your legs closed, you fucking heard me. Waldegrave saw strike. He stood gaping for a few seconds, then cut the call. The mobile slipped through his fumbling fingers and landed on the snowy pavement. Bollocks, said Jerry Waldegrave. The wolf had turned back into the sheep. He groped with bare fingers for the phone in the slush around his feet, and his glasses fell off. Strike picked them up for him. Thanks, thanks. Sorry about that. Sorry. Strike saw tears on Waldegrave's puffy cheeks as the editor rammed his glasses back on. Stuffing the cracked phone into his pocket, he turned an expression of despair upon the detective. It's ruined my fucking life, he said, that book. And I thought, Owen, one thing he held sacred, father-daughter, one thing. With another dismissive gesture, Waldegrave turned and walked away, weaving badly, thoroughly drunk. He had had, the detective guessed, at least a bottle before they met. There was no point following him. Watching Waldegrave disappear into the swirling snow, past the Christmas shoppers, scrambling, laden, along the slushy pavements, Strike remembered a hand closing ungently on an upper arm, a stern man's voice, an angrier young woman's. Mummy's made a beeline. Why don't you grab her? Turning up his coat collar, Strike thought he knew now what the meaning was, of a dwarf in a bloody bag, of the horns under the cutter's cap, and, cruelest of all, the attempted drowning. Chapter 37 When I am provoked to fury, I cannot incorporate with patience and reason. William Congreve, The Double Dealer Strike set out for his office beneath a sky of dirty silver, his feet moving with difficulty through the rapidly accumulating snow which was still falling fast. Though he had touched nothing but water, he felt a little drunk on good rich food, which gave him the false sense of well-being that Waldegrave had probably passed some time mid-morning drinking in his office. The walk between Simpsons in the Strand and his drafty little office on Denmark Street would take a fit and unimpaired adult perhaps a quarter of an hour. Strike's knee remained sore and overworked, but he had just spent more than his entire week's food budget on a single meal. Lighting a cigarette, he limped away through the knife-sharp cold, head bowed against the snow, wondering what Robin had found out at the Bridlington bookshop. As he walked past the fluted columns of the Lyceum Theatre, Strike pondered the fact that Daniel Chard was convinced that Jerry Waldegrave had helped Quine write his book, 
whereas Waldegrave thought that Elizabeth Tassel had played upon his sense of grievance until it had erupted into print. Were these, he wondered, simple cases of displaced anger? Having been balked of the true culprit by Quine's gruesome death, were Chard and Waldegrave seeking living scapegoats on whom to vent their frustrated fury, or were they right to detect, in Bombix Mori, a foreign influence? The scarlet façade of the coach and horses in Wellington Street constituted a powerful temptation as he approached it, the stick doing heavy duty now, and his knee complaining, warmth, beer, and a comfortable chair, but a third lunchtime visit to the pub in a week, not a habit he ought to develop. Jerry Waldegrave was an object lesson in where such behavior might lead. He could not resist an envious glance through the window as he passed, towards lights gleaming on brass beer pumps, and convivial men with slacker consciences than his own. He saw her out of the corner of his eye, tall and stooping in her black coat, hands in her pockets, scurrying along the slushy pavements behind him, his stalker and would-be attacker of Saturday night. Strike's pace did not falter, nor did he turn to look at her. He was not playing games this time. There would be no stopping to test her amateurish stalking style, no letting her know that he had spotted her. On he walked without looking over his shoulder, and only a man or woman similarly expert in counter-surveillance would have noticed his casual glances into helpfully positioned windows and reflective brass door plates. Only they could have spotted the hyper-alertness disguised as inattentiveness. Most killers were slapdash amateurs. That was how they were caught. To persist after their encounter on Saturday night argued high-caliber recklessness, and it was on this that Strike was counting as he continued up Wellington Street, outwardly oblivious to the woman following him with a knife in her pocket. As he crossed Russell Street, she had dodged out of sight, faking entrance to the Marquis of Anglesey, but soon reappeared, dodging in and out of the square pillars of an office block and lurking in a doorway to allow him to pull ahead. Strike could barely feel his knee now. He had become six foot three of highly concentrated potential. This time, she had no advantage. She would not be taking him by surprise. If she had a plan at all, he guessed that it was to profit from any available opportunity. It was up to him to present her with an opportunity she dare not let pass, and to make sure she did not succeed. Past the Royal Opera House with its classical portico, its columns and statues. In Endell Street, she entered an old red telephone box, gathering her nerve, no doubt, double-checking that he was not aware of her. Strike walked on, his pace unchanging, his eyes on the street ahead. She took confidence, and emerged again onto the crowded pavement, following him through harried passers-by with carrier bags swinging from their hands, drawing closer to him as the street narrowed, flitting in and out of doorways. As he drew nearer to the office, he made his decision, turning left off Denmark Street into Flitcroft Street, which led to Denmark Place, where a dark passage, plastered with flyers for bands, led back to his office. Would she dare? As he entered the alleyway, his footsteps echoing a little off the dank walls, he slowed imperceptibly. Then he heard her coming, running at him. Wheeling around on his sound left leg, he flung out his walking stick. There was a shriek of pain as her arm met it. The Stanley knife was knocked out of her hand, hit the stone wall, rebounded, and narrowly missed Strike's eye. He had her now in a ferocious grip that made her scream. He was afraid that some hero would come to her aid, but no one appeared, and now speed was essential. She was stronger than he had expected and struggled ferociously, trying to kick him in the balls and claw his face. With a further economical twist of his body, he had her in a headlock, her feet skidding and scrambling on the damp alley floor. As she writhed in his arms trying to bite him, he stooped to pick up the knife, pulling her down with him so that she almost lost her footing, then, abandoning the walking stick, which he could not carry while managing her, he dragged her out onto Denmark Street. He was fast, and she so winded by the struggle that she had no breath to yell. The short, cold street was empty of shoppers, and no passers-by on Charing Cross Road noticed anything amiss as he forced her the short distance to the black street door. Need in, Robin! Quickly! he shouted on the intercom, slamming his way through the outer door as soon as Robin had buzzed it open. Up the metal steps he dragged her, his right knee now protesting violently, and she started shrieking, the screams echoing around the stairwell. 
Strike saw movement behind the glass of the dour and eccentric graphic designer who worked in the office beneath his. Just messing around, he bellowed at the door, heaving his pursuer upstairs. Cormoran? What? Oh, my God, said Robin, staring down from the landing. You can't. What are you playing at? Let her go. She's just tried to bloody knife me again, panted Strike, and with a gigantic final effort, he forced his pursuer over the threshold. Lock the door, he shouted at Robin, who had hurried in behind them and obeyed. Strike threw the woman onto the mock leather sofa. The hood fell back to reveal a long, pale face with large brown eyes and thick, dark, wavy hair that fell to her shoulders. Her fingers terminated in pointed crimson nails. She looked barely twenty. You bastard! You bastard! She tried to get up, but Strike was standing over her, looking murderous, so she thought better of it, slumping back onto the sofa and massaging her white neck, which bore dark pink scratch marks where he had seized her. Wanna tell me why you're trying to knife me? Strike asked. Fuck you! That's original, said Strike. Robin, call the police. No! howled the woman in black like a baying dog. He hurt me, she gasped to Robin, tugging down her top with abandoned wretchedness to reveal the marks on a strong white neck. He dragged me, he pulled me. Robin looked to Strike, her hand on the receiver. Why have you been following me? Strike said, panting as he stood over her, his tone threatening. She cowered into the squeaking cushions, yet Robin, whose fingers had not left the phone, detected a note of relish in the woman's fear, a whisper of voluptuousness in the way she twisted away from him. Last chance, growled Strike. Why? What's happening out there? came a querulous inquiry from the landing below. Robin's eyes met Strike's. She hurried to the door, unlocked it and slid out onto the landing, while Strike stood guard over his captive, his jaw set and one fist clenched. He saw the idea of screaming for help pass behind the big dark eyes, purple shadowed like pansies, and fade away. Shaking, she began to cry, but her teeth were bared, and he thought there was more rage than misery in her tears. All okay, Mr. Crowdy, Robin called. Just messing around. Sorry we were so loud. Robin returned to the office and locked the door behind her again. The woman was rigid on the sofa, tears tumbling down her face, her talon-like nails gripping the edge of the seat. Fuck this, Strike said. You don't want to talk? I'm calling the police. Apparently she believed him. He had taken barely two steps towards the phone when she sobbed. I wanted to stop you. Stop me doing what? said Strike. Like you don't know. Don't play fucking games with me, Strike shouted, bending towards her with two large fists clenched. He could feel his damaged knee only too acutely now. It was her fault he had taken the fall that had damaged the ligaments all over again. Cormoran, said Robin firmly, sliding between them and forcing him to take a pace backwards. Listen, she told the girl, listen to me. Tell him why you're doing this and maybe he won't call. You've got to be fucking joking, said Strike. Twice she's trying to stab. Maybe he won't call the police, said Robin loudly, undeterred. The woman jumped up and tried to make a break for it towards the door. No, you don't said Strike, hobbling fast around Robin, catching his assailant round the waist, and throwing her none too gently back onto the sofa. Who are you? You've hurt me now, she shouted. You've really hurt me, my ribs. I'll get you for assault, you bastard. I'll call you Pippa then, shall I? said Strike, a shuddering gasp and a malevolent stare. You, you, fuck. Yeah, yeah, fuck me, said Strike irritably. Your name. Her chest was heaving under the heavy overcoat. How will you know if I'm telling the truth, even if I tell you? She panted, with a further show of defiance. I'll keep you here till I've checked, said Strike. Kidnap! She shouted, her voice as rough and loud as a docker's. Citizen's arrest, said Strike. You try to fucking knife me. Now for the last time. Pippa Midgley, she spat. Finally! Have you got ID? With another mutinous obscenity, she slid a hand into her pocket and drew out a bus pass, which she threw to him. This says Philip Midgley. No shit. Watching the implication hit strike, Robin felt a sudden urge, in spite of the tension in the room, to laugh. Epicene, said Pippa Midgley furiously. Don't you get it? Too subtle for you, dickhead. Strike looked up at her. The Adam's apple on her scratched, marked throat was still prominent. 
she had buried her hands in her pockets again. I'll be pepper on all my documents next year, she said. Pepper, Strike repeated. You're the author of... I'll turn the handle on the fucking rack for you, are you? Oh, said Robin, on a long, drawn-out sigh of comprehension. Oh, you're so clever, Mr. Butch, said Pippa, in spiteful imitation. Do you know Catherine Kent personally, or are you just cyber friends? Why, is knowing Kath Kent a crime now? How did you know Owen Quine? I don't want to talk about that bastard, she said, her chest heaving. What he's done to me, what he's done, pretending. He lied, lying fucking bastard. Fresh tears splattered down her cheeks, and she dissolved into hysterics. Her scarlet-tipped hands clawed at her hair. Her feet drummed on the floor. She rocked backwards and forwards, wailing. Strike watched her with distaste, and after thirty seconds said, Will you shut the fuck? But Robin quelled him with a glance, tore a handful of tissues out of the box on her desk, and pushed them into Pippa's hands. T -t 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 Would you like a tea or coffee, Pippa? asked Robin kindly. Coffee? She's just tried to bloody knife me, Robin. Well, she didn't manage it, did she? commented Robin, busy with the kettle. Ineptitude, said Strike incredulously, is no fucking defence under the law. He rounded on Pippa again, who had followed this exchange with her mouth agape. Why have you been following me? What are you trying to stop me doing? And I'm warning you. Just because Robin here is buying the sob stuff. You're working for her, yelled Pippa. That twisted bitch, his widow. She's got his money now, hasn't she? We know what you've been hired to do. We're not fucking stupid. Who's we? demanded Strike. But Pippa's dark eyes slid again towards the door. I swear to God, said Strike, whose much tried knee was now throbbing in a way that made him want to grind his teeth. If you go for that door one more fucking time, I'm calling the police and I'll testify and be glad to watch you go down for attempted murder. And it won't be fun for you inside, Pipper, he added. Not pre-op. Cormoran, said Robin sharply. Stating facts, said Strike. Pipper had shrunk back onto the sofa and was staring at Strike in unfeigned terror. Coffee, said Robin firmly, emerging from behind the desk and pressing the mug into one of the long, taloned hands. Just tell him what all this is about, for God's sake, Pippa. Tell him. Unstable and aggressive though Pippa seemed, Robin could not help pitying the girl, who appeared to have given almost no thought to the possible consequences of lunging at a private detective with a blade. Robin could only assume that she possessed an extreme form, the trait that afflicted her own younger brother Martin, who was notorious in their family for the lack of foresight and love of danger, that had resulted in more trips to casualty than the rest of his siblings combined. We know she hired you to frame us, croaked Pippa. Who? growled Strike. Is she? And who is us? Leonora Quine, said Pippa. We know what she's like, and we know what she's capable of. She hates us, me and Kath. She'd do anything to get us. She murdered Owen, and she's trying to pin it on us. You can look like that all you want, she shouted at Strike whose heavy eyebrows had risen halfway to his thick hairline. She's a crazy bitch. She's jealous as hell. She couldn't stand him seeing us, and now she's got you poking around trying to get stuff to use against us. I don't know whether you believe this paranoid bollocks. We know what's going on, shouted Pippa. Shut up. Nobody except the killer knew Quine was dead when you started stalking me. You followed me the day I found the body, and I know you were following Leonora for a week before that. Why? And when she did not answer, he repeated, Last chance. Why did you follow me from Leonora's? I thought you might lead me to where he was, said Pippa. Why did you want to know where he was? So I could fucking kill him, yelled Pippa. And Robin was confirmed in her impression that Pippa shared Martin's almost total lack of self-preservation. And why did you want to kill him, said Strike, as though she had said nothing out of the ordinary. Because of what he did to us in that horrible fucking book. You know, you've read it. Epicene. That bastard, that bastard. Bloody calm down. So you read Bombix Mori by then? Yeah, of course I had. And that's when you started putting shit through Quine's letterbox. Shit for a shit, she shouted. Witty, when did you read the book? Kath read the bits about us on the phone, and then I went round and... When did she read you the bits on the phone? Well, when she came home and found it lying on the doormat. 
Whole manuscript. She could hardly get the door open. He'd fed it through the door with a note, said Pippa Midgley. She showed me. What did the note say? It said, Payback time for both of us. Hope you're happy. Owen. Payback time for both of us, repeated Strike, frowning. Do you know what that meant? Kath wouldn't tell me, but I know she understood. She was de devastated, said Pippa, her chest heaving. She's a, she's a wonderful person. You don't know her. She's been like a mother to me. We met on this writing course, and we were like, we became like... She caught up her breath and whimpered. He was a bastard. He lied to us about what he was writing. He lied about... about everything. She began to cry again, wailing and sobbing, and Robin, worried about Mr. Crowdy, said gently, Pippa, just tell us what he lied about. Cormoran only wants the truth. He's not trying to frame anyone. She did not know whether Pippa had heard or believed her. Perhaps she simply wanted to relieve her overwrought feelings, but she took a great shuddering breath and outspilled a torrent of words. He said I was like his second daughter. He said that to me. I told him everything. He knew my mum threw me out and everything. And I showed him my book about my life, and he was so kind and interested, and he said he'd help me get it published, and he t t told us both, me and Kath, that we were in his new novel, and he said I was was a b b beautiful lost soul. That's what he said to me, gasped Pippa, her mobile mouth working. And he p pretended to read a bit out to me one day over the phone, and it was it was lovely, and then I r read it, and he'd, he'd written that. Kath was in the bits, the cave, harpy, and epicene. So Catherine came home and found it all over the doormat, did she? said Strike. Came home from where? Work? From s sitting in the hospice with her dying sister. And that was when? said Strike for the third time. Who cares when it... I fucking care! Was it the ninth? Robin asked. She had brought up Catherine Kent's blog on her computer. The screen angled away from the sofa where Pippa was sitting. Could it have been Tuesday the ninth, Pippa? the Tuesday after bonfire night. It was. Yeah, I think it was, said Pippa, apparently awestruck by Robin's lucky guess. Yeah, Kath went away on bonfire night because Angela was so ill. How do you know it was bonfire night? Strike asked. Because Owen told Kath he c couldn't see her that night because he had to do fireworks with his daughter, said Pippa. And Kath was really upset because he was supposed to be leaving. He promised her, he promised her at long bloody last he'd leave his bitch of a wife. And then he says he's got to play sparklers with a retard. She drew up short, but Strike finished for her. With the retard? It's just a joke, muttered Pippa, shamefaced, showing more regret about her use of the word than she had about trying to stab Strike. Just between me and Kath, his daughter was always the excuse why Owen couldn't leave and be with Kath. What did Catherine do that night instead of seeing Quine? asked Strike. I went over to hers. Then she got the call that her sister Angela was a lot worse and she left. Angela had cancer. It had gone everywhere. Where was Angela? In the hospice in Clapham. How did Catherine get there? Why does that matter? Just answer the bloody question, will you? I don't know. Tube, I suppose. And she stayed with Angela for three days, sleeping on a mattress on the floor by her bed because they thought Angela was going to die any moment. But Angela kept hanging on, so Kath had to go home for clean clothes, and that's when she found the manuscript all over the doormat. Why are you sure she came home on a Tuesday? Robin asked. And Strike, who had been about to ask the same thing, looked at her in surprise. He did not know about the old man in the bookshop and the German sinkhole. Because on Tuesday nights I work on a helpline, said Pippa. And I was there when Kath called me in floods because she'd put the manuscript in order and read what he'd written about us. Well, this is all very interesting, said Strike, because Catherine Kent told the police that she'd never read Bombix Mori. Pippa's horrified expression might, under other circumstances, have been amusing. You fucking tricked me! Yeah, you're a really tough nut to crack, said Strike. Don't even think about it, he added, standing over her as she tried to get up. He was a... a shit! shouted Pepper, seething with impotent rage. He was a user, pretending to be interested in our work and using us all along, that l lying b bastard. I thought he understood what my life's been about. 
We used to talk for hours about it, and he encouraged me with my life story. He t told me he was going to help me get a publishing deal. Strike felt a sudden weariness wash over him. What was this mania to appear in print? And he was just trying to keep me sweet, telling him all my most private thoughts and feelings. And Kath, what he did to Kath, you don't understand. I'm glad his bitch wife killed him. If she hadn't, why? demanded Strike. Do you keep saying his wife killed Quine? Because Kath's got proof. The short pause. What proof? asked Strike. Wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> shouted Pippa with a cackle of hysterical laughter. Never you mind. If she's got proof, why hasn't she taken it to the police? Out of compassion, shouted Pippa. Something you wouldn't. Why? Came a plaintive voice from outside the glass door. Is there still all this shouting? Oh bloody hell! Said Strike, as the fuzzy outline of Mister Crowdy from downstairs pressed close to the glass. Robin moved to unlock the door. Very sorry, Mister Crow. Pippa was off the sofa in an instant. Strike made a grab for her, but his knee buckled agonizingly as he lunged, knocking Mister Crowdy aside. She was gone, clattering down the stairs. Leave her, Strike said to Robin, who looked braced to give chase. At least I've got her knife. Knife? Yelped Mister Crowdy. And it took them fifteen minutes to persuade him not to contact the landlord, for the publicity following the Lula Landry case had unnerved the graphic designer, who lived in dread that another murderer might come seeking strike. And perhaps wander by mistake into the wrong office. Jesus H Christ," said Strike, when they had at last persuaded Crowdy to leave. He slumped down on the sofa. Robin took her computer chair, and they looked at each other for a few seconds before starting to laugh. "Decent good cop, bad cop routine we are going there," said Strike. "I wasn't faking," said Robin. "I really did feel a bit sorry for her. I noticed. What about me getting attacked?" Did she really want to stab you, or was it play acting? Asked Robin skeptically. She might have liked the idea of it more than the reality. Acknowledged Strike. Trouble is, you're just as dead if you're knifed by a self-dramatizing twat as by a professional. And what she thought she'd gain by stabbing me? Mother love, said Robin quietly. Strike stared at her. Her own mother's disowned her, said Robin, and she's going through a really traumatic time. I expect. Taking hormones and God knows what else she's got to do before she has the operation. She thought she had a new family, didn't she? She thought Quine and Catherine Kent were her new parents. She told us Quine said she was a second daughter to him, and he put her in the book as Catherine Kent's daughter. But in Bombix Mori, he revealed her to the world as half male, half female. He also suggested that beneath all the filial affection, she wanted to sleep with him. Her new father, said Robin, had let her down very badly. But her new mother was still good and loving, and she'd been betrayed as well. So Pippa set out to get even for both of them. She could not stop herself grinning at Strike's look of stunned admiration. Why the hell did you give up that psychology degree? Long story, said Robin, looking away towards the computer monitor. She's not very old. Twenty, do you think? Looked about that, agreed Strike. Pity we never got round to asking her about her movements in the days after Quine disappeared. She didn't do it. Said Robin with certainty, looking back at him. Yeah, you're probably right," sighed Strike. If only because shoving dog shit through his letterbox might have felt a bit anticlimactic after carving out his guts. And she doesn't seem very strong on planning or efficiency, does she? An understatement," he agreed. Are you going to call the police about her? I don't know, maybe. But shit," he said, thumping himself on the forehead. We didn't even find out why she was bloody singing in the book. I think I might know," said Robin after a short burst of typing and reading the results on her computer monitor. Singing to soften the voice, vocal exercises for transgendered people. Was that all? Asked Strike in disbelief. What are you saying? That she was wrong to take offence," said Robin. "Come on, he was jeering at something really personal in a public." That's not what I meant," said Strike. He frowned out of the window, thinking. The snow was falling thick and fast. After a while, he said, "What happened at the Bridlington Bookshop?" God, yes, I nearly forgot. She told him all about the assistant and his confusion between the first and the eighth of November. Stupid old sod," said Strike. "That's a bit mean," said Robin. "Cocky, wasn't he? Mondays are always the same. Goes to his friend Charles every Monday. 
but how do we know whether it was the Anglican bishop knight or the sinkhole knight? You say he claims Charles interrupted him with a sinkhole story while he was telling him about Quine coming into the shop. That's what he said. Then it's odds on Quine was in the shop on the first, not the eighth. He remembers those two bits of information as connected. Silly buggers got confused. He wanted to have seen Quine after he disappeared. He wanted to be able to help establish time of death. So he was subconsciously looking for reasons to think it was the Monday in the time frame for the murder, not an irrelevant Monday a whole week before anyone was interested in Quine's movements. There's still something odd, though, isn't there, about what he claims Quine said to him? asked Robin. Yeah, there is, said Stripe. Buying reading matter because he was going away for a break. So he was already planning to go away four days before he rode with Elizabeth Tassel. Was he already planning to go to Talgarth Road? After all those years he was supposed to have hated and avoided the place. Are you going to tell Anstice about this? Robin asked. Strike gave a wry snort of laughter. <laughs> no, I'm not going to tell Anstice. We've got no real proof Quine was in there and on the first instead of the eighth. Anyway, Anstice and I aren't on the best of terms just now. There was another long pause, and then Strike startled Robin by saying, I've got to talk to Michael Fancourt. Why? she asked. A lot of reasons, said Strike. Things Waldergrave said to me over lunch. Can you get on to his agent or whatever contact you can find for him? Yes, said Robin, making a note for herself. You know, I watched the interview back just now, and I still couldn't. Look at it again, said Strike. Pay attention. Think. He lapsed into silence again, glaring now at the ceiling. Not wishing to break his train of thought, Robin merely set to work on the computer to discover who represented Michael Fancourt. Finally, Strike spoke over the tapping of her keyboard. What does Catherine Kent think she's got on Leonora? Maybe nothing, said Robin, concentrating on the results she had uncovered. And she's withholding it out of compassion. Robin said nothing. She was perusing the website of Fancourt's literary agency for a contact number. Let's hope that was just more hysterical bullshit, said Strike. But he was worried. Chapter 38 That in so little paper should lie the undoing. John Webster, the White Devil. Miss Brocklehurst, the possibly unfaithful P.A., was still claiming to be incapacitated by her cold. Her lover, Strike's client, found this excessive, and the detective was inclined to agree with him. Seven o'clock the following morning found Strike stationed in a shadowy recess opposite Miss Brocklehurst's Battersea flat, wrapped up in coat, scarf, and gloves, yawning widely as the cold penetrated his extremities, and enjoying the second of three Egg McMuffins he had picked up from McDonald's on his way. There had been a severe weather warning for the whole of the southeast. Thick blue snow already lay over the entire street, and the first tentative flakes of the day were drifting down from a starless sky as he waited, moving his toes from time to time to check that he could still feel them. One by one, the occupants left for work slipping and sliding off towards the station, or clambering into cars whose exhausts sounded particularly loud in the muffled quiet. Three Christmas trees sparkled at strike from living room windows, though December would only start the following day. Tangerine, emerald and neon blue lights, winking garishly as he leaned against the wall, his eyes on the windows of Miss Brocklehurst's flat, laying bets with himself as to whether she would leave the house at all in this weather. His knee was still killing him, but the snow had slowed the rest of the world to a pace that matched his own. He had never seen Miss Brocklehurst in heels lower than four inches. In these conditions, she might well be more incapacitated than he was. In the last week, the search for Quine's killer had started to eclipse all his other cases, but it was important to keep up with them unless he wanted to lose business. Miss Brocklehurst's lover was a rich man who was likely to put plenty more job strikes away if he liked the detective's work. The businessman had a predilection for youthful blondes, a succession of whom, as he had freely confessed to strike at their first meeting, had taken large amounts of money and sundry expensive gifts from him, only to leave or betray him. As he showed no sign of developing better judgment of character, strike anticipated many more lucrative hours spent tailing future Miss Brocklehursts. Perhaps it was the betrayal that thrilled his client, reflected strike his breath rising in clouds through the icy air. He had known other such men. It was a taste that found its fullest expression in those who became infatuated with hookers. At ten to nine, 
the curtains gave a small twitch. Faster than might have been expected from his attitude of casual relaxation, Strike raised the night vision camera he had been concealing at his side. Miss Brocklehurst stood briefly exposed to the dim snowy street in bra and pants, though her cosmetically enhanced breasts had no need of support. Behind her in the darkness of the bedroom walked a paunchy bare-chested man who briefly cupped one breast, earning himself a giggled reproof. Both turned away into the bedroom. Strike lowered his camera and checked his handiwork. The most incriminating image he had managed to capture showed the clear outline of a man's hand and arm. Miss Brocklehurst's face half turned in a laugh, but her embracer's face was in shadow. Strike suspected that he might be about to leave for work, so he stowed the camera in an inside pocket, ready to give slow and cumbersome chase, and set to work on his third McMuffin. Sure enough, at five to nine, Miss Brocklehurst's front door opened and the lover emerged. He resembled her boss in nothing except age and a moneyed appearance. A sleek leather messenger bag was slung diagonally across his chest, large enough for a clean shirt and a toothbrush. Strike had seen these so frequently of late that he had come to think of them as adulterers' overnight bags. The couple enjoyed a French kiss on the doorstep, curtailed by the icy cold and the fact that Miss Brocklehurst was wearing less than two ounces of fabric. Then she retreated indoors and Paunchy set off towards Clapham Junction, already speaking on his mobile phone, doubtless explaining that he would be late due to the snow. Strike allowed him twenty yards head start, then emerged from his hiding place, leaning on the stick that Robin had kindly retrieved from Denmark Place the preceding afternoon. It was easy surveillance, as Paunchy was oblivious to anything but his telephone conversation. They walked down the gentle incline of Lavender Hill together, twenty yards apart, the snow falling steadily again. Paunchy slipped several times in his handmade shoes. When they reached the station, it was easy for Strike to follow him, still gabbling into the same carriage, and, under pretext of reading texts, to take pictures of him on his own mobile. As he did so, a genuine text arrived from Robin. Michael Fancourt's agent just called me back. MF says he'd be delighted to meet you. He's in Germany, but will be back on 6th. Suggests Groucho Club, whatever time suits, ah, kiss. It was quite extraordinary, Strike thought, as the train rattled into Waterloo, how much the people who had read Bombix Mori wanted to talk to him. When before had suspects jumped so eagerly at the chance to sit face to face with a detective? And what did famous Michael Fancourt hope to gain from an interview with a private detective who had found Owen Quine's body? Strike got out of the train behind Paunchy, following him through the crowds across the wet, slippery tiles of Waterloo Station, beneath the ceiling of cream girders and glass that reminded Strike of Tithe Barn House. Out again into the cold, with Paunchy still oblivious and gabbling into his mobile, Strike followed him along slushy, treacherous pavements, edged with clods of mucky snow, between square office blocks comprised of glass and concrete, in and out of the swarm of financial workers bustling along, ant-like, in their drab coats until at last, Paunchy turned into the car park of one of the biggest office blocks and headed for what was obviously his own car. Apparently he had felt it wiser to leave the BMW at the office than to park outside Miss Brocklehurst's flat. As Strike watched, lurking behind a convenient Range Rover, he felt the mobile in his pocket vibrate, but ignored it, unwilling to draw attention to himself. Paunchy had a named parking space. After collecting a few items from his boot, he headed into the building, leaving Strike free to amble over to the wall where the director's names were written and take a photograph of Paunch's full name and title for his client's better information. Strike then headed back to the office. Once on the tube, he examined his phone and saw that his missed call was from his oldest friend, the shark-mangled Dave Polworth. Polworth had the ancient habit of calling Strike Diddy. Most people assume this was an ironic reference to his size, all through primary school, Strike had been the biggest boy of the year, and usually of the year above, but in fact, it derived from the endless comings and goings from school that were due to his mother's peripatetic lifestyle. These had once long ago resulted in a small, shrill Dave Polworth telling Strike he was like a didicoy, the Cornish word for gypsy. Strike returned the call as soon as he got off the tube, and they were still talking twenty minutes later when he entered his office. Robin looked up and began to speak, but seeing that Strike was on the phone merely smiled and turned back to her monitor. 
Coming home for Christmas? Polworth asked Strike, as he moved through to the inner office and closed his door. Maybe, said Strike. Few points at the victory, Polworth urged him. Shag Gwenifer Ascot again? I never, said Strike. It was a joke of long standing. Shag Gwenifer Arscott. Well, have another bash, did he? You might strike gold this time. Time someone took her cherry. And speaking of girls, neither of us ever shagged. The conversation degenerated into a series of salacious and very funny vignettes from Polworth about the antics of the mutual friends they had both left behind in St. Moore's. Strike was laughing so much he ignored the call-waiting signal and did not bother to check who it was. Haven't got back with Milady Berserko, have you, boy? Dave asked, this being the name he usually used for Charlotte. Nope, said Strike. She's getting married in four days, he calculated. Yeah, well, you be on the watch, did he, for signs of her galloping back over the horizon? Wouldn't be surprised if she bolts. Breathe a sigh of relief if it comes off, mate. Yeah, said Strike. Right. Here's the deal, then, yeah? said Polworth. Home for Christmas? Fears in a victory? Yeah. Why not? said Strike. After a few more ribald exchanges, Dave returned to his work, and Strike, still grinning, checked his phone and saw that he had missed a call from Leonora Quine. He wandered back into the outer office while dialing his voicemail. I've watched Michael Fancourt's documentary again, said Robin excitedly, and I've realized what you— Strike raised a hand to quiet her, as Leonora's ordinarily deadpan voice spoke in his ear, sounding agitated and disorientated. Poor man, I've been bloody arrested. I don't know why, nobody's telling me nothing. They've got me at the station. They're waiting for a lawyer or something. I don't know what to do. Orlando's with Edna. I don't. Anyway, that's where I am. A few seconds of silence, and the message ended. Shit, said Strike, so loudly that Robin jumped. Shit! What's the matter? They've arrested Leonora. Why's she calling me, not Ilsa? Shit! He punched in Ilsa Herbert's number and waited. Hi, Corm. They've arrested Leonora Quine. What? cried Ilsa. Why? Not that bloody old rag in the lock-up. They might have something else. Kath's got proof. Where is she, Corm? Police station. It'll be Kilburn, that's nearest. Christ almighty, why didn't she call me? Fuck knows. She said something about them finding her a lawyer. Nobody's contacted me. God above, doesn't she think? Why didn't she give her my name? I'm going now, Corm. I'll dump this lot on someone else. I'm owed a favour. He could hear a series of thunks, distant voices, Ilsa's rapid footsteps. Call me when you know what's going on, he said. It might be a while. I don't care. Call me. She hung up. Strike turned to face Robin, who looked appalled. Oh, no, she breathed. I'm calling Anstis, said Strike, jabbing again at his phone. But his old friend was in no mood to dispense favours. I warned you, Bob. I warned you this was coming. She did it, mate. What have you got? Strike demanded. Can't tell you that, Bob, sorry. Did you get it from Catherine Kent? Can't say, mate. Barely deigning to return Anstice's conventional good wishes, Strike hung up. Dickhead, he said. Bloody dickhead. Leonora was now in a place where he could not reach her. Strike was worried about how her grudging manner and the animosity to the police would appear to interlocutors. He could almost hear her complaining that Orlando was alone demanding to know when she would be able to return to her daughter, indignant that the police had meddled with the daily grind of her miserable existence. He was afraid of her lack of self-preservation. He wanted Ilsa there fast, before Leonora uttered innocently self-incriminating comments about her husband's general neglect and his girlfriend's, before she could state again her almost incredible and suspicious claim that she knew nothing about her husband's books before they had proper covers on before she attempted to explain why she had temporarily forgotten that they owned a second house, where her husband's remains had lain decaying for weeks. Five o'clock in the afternoon came and went, without news from Ilsa. Looking out at the darkening sky and the snow, Strike insisted Robin go home. But you'll ring me when you're here, she begged him, pulling on a coat and wrapping a thick woolen scarf around her neck. Yeah, of course, said Strike. But not until 6.30 did Ilsa call him back. Couldn't be worse, were her first words. She sounded tired and stressed. They've got proof of purchase on the Quine's joint credit card of protective overalls, Wellington boots, gloves, and ropes. They were bought online and paid for with their visa. Oh, and a burka. You're fucking kidding me. 
I'm not. I know you think she's innocent. Yeah, I do, said Strike, conveying a clear warning not to bother trying to persuade him otherwise. All right, said Ilsa wearily. Have it your own way. But I'll tell you this. She's not helping herself. She's being aggressive as hell, insisting Quine must have bought the stuff himself. A burka, for God's sake. The ropes bought on the card are identical to the ones that were found tying the corpse. They asked her why Quine would want a burka or plastic overalls of a strength to resist chemical spills, and all she said was, I don't bloody know, do I? Every other sentence she kept asking when she could go home to her daughter. She just doesn't get it. The stuff was bought six months ago and sent to Talgarth Road. It couldn't look more premeditated unless they'd found a plan in her handwriting. She's denying she knew how Quine was going to end his book. But your guy, Anstis, there in person, was he? Yeah, doing the interrogation. He kept asking whether she really expected them to believe that Quine never talked about what he was writing. Then she says, I don't pay much attention. So he does talk about his plots. On and on it went, trying to wear her down. And in the end, she says, well, he said something about the silkworm being boiled. And that was all Anstis needed to be convinced she's been lying all along, and she knew the whole plot. Oh, and they found disturbed earth in their back garden. And I'll lay you odds they'll find a dead cat called Mr. Poop, snarled Strike. That won't stop Anstis, predicted Ilsa. He's absolutely sure it's her, Cor. They've got the right to keep her until 11 a.m. tomorrow, and I'm sure they're going to charge her. They haven't got enough, said Strike fiercely. Where's the DNA evidence? Where are the witnesses? That's the problem, Corm. There aren't any, and that credit card bill's pretty damning. Look, I'm on your side, said Ilsa patiently. You want my honest opinion? Anstis is taking a punt, hoping it's going to work out. I think he's feeling the pressure from all the press interest. And to be frank, he's feeling agitated about you slinking around the case and wants to take the initiative. Strike groaned. Where did they get a six-month-old visa bill? Has it taken them this long to go through the stuff they took out of his study? Nope, said Ilsa. It's on the back of one of his daughter's pictures. Apparently the daughter gave it to a friend of his months ago, and this friend went to the police with it this morning, claiming they'd only just looked at the back and realised what was on there. What did you just say? Nothing, Strike sighed. It sounded like Tash Kent. Not that far off. I'll let you go, Ilsa. Thanks for everything. Strike sat for a few seconds in frustrated silence. Bollocks, he said softly to his dark office. He knew how this had happened. Pippa Midgley, in her paranoia and her hysteria, convinced that Strike had been hired by Leonora to pin the murder on somebody else, had run from his office straight to Catherine Kent. Pippa had confessed that she had blown Catherine's pretense never to have read Bombix Mori and urged her to use the evidence she had against Leonora. And so Catherine Kent had ripped down her lover's daughter's picture, Strike imagined it stuck with a magnet to the fridge, and hurried off to the police station. Bollocks, he repeated more loudly, and dialed Robin's number. Chapter 39 I am so well acquainted with despair, I know not how to hope. Thomas Decker and Thomas Middleton, The Honest Whore As her lawyer had predicted, Leonora Quine was charged with the murder of her husband at eleven o'clock the following morning. Alerted by phone, Strike and Robin watched the news spread online, where, minute by minute, the story proliferated like multiplying bacteria. By half-past eleven, the Sun website had a full article on Leonora headed, Rose West Lookalike, who trained at the butchers. The journalists had been busily collecting evidence of Quine's poor record as a husband. His frequent disappearances were linked to liaisons with other women, the sexual themes of his work dissected and embellished. Catherine Kent had been located, doorstepped, photographed, and categorized as Quine's curvy red-headed mistress, a writer of erotic fiction. Shortly before midday, Ilsa called Strike again. She's going to be up in court tomorrow. Where? Wood Green, eleven o'clock. Straight from there to Holloway, I expect. Strike had once lived with his mother and Lucy in a house a mere three minutes away from the closed women's prison that served North London. I want to see her. You can try, but I can't imagine the police will want you near her, and I've got to tell you, Corm, as her lawyer, it might not look... Ilsa, I'm the only chance she's got now. Thanks for the vote of confidence, she said dryly. You know what I mean. He heard her sigh. I'm thinking of you, too. Do you really want to put the police's backs 
How is she? interrupted Strike. Not good, said Ilsa. The separation from Orlando was killing her. The afternoon was punctuated with calls from journalists and people who had known Quine, both groups equally desperate for inside information. Elizabeth Tassel's voice was so deep and rough on the phone that Robin thought her a man. Where's Orlando? the agent demanded of Strike when he came to the phone, as though he had been delegated charge of all members of the Quine family. Who's got her? She's with a neighbor, I think, he said, listening to her wheeze down the line. My God, what a mess, rasped the agent. Leonora, the worm turning after all these years. It's incredible. Nina Lassell's reaction was not altogether to strike surprise, poorly disguised relief. Murder had receded to its rightful place on the hazy edge of the possible. Its shadow no longer touched her. The killer was nobody she knew. His wife does look a bit like Rose West, doesn't she? She asked Strike on the phone, and he knew that she was staring at the Sun's website. Except with long hair. She seemed to be commiserating with him. He had not solved the case. The police had beaten him to it. Listen, I'm having a few people over on Friday. Fancy coming? Can't, sorry, said Strike. I'm having dinner with my brother. He could tell that she thought he was lying. There had been an almost imperceptible hesitation before he had said, my brother, which might well have suggested a pause for rapid thought. Strike could not remember ever describing Al as his brother before. He rarely discussed his half-siblings on his father's side. Before she left the office that evening, Robin set a mug of tea in front of him as he sat poring over the quine file. She could almost feel the anger that Strike was doing his best to hide, and suspected that it was directed at himself quite as much as at Anstis. It's not over, she said, winding her scarf around her neck as she prepared to depart. We'll prove it wasn't her. She had once before used the plural pronoun when Strike's faith in himself had been at a low ebb. He appreciated the moral support, but a feeling of impotence was swamping his thought processes. Strike hated paddling on the periphery of the case, forced to watch as others dived for clues, leads, and information. He sat up late with a quine file that night, reviewing the notes he had made of interviews, examining again the photographs he had printed off his phone. The mangled body of Owen Quine seemed to signal to him in the silence, as corpses often did, exhaling mute appeals for justice and pity. Sometimes the murdered carried messages from their killers like signs forced into their stiff dead hands. Strike stared for a long time at the burned and gaping chest cavity the ropes tight around ankles and wrists. The carcass trussed and gutted like a turkey, but try as he might, he could glean nothing from the pictures that he did not already know. Eventually, he turned off all the lights and headed upstairs to bed. It was a bittersweet relief to have to spend Thursday morning at the offices of his brunette client's exorbitantly expensive divorce lawyers in Lincoln's Inn Fields. Strike was glad to have something to while away time that could not be spent investigating Quine's murder, but he still felt that he had been lured to the meeting under false pretenses. The flirtatious divorcee had given him to understand that her lawyer wanted to hear from Strike in person how he had collected the copious evidence of her husband's duplicity. He sat beside her at a highly polished mahogany table with room for twelve, while she referred constantly to what Cormoran managed to find out and as Cormoran witness, didn't you? Occasionally touching his wrist. It did not take Strike long to deduce from her suave lawyer's barely concealed irritation that it had not been his idea to have Strike in attendance. Nevertheless, as might have been expected when the hourly fee ran to over five hundred pounds, he showed no disposition to hurry matters along. On a trip to the bathroom, Strike checked his phone and saw, in tiny thumbnail pictures, Leonora being led in and out of Wood Green Crown Court. She had been charged and driven away in a police van. There had been plenty of press photographers, but no members of the public baying for her blood. She was not supposed to have murdered anyone that the public much cared about. A text from Robin arrived just as he was about to re-enter the conference room. Could get you in to see Leonora at six this evening? Great, he texted back. I thought, said his flirtatious client, once he had sat back down, that Cormoran might be rather impressive on the witness stand. Strike had already shown her lawyer the meticulous notes and photographs he had compiled, detailing Mr. Burnett's every covert transaction, 
the attempted sale of the apartment, and the palming of the emerald necklace included. To Mrs. Burnett's evident disappointment, neither man saw any reason for Strike to attend court in person, given the quality of his records. Indeed, the lawyer could barely conceal his resentment of the reliance she seemed to place upon the detective. No doubt he thought this wealthy divorcee's discreet caresses and batted eyelashes might be better directed towards him, in his bespoke pinstripe suit, with his distinguished salt-and-pepper hair, instead of a man who looked like a limping prize-fighter. Relieved to quit the rarefied atmosphere, Strike caught the tube back to his office, glad to take off his suit in his flat, happy to think that he would soon be rid of that particular case, and in possession of the fat check that had been the only reason he had taken it. He was free now to focus on that thin, grey-haired fifty-year-old woman in Holloway, who was touted as writer's mousy wife expert with cleaver, on page two of the evening standard he had picked up on the journey. Was a lawyer happy? Robin asked, when he reappeared in the office. Reasonably, said Strike, staring at the miniature tinsel Christmas tree she had placed on her tidy desk. It was decorated with tiny baubles and LED lights. Why? he asked succinctly. Christmas, said Robin, with a faint grin but without apology. I was going to put it up yesterday, but after Leonora was charged I didn't feel very festive. Anyway, I've got you an appointment to see at six. You'll need to take photo ID. Good work, thanks. And I got you some sandwiches. And I thought you might like to see this, she said. Michael Fancourt's given an interview about Quine. I went out to get it. She passed him a pack of cheese and pickle sandwiches, and a copy of the Times folded to the correct page. Strike lowered himself onto the farting leather sofa, and ate while reading the article, which was adorned with a split photograph. On the left-hand side was a picture of Fancourt, standing in front of an Elizabethan country house. Photographed from below, his head looked less out of proportion than usual. On the right-hand side was Quine, eccentric and wild-eyed in his feather-trimmed trilby, addressing a sparse audience in what seemed to be a small marquee. The writer of the piece made much of the fact that Fancourt and Quine had once known each other well, had even been considered equivalent talents. Few now remember Quine's breakout work Hobart Sin, although Fancourt touts it still as a fine example of what he calls Quine's magical brutalism. For all Fancourt's reputation as a man who nurses his grudges, he brings a surprising generosity to our discussion of Quine's oeuvre. Always interesting and often underrated, he says. I suspect that he will be treated more kindly by future critics than our contemporaries. This unexpected generosity is the more surprising when one considers that twenty-five years ago, Fancourt's first wife, Elspeth Kerr, killed herself after reading a cruel parody of her first novel. The spoof was widely attributed to Fancourt's close friend and fellow literary rebel, the late Owen Quine. One mellows almost without realizing it. A compensation of age, because anger is exhausting. I unburden myself of many of the feelings about Ellie's death in my last novel, which should not be read as autobiographical, although, strike, skim the next two paragraphs, which appeared to be promoting Fancourt's next book, and resume reading at the point where the word violence, jumped out at him. It is difficult to reconcile the tweed-jacketed Fancourt in front of me with the one-time self-described literary punk who drew both plaudits and criticism for the inventive and gratuitous violence of his early work. If Mr. Graham Greene was correct, wrote critic Harvey Bird of Fancourt's first novel, and the writer needs a chip of ice in his heart, then Michael Fancourt surely has what it takes in abundance. Reading the rape scene in Bella Front, one starts to imagine that this young man's innards must be glacial. In fact, there are two ways of looking at Bella Front, which is undoubtedly accomplished and original. The first possibility is that Mr. Fancourt has written an unusually mature first novel, in which he has resisted the neophyte tendency to insert himself into the anti-heroic role. We may wince at its grotesqueries or its morality, but nobody could deny the power or artistry of the prose. The second, more disturbing possibility is that Mr. Fancourt does not possess much of an organ in which to place a chip of ice, and his singularly inhuman tale corresponds to his own inner landscape. Time, and further work, will tell. Fancourt hailed originally from Slough, the only son of an unwed nurse. 
His mother still lives in the house in which she grew up. She's happy there, he says. She has an enviable capacity for enjoying the familiar. His own home is a long way from a terraced house in Slough. Our conversation takes place in a long drawing room, crammed with mice and knickknacks and obusson rugs, its windows overlooking the extensive grounds of Ensor Court. This is all my wife's choice, says Fancourt dismissively. My taste in art is very different and confined to the grounds. A large trench to the side of the building is being prepared for the concrete foundation to support a sculpture in rusted metal representing the fury Tysiphony, which he describes with a laugh as an impulse by the avenger of murder, you know, a very powerful piece. My wife loathes it. And somehow we find ourselves back where the interview began, at the macabre fate of Owen Quine. I haven't yet processed Owen's murder, says Fancourt quietly. Like most writers, I tend to find out what I feel on a subject by writing about it. It is how we interpret the world, how we make sense of it. Does this mean that we can expect a fictionalized account of Quine's killing? I can hear the accusations of bad taste and exploitation already, smiles Fancourt. I dare say the themes of lost friendship, of a last chance to talk, to explain and make amends may make an appearance in due course, but Owen's murder has already been treated fictionally by himself. He is one of the few to have read the notorious manuscript that appears to have formed the blueprint of the murder. I read it the very day that Quine's body was discovered. My publisher was very keen for me to see it. I'm portrayed in it, you see. He seems genuinely indifferent about his inclusion, however insulting the portrait may have been. I wasn't interested in calling in lawyers. I deplore censorship. What did he think of the book in literary terms? It's what Nabokov called a maniac's masterpiece, he replies, smiling. There may be a case for publishing it in due course, who knows? He can't surely be serious. But why shouldn't it be published? demands Fancourt. Art is supposed to provoke. By that standard alone, Bombix Mori has more than fulfilled its remit. Yes, why not? asks the literary punk ensconced in his Elizabethan manner, with an introduction by Michael Fancourt, I suggest. Stranger things have happened, replies Michael Fancourt with a grin. Much stranger. Christ almighty, muttered Strike, throwing the times back onto Robin's desk and narrowly missing the Christmas tree. Did you see he only claims to have read Bombix Mori the day you found Quine? Yeah, said Strike. He's lying, said Robin. We think he's lying. Strike corrected her. Holding fast to his resolution not to waste any more money on taxes, but with the snow still falling, Strike took the number 29 bus through the darkening afternoon. It ran north, taking Strike on a twenty-minute journey through the recently gritted roads. A haggard woman got on at Hampstead Road, accompanied by a small, grizzling boy. Some sixth sense told Strike that the three of them were headed in the same direction, and, sure enough, both he and the woman stood to get out in Camden Road, alongside the bare flank of HMP Holloway. You gonna see Mummy, she told her charge, whom Strike guessed to be her grandson, though she looked around forty. Surrounded by bare-limbed trees and grass verges covered in thick snow, the jail might have been a red-brick university faculty, but for authoritarian signs in government issue blue and white, and the sixteen-foot-high doors, set into the wall so that prison vans might pass. Strike joined the trickle of visitors, several of them with children, who strained to make marks in the untouched snow heaped beside the paths. The line shuffled together past the terracotta walls with their cement frets, past the hanging baskets, now balls of snow in the freezing December air. The majority of his fellow visitors were women. Strike was unique among the men, not merely for his size, but for the fact that he did not look as though life had pummeled him into a quiescent stupor. A heavily tattooed youth in sagging jeans walked ahead of him, staggered a little with every step. Strike had seen neurological damage back in Selly Oak, but guessed that this kind had not been sustained under mortar fire. The stout female prison officer, whose job it was to check IDs, examined his driver's license, then stared up at him. I know who you are, she said, with a piercing look. Strike wondered whether Anstis had asked to be tipped off if he went to see Leonora. It seemed probable. He had arrived deliberately early, so as not to waste a minute of his allotted time with his client. 
This foresight permitted him a coffee in the visitor's center, which was run by a children's charity. The room was bright and almost cheerful, and many of the kids greeted the trucks and teddies as old friends. Strike's haggard companion from the bus watched, gaunt and impassive, as the boy with her played with an action man around Strike's large feet, treating him like a massive piece of sculpture. Tisiphone, the Avenger of Murder. He was called through to the visitor's hall at six on the dot. Footsteps echoed off the shiny floors. The walls were of concrete blocks, but bright murals painted by the prisoners did their best to soften the cavernous space, which echoed with the clang of metal and keys and the murmur of talk. The plastic seats were fixed either side of a small, low central table, similarly immovable so as to minimize contact between prisoner and visitor and prevent the passing of contraband. A toddler wailed. Warders stood around the walls, watching. Strike, who had only ever dealt with male prisoners, felt a repugnance for the place, unusual in him. The kids, staring at gaunt mothers, the subtle signs of mental illness in the fiddling and twitching of bitten fingers, drowsy, over-medicated women curled in their plastic seats, were quite unlike the male detention facilities with which he was familiar. Leonora sat waiting, tiny and fragile, pathetically glad to see him. She was wearing her own clothes, a loose sweatshirt, and trousers in which she looked shrunken. Orlando's been in, she said. Her eyes were bright red. He could tell that she had been crying for a long time. Didn't want to leave me. They dragged her out. Wouldn't let me calm her down. Where she would have shown defiance and anger, he could hear the beginnings of institutionalized hopelessness. Forty-eight hours had taught her that she had lost all control and power. Leonora, we need to talk about that credit card statement. I never had that card she said, her white lips trembling. Owen always kept it. I never had it except sometimes if I needed to go to the supermarket. He always gave me cash. Strike remembered that she had come to him in the first place because money was running out. I left all our finances up to Owen, that's how I liked it. But he was careless. He never used to check his bills nor his bank statements. He used to just sling them in his office. I used to say to him, You want to check those? Somebody could be diddling you. But he never cared. He'd give anything to Orlando to draw on. That's why he'd had her picture. Never mind the picture. Somebody other than you or Owen must have had access to that credit card. We're going to run through a few people, okay? All right, she mumbled, cowed. Elizabeth Tassel supervised work on the house in Telgarth Road, right? How was that paid for? Did she have a copy of your credit card? No, said Leonora. Are you sure? Yeah, I'm sure because we offered it to her, and she said it was easier just to take it out of Owen's next royalties, because he was due so many time. He sells well in Finland, I don't know why, but they like his. You can't think of any time where Elizabeth Tassel did something for the house and had the visa card. No, she said, shaking her head. Never. Okay, said Strike. Can you remember and take your time? Any occasion when Owen paid for something with his credit card at Ropa Chard? And to his astonishment, she said, Not rope a chard exactly, but yeah, they were all there. I was there too. It was, I dunno, two years ago, maybe less. A big dinner for publishers it was at the Dorchester. They put me and Owen at a table with all the junior people. Daniel Chard and Jerry Waldegrave were nowhere near us. Anyway, there was a silent auction, you know, when you write down your bid for, Yeah, I know how they work, said Strike trying to contain his impatience. It was for some writer's charity when they try and get writers out of prison. And Owen bid on a weekend in his country house hotel, and he won it, and he had to give his credit card details at the dinner. Some of the young girls from the publishers were there all tarted up, taking payment. He gave the girl his card. I remember that because he was pissed, she said, with a shadow of her former sullenness. And he paid eight hundred quid for it, showing off trying to make out he earned money like the others. He handed his credit card over to a girl from the publishers, repeated Strike. Did she take the details at the table, or... She couldn't make her little machine work, said Leonora. She took it away and brought it back. Anyone else there you recognized? Michael Fancourt was there with his publisher, she said, on the other side of the room. That was before he moved to Roper Chard. Did he and Owen speak? Not likely she said. Right, what about, he said, 
and hesitated. They had never before acknowledged the existence of Catherine Kent. His girlfriend could have got it at any time, couldn't she? said Leonora, as though she had read his mind. You knew about her? he asked, matter of fact. Police said something, replied Leonora, her expression bleak. There has always been someone, where he was, picking them up at his writing classes. I used to give him right tellings off. When they said he was... when they said he was... he was tied up. She had started to cry again. I knew it must have been a woman what done it. He liked that. Got him going. You didn't know about Catherine Kent before the police mentioned her. I saw her name on a text on his phone one time, but he said it was nothing. Said she was just one of his students, like he always said. Told me he'd never leave us, me and Orlando. She wiped her eyes under her outdated glasses with the back of a thin, trembling hand. But you never saw Catherine Kent until she came to the door to say that her sister had died. Was that her, was it? asked Leonora, sniffing and dabbing at her eyes with her cuff. Fat, ain't she? Well, she could have got his credit card details any time, couldn't she? Taken out of his wallet while he was sleeping. It was going to be difficult to find and question Catherine Kent, strike new. He was sure she would have absconded from her flat to avoid the attentions of the press. The things the murderer bought on the card, he said, changing tack, were ordered online. You haven't got a computer at home, have you? Owen never liked him. He preferred his old type. Have you ever ordered chopping over the internet? Yeah, she replied, and his heart sank a little. He had been hoping that Leonora might be that almost mythical beast, a computer virgin. Where did you do that? Edna's. She let me borrow hers to order Orlando an art set for a birthday, so I didn't have to go into town, said Leonora. Doubtless the police would soon be confiscating and ripping apart the kind-hearted Edna's computer. A woman with a shaved head and a tattooed lip on the next table began shouting at a warder, who had warned her to stay in her seat. Leonora cowered away from the prisoner as she erupted into obscenities, and the officer approached. Leonora, there's one last thing, said Strike loudly as the shouting at the next table reached a crescendo. Did Owen say anything to you about meaning to go away, to take a break, before he walked out on the fifth? No, she said. Of course not. The prisoner at the next table had been persuaded to quieten down. Her visitor, a woman similarly tattooed, and only slightly less aggressive-looking, gave the prison officer the finger as she walked away. You can't think of anything Owen said or did that might have suggested he was planning to go away for a while, Strike persisted as Leonora watched their neighbours with anxious, owl-like eyes. What? she said distractedly. No, he never tells. Told me. Always just went. If he knew he was going, why wouldn't he say goodbye? She began to cry, one thin hand over her mouth. What's going to happen to Dodo if they keep me in prison? she asked him through her sobs. Edna can't have her forever. She can't handle her. She went and left Cheeky Monkey behind and Dodo had done some pictures for me. And after a disconcerted moment or two, Strike decided that she must be talking about the plush orangutan that Orlando had been cradling on his visit to their house. If they make me stay here... I'm going to get you out, said Strike, with more confidence than he felt. But what harm would it do to give her something to hold on to? Something to get her through the next twenty-four hours? Their time was up. He left the hall without looking back, wondering what it was about Leonora, faded and grumpy. Fifty years old, with a brain-damaged daughter and a hopeless life, that had inspired in him this fierce determination, this fury. Because she didn't do it, came the simple answer. Because she's innocent. In the last eight months, a stream of clients had pushed open the engraved glass door bearing his name, and the reasons they had sought him had been uncannily similar. They had come because they wanted a spy, a weapon a means of redressing some balance in their favour, or of divesting themselves of inconvenient connections. They came because they sought an advantage, because they felt they were owed retribution or compensation, because, overwhelmingly, they wanted more money. But Leonora had come to him, because she wanted her husband to come home. It had been a simple wish born of weariness and of love, if not for the errant quine, then for the daughter who missed him. For the purity of her desire, Strike felt he owed her the best he could give. The cold air outside the prison tasted different. It had been a long time, 
since Strike had been in an environment where following orders was the backbone of daily life. He could feel his freedom as he walked, leaning heavily on the stick, back towards the bus stop. At the back of the bus, three drunken young women wearing headbands from which reindeer antlers protruded were singing, They say it's unrealistic, but I believe in you, Saint Nick. Bloody Christmas, thought Strike, thinking irritably of the presents he would be expected to buy for his nephews and godchildren, none of whose ages he could ever remember. The bus groaned on through the slush and the snow. Lights of every colour gleamed blurrily at Strike through the steamed-up bus window. Scowling, with his mind on injustice and murder, he effortlessly and silently repelled anyone who might have considered sitting in the seat beside him. Chapter 40 Be glad thou art unnamed. It is not worth the owning. Francis Beaumont and John Fletcher, the false one. Sleet, rain and snow pelted the office windows in turn the following day. Miss Brocklehurst's boss turned up at the office around midday to view confirmation of her infidelity. Shortly after Strike had bidden him farewell, Caroline Ingalls arrived. She was harried, on her way to pick up her children from school, but determined to give Strike the card for the newly opened Golden Lace Gentleman's Club and Bar that she had found in her husband's wallet. Mr. Ingalls' promise to stay well away from lap dancers, call girls and strippers had been a requirement of their reconciliation. Strike agreed to stake out Golden Lace to see whether Mr. Ingalls had again succumbed to temptation. By the time Caroline Ingalls had left, Strike was very ready for the pack of sandwiches waiting for him on Robin's desk, but he had barely taken a mouthful when his phone rang. Aware that their professional relationship was coming to a close, his brunette client was throwing caution to the winds and inviting Strike out to dinner. Strike thought he could see Robin smiling as she ate her sandwich, determinedly facing her monitor. He tried to decline with politeness, at first pleading his heavy workload, and finally telling her that he was in a relationship. You never told me that, she said, suddenly cold. I like to keep my private and professional life separate, he said. She hung up halfway through his polite farewell. Maybe you should have gone out with her, said Robin innocently, just to make sure she'll pay her bill. She'll bloody pay, growled Strike, making up for lost time by cramming half a sandwich into his mouth. The phone buzzed. He groaned and looked down to see who had texted him. His stomach contracted. Leonora? asked Robin, who had seen his face fall. Strike shook his head, his mouth full of sandwich. The message comprised three words. It was yours. He had not changed his number since he had split up with Charlotte. Too much hassle when a hundred professional contacts had it. This was the first time she had used it in eight months. Strike remembered Dave Polworth's warning. You be on the watch, Diddy, for signs of her galloping back over the horizon. Wouldn't be surprised if she bolts. Today was the third, he reminded himself. She was supposed to be getting married tomorrow. For the first time since he had owned a mobile phone, Strike wished it had the facility to reveal a caller's location. Had she sent this from the castle of fucking Croy, in an interlude between checking the canapes and the flowers in the chapel? Or was she standing on the corner of Denmark Street, watching his office like Pippa Midgley? Running away from a grand, well-publicized wedding like this would be Charlotte's crowning achievement, the very apex of her career of mayhem and disruption. Strike put the mobile back into his pocket and started on his second sandwich. Deducing that she was not about to discover what had made Strike's expression turn stony, Robin screwed up her empty crisp packet, dropped it in the bin, and said, You're meeting your brother tonight, aren't you? What? Aren't you meeting your brother? Oh, yeah, said Strike. Yeah. At the River Cafe? Yeah. It was yours. Why? asked Robin. Mine? The hell it was. If it even existed. What? said Strike, vaguely aware that Robin had asked him something. Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine, he said, pulling himself together. What did you ask me? Why are you going to the River Cafe? Oh, well, said Strike, reaching for his own packet of crisps. It's a long shot, but I want to speak to anyone who witnessed Quine and Tassel's row. I'm trying to get a handle on whether he staged it, whether he was planning his disappearance all along. You're hoping to find a member of staff who was there that night, said Robin, clearly dubious. Which is why I'm taken out, said Strike. He knows every waiter in every smart restaurant in London. All my father's kids do. When he had finished lunch, 
he took a coffee into his office and closed the door. Sleet was again spattering his window. He could not resist glancing down into the frozen street, half expecting, hoping, to see her there, long black hair whipping around her perfect pale face, staring up at him, imploring him with her flecked green hazel eyes. But there was nobody in the street except strangers, swaddled against the relentless weather. He was crazy on every count. She was in Scotland, and it was much, much better so. Later, when Robin had gone home, he put on the Italian suit that Charlotte had bought him over a year ago, when they had dined at this very restaurant to celebrate his thirty-fifth birthday. After pulling on his overcoat, he locked his flat door and set out for the tube in the sub-zero cold, still leaning on his stick. Christmas assailed him from every window he passed. Spangled lights, mounds of new objects, of toys and gadgets, fake snow on glass, and sundry pre-Christmas sale signs, adding a mournful note in the depths of the recession. More pre-Christmas revelers on the Friday night tube, girls in ludicrously tiny glittering dresses, risking hypothermia for a fumble with the boy from packaging. Strike felt weary and low. The walk from Hammersmith was longer than he had remembered. As he proceeded down Fulham Palace Road, he realized how close he was to Elizabeth Tassel's house. Presumably she had suggested the restaurant, a long way from the Quine's place in Labrook Grove, precisely because of its convenience to her. After ten minutes, Strike turned right and headed through the darkness towards Thames Wharf, through empty echoing streets, his breath rising in a smoky cloud. The riverside garden that in summer would be full of diners at white tablecloth chairs was buried under thick snow. The Thames glinted darkly beyond the pale carpet, iron cold and menacing. Strike turned into the converted brick storage facility and was at once subsumed in light, warmth, and noise. There, just inside the door, leaning against the bar with his elbow on its shiny steel surface, was Al, deep in friendly conversation with the barman. He was barely five foot ten, which was short for one of Ropeby's children, and carrying a little too much weight. His mouse-brown hair was slicked back. He had his mother's narrow jaw, but he had inherited the weak divergent squint that added an attractive strangeness to Rokeby's handsome face, and marked Al inescapably as his father's son. Catching sight of Strike, Al let out a roar of welcome, bounced forwards and hugged him. Strike barely responded, being hampered by his stick and the coat he was trying to remove. Al fell back, looking sheepish. How are you, bruv? In spite of the comic anglicism, his accent was a strange mid-Atlantic hybrid that testified to years spent between Europe and America. Not bad, said Strike. You? Yeah, not bad, echoed Al. Not bad, could be worse. He gave a kind of exaggerated Gallic shrug. Al had been educated at La Rose, the international boarding school in Switzerland, and his body language still bore traces of the continental manners he had met there. Something else underlay the response, however, something that Strike felt every time they met. Al's guilt, his defensiveness, a preparedness to meet accusations of having had a soft and easy life compared to his older brother. What are you having? Al asked. Beer? Fancy a Peroni? They sat side by side at the cram bar, facing glass shelves of bottles, waiting for their table. Looking down the long, packed restaurant, with its industrial steel ceiling in stylized waves, its cerulean carpet, and the wood-burning oven at the end like a giant beehive, Strike spotted a celebrated sculptor, a famous female architect, and at least one well-known actor. Heard about you and Charlotte, Al said. Shame. Strike wondered whether Al knew somebody who knew her. He ran with a jet-set crowd that might well stretch to the future Viscount of Croy. Yeah, well, said Strike with a shrug, for the best. He and Charlotte had sat here, in this wonderful restaurant by the river, and enjoyed their very last happy evening together. It had taken four months for the relationship to unravel and implode, four months of exhausting aggression and misery. It was yours. A good-looking young woman whom Al greeted by name showed them to their table. An equally attractive young man handed them menus. Strike waited for Al to order wine, and for the staff to depart before explaining why they were there. Four weeks ago tonight, he told Al, a writer called Owen Quine had a row with his agent in here. By all accounts, the whole restaurant saw it. He stormed out, and shortly afterwards, 
probably within days and maybe even that night. He was murdered, said Al, who had listened to Strike with his mouth open. I saw it in the paper. You found the body. His tone conveyed a yearning for details that Strike chose to ignore. There might be nothing to find out here, but I... His wife did it, though, said Al, puzzled. They've got her. His wife didn't do it, said Strike, turning his attention to the paper menu. He had noticed before now that Al, who had grown up surrounded by innumerable inaccurate press stories about his father and his family, never seemed to extend his healthy mistrust of British journalism to any other topic. It had had two campuses, Al's school, lessons by Lake Geneva in the summer months, and then up to Gestadt for the winter, afternoons spent skiing and skating. Al had grown up breathing exorbitantly priced mountain air, cushioned by the companionship of other celebrity children. The distant snarling of the tabloids had been a mere background murmur in his life. This, at least, was how Strike interpreted the little that Al had told him of his youth. The wife didn't do it, said Al, when Strike looked up again. No. Whoa, you gonna pull another Lula Landry? asked Al, with a wide grin that added charm to his off-kilter stare. That's the idea, said Strike. You want me to sound out the staff? asked Al. Exactly, said Strike. He was amused and touched by how delighted Al seemed to be at being given the chance to render him service. No problem, no problem. Try and get someone decent for you. Where's Lulu gone? She's a smart cookie. After they had ordered, Al strolled to the bathroom to see whether he could spot the smart Lulu. Strike sat alone, drinking Tianello ordered by Al, watching the white-coated chefs working in the open kitchen. They were young, skilled, and efficient. Flames darted, knives flickered, heavy iron pans moved hither and thither. He's not stupid, Strike thought of his brother, watching Al meander back towards the table, leading a dark girl in a white apron. He's just... This is Lulu, said Al, sitting back down. She was here that night. You remember the argument? Strike asked her focusing at once on the girl who was too busy to sit, but stood smiling vaguely at him. Oh, yeah, she said. It was really loud. Brought the place to a standstill. Can you remember what the man looked like? Strike said, keen to establish that she had witnessed the right row. A fat bloke wearing a hat, yeah, she said, yelling at a woman with grey hair. Yeah, they had a real bust-up. Sorry, I'm going to have to... And she was gone to take another table's order. We'll grab her on the way back. Al reassured Strike. Eddie sends his best, by the way. Wishes he could have been here. How's he doing? Asked Strike, feigning interest. Where Al had shown himself keen to forge a friendship, his younger brother Eddie seemed indifferent. He was twenty-four and the lead singer in his own band. Strike had never listened to any of their music. He's great, said Al. Silence fell between them. Their starters arrived and they ate without talking. Strike knew that Al had achieved excellent grades in his international baccalaureate. One evening in a military tent in Afghanistan, Strike had seen a photograph online of 18-year-old Al in a cream blazer with a crest on the pocket, long hair swept sideways and gleaming gold in the bright Geneva sun. Brokeby had had his arm around Al, beaming with paternal pride. The picture had been newsworthy because Rokeby had never been photographed in a suit and tie before. Hello, Al, said a familiar voice, and to Strike's astonishment, there stood Daniel Chard on crutches, his bald head reflecting the subtle spots shining from the industrial waves above them. Wearing a dark red open-neck shirt and a grey suit, the publisher looked stylish among this more bohemian crowd. Oh, said Al, and Strike could tell that he was struggling to place Chard. Uh, hi, Dan Chard, said the publisher. We met when I was speaking to your father about his autobiography. Oh, oh, yeah, said Al, standing up and shaking hands. This is my brother, Cormoran. If Strike had been surprised to see Chard approach Al, it was nothing to the shock that registered on Chard's face at the sight of Strike. Your, your brother, half-brother, said Strike, inwardly amused by Chard's evident bewilderment. How could the hireling detective be related to the Playboy Prince? The effort it had cost Chard to approach the son of a potentially lucrative subject seemed to have left him with nothing to spare for a three-way awkward silence. Leg feeling better? Strike asked. Oh, yes, said Chard. Much. Well, I'll... I'll leave you to your dinner. 
He moved away, swinging deftly between tables, and resumed his seat where Strike could no longer watch him. Strike and Owl sat back down, Strike reflecting on how very small London was once you reached a certain altitude, once you had left behind those who could not easily secure tables at the best restaurants and clubs. Couldn't remember who he was, said Al with a sheepish grin. He's thinking of writing his autobiography, is he? Strike asked. He never referred to Rokeby as dad, but tried to remember not to call him Rokeby in front of Al. Yeah, said Al. They're offering him big money. I don't know whether he's going to go with that bloke or one of the others. It'll probably be ghosted. Strike wondered fleetingly how Rokeby might treat his eldest son's accidental conception and disputed birth in such a book. Perhaps, he thought, Rokeby would skip any mention of it. That would certainly be Strike's preference. He'd still like to meet you, you know, said Al, with an air of having screwed himself up to say it. He's really proud. He read everything about the Landry case. Yeah, said Strike looking around the restaurant for Lulu, the waitress who remembered Quine. Yeah, said Al. So what did he do, interview publishers? Strike asked. He thought of Catherine Kent, of Quine himself, the one unable to find a publisher, the other dropped, and the aging rock star, able to take his pick. Yeah, kind of, said Al. I don't know if he's going to do it or not. I think that charred guy was recommended to him. Who, boy? Michael Fancourt said Al, wiping his plate of risotto clean with a piece of bread. Rokeby knows Fancourt, asked Strike, forgetting his resolution. Yeah, said Al with a slight frown. Then, let's face it, Dad knows everyone. It reminded Strike of the way Elizabeth Tassel had said, I thought everyone knew why she no longer represented Fancourt, but there was a difference. To Al, everyone meant the someones, the rich, the famous, the influential. The poor saps who bought his father's music were nobodies, just as Strike had been nobody until he had burst into prominence for catching a killer. When did Fancourt recommend Roper Chard to? When did he recommend Chard? asked Strike. Dunno, a few months ago, said Al vaguely. He told Dad he'd just moved there himself, half a million advance. Nice, said Strike. Told Dad to watch the news, that there'd be a buzz about the place once he moved. Lulu, the waitress, had moved back into view. Al hailed her again. She approached with a harried expression. Give me ten, she said, and I'll be able to talk. Just give me ten. While Strike finished his pork, Al asked about his work. Strike was surprised by the genuineness of Al's interest. Do you miss the army? Al asked. Sometimes, admitted Strike. What are you up to these days? He felt a vague guilt at not having asked already. Now that he came to think about it, he was not clear how or whether Al had ever earned his living. Might be going in a business with a friend, said Al. Not working then, thought Strike. Bespoke services, leisure opportunities, muttered Al. Great, said Strike. Will be if it comes to anything, said Al. A pause. Strike looked around for Lulu, the whole point of being here, but she was out of sight, busy as Al had probably never been busy in his life. You've got credibility at least said Al. Hmm, said Strike. Made it on your own, haven't you? said Al. What? Strike realized that there was a one-sided crisis happening at the table. Al was looking at him with a mixture of mingled defiance and envy. Yeah, well, said Strike, shrugging his large shoulders. He could not think of any more meaningful response that would not sound superior or aggrieved, nor did he wish to encourage Al in what seemed to be an attempt to have a more personal conversation than they had ever managed. You're the only one of us who doesn't use it, said Al. Don't suppose it would have helped in the army anyway, would it? Futile to pretend not to know what it was. Suppose not, said Strike. And indeed, on the rare occasions that his parentage had attracted the attention of fellow soldiers, he had met nothing but incredulity, especially given how little he looked like Rokeby. But he thought wryly of his flat on this ice-cold winter night, two and a half cluttered rooms, ill-fitting window panes. Al would be spending tonight in Mayfair, in their father's staffed house. It might be salutary to show his brother the reality of independence before he romanticized it too much. Suppose you think this is self-pitying bloody whinging, demanded Al. Strike had seen Al's graduation photograph online, a bare hour after interviewing an inconsolable nineteen-year-old private, 
who had accidentally shot his best friend in the chest and neck with a machine gun. Everyone's entitled to whinge, said Strike. Al looked as though he might take offense, then reluctantly grinned. Lulu was suddenly beside them, clutching a glass of water, and deftly removing her apron with one hand before she sat down with them. Okay, I've got five minutes, she said to Strike without preamble. Al says you want to know about that jerk of a writer. Yeah, said Strike, focusing at once. What makes you say he was a jerk? He loved it, she said, sipping her water. Loved. Causing a scene. He was yelling and swearing, but it was for show, you could tell. He wanted everyone to hear him. He wanted an audience. He wasn't a good actor. Can you remember what he said? asked Strike, pulling out a notebook. Al was watching excitedly. There was loads of it. He called the woman a bitch, said she'd lied to him, that he'd put the book out himself and screw her. But he was enjoying himself, she said. It was fake fury. And what about Eliz, the woman? Oh, she was bloody furious, said Lulu cheerfully. She wasn't pretending. The more he ponced about waving his arms and shouting at her, the redder she got. Shaking with anger, she could hardly contain herself. She said something about roping in that stupid bloody woman, and I think it was around then that he stormed out, parking her with the bill, everyone staring at her. She looked mortified. I felt awful for her. Did she try and follow him? No. She paid and then went into the loo for a bit. I wondered whether she was crying, actually. Then she left. That's very helpful, said Strike. You can't remember anything else they said to each other. Yeah, said Lulu calmly. He shouted, all because of Fancourt and his limp fucking dick. Strike and Al stared at her. All because of Fancourt and his limp fucking dick, repeated Strike. Yeah, said Lulu. That was the bit that made the restaurant go quiet. You can see why it would, commented Al with a snigger. She tried to shout him down. She was absolutely incensed, but he wasn't having any of it. He was loving the attention, lapping it up. Look, I've got to get going, said Lulu. Sorry. She stood up and retied her apron. See you, Al. She did not know Strike's name, but smiled at him as she bustled away again. Daniel Chard was leaving. His bald head had reappeared over the crowd, accompanied by a group of similarly aged and elegant people, all of them walking out together, talking, nodding to each other. Strike watched them go with his mind elsewhere. He did not notice the removal of his empty plate. All because of Fancor and his limp fucking dick. Odd. I can't shake this mad bloody idea that Owen did it to himself, that he staged it. You are right, bruv? asked Al. A note with a kiss? Pay back time for both of us. Yeah, said Strike. Load of gore and arcane symbolism. Stoke that man's vanity and you could get him to do anything you wanted. Two hermaphrodites, two bloody bats. A beautiful lost soul, that's what he said to me. The silkworm was a metaphor for the writer, who has to go through agonies to get at the good stuff. Like the turning lid that finds its thread, a multitude of disconnected facts revolved in Strike's mind and slid suddenly into place, incontrovertibly correct, unassailably right. He turned his theory around and around. It was perfect, snug, and solid. The problem was that he could not yet see how to prove it. Chapter 41 Thinkest thou my thoughts are lunaces of love? No, they are brands fired in Pluto's forge. Robert Green, Orlando Furioso Strike rose early next morning after a night of broken sleep, tired, frustrated, and edgy. He checked his phone for messages before showering, and after dressing, then went downstairs into his empty office, irritated that Robin was not there on a Saturday, and feeling the absence, unreasonably, as a mark of her lack of commitment. She would have been a useful sounding board this morning. He would have liked company after his revelation of the previous evening. He considered phoning her, but it would be infinitely more satisfying to tell her face to face, rather than doing it over the telephone, particularly if Matthew were listening in. Strike made himself tea, but let it grow cold while he poured over the quine file. The sense of his impotence ballooned in the silence. He kept checking his mobile. He wanted to do something, but he was completely stymied by lack of official status, having no authority to make searches of private property or to enforce the cooperation of witnesses. There was nothing he could do until his interview with Michael Fancourt on Monday, unless. Ought he to call Anstis and lay his theory before him? Strike frowned, running thick fingers through his dense hair, 
imagining Anstice's patronizing response, there was literally not a shred of evidence. All was conjecture, but I'm right, thought Strike with easy arrogance, and he screwed up. Anstice had neither the wit nor the imagination to appreciate a theory that explained every oddity in the killing, but which would seem to him incredible compared to the easy solution, riddled with inconsistencies and unanswered questions, though the case against Leonora was. Explain, Strike demanded of an imaginary Anstice, why a woman smart enough to spirit away his guts without trace would have been dumb enough to order ropes and a burka on her own credit card. Explain why a mother with no relatives, whose sole preoccupation in life is the well-being of her daughter, would risk a life sentence. Explain why, after years of accommodating Quine's infidelity and sexual quirks to keep their family together, she suddenly decided to kill him. But to the last question, Anstice might just have a reasonable answer, that Quine had been on the verge of leaving his wife for Catherine Kent. The author's life had been well insured, Perhaps Leonora would have decided that financial security as a widow would be preferable to an uncertain hand-to-mouth existence while her feckless ex squandered money on his second wife. A jury would buy that version of events, especially if Catherine Kent took the stand and confirmed that Quine had promised to marry her. Strike was afraid that he had blown his chance with Catherine Kent, turning up unexpectedly on her doorstep as he had, in retrospect, a clumsy, inept move. He had scared her, looming out of the darkness on her balcony, making it only too easy for Pippa Midgley to paint him as Leonora's sinister stooge. He ought to have proceeded with finesse, eased himself into her confidence the way he had done with Lord Parker's P.A., so that he could extract confessions like teeth under the influence of concerned sympathy, instead of jackbooting to her door like a bailiff. He checked his mobile again. No messages. He glanced at his watch. It was barely half-past nine. Against his will, he felt his attention tugging to be free of the place where he wanted and needed it, on Quine's killer, and the things that must be done to secure an arrest, to the seventeenth-century chapel in the castle of Croy. She would be getting dressed, no doubt, in a bridal gown costing thousands. He could imagine her naked in front of the mirror, painting her face. He had watched her do it a hundred times, wielding the makeup brushes in front of dressing-table mirrors, hotel mirrors, so acutely aware of her own desirability that she almost attained unself-consciousness. Was Charlotte checking her phone as the minutes slipped by? Now that the short walk up the aisle was so close, now that it felt like the walk along a gangplank, was she still waiting, hoping, for a response from Strike to her three-word message of yesterday? And if he sent an answer now, what would it take to make her turn her back on the wedding dress? He can imagine it hanging like a ghost in the corner of her room, and pull on her jeans, throw a few things in a hold all, and slip out of a back door, into a car, a foot flat to the floor, heading back south to the man who had always meant escape. Fuck this, Strike muttered. He stood up, shoved the mobile in his pocket, threw back the last of his cold tea, and pulled on his overcoat. Keeping busy was the only answer. Action had always been his drug of choice. Sure though he was that Catherine Kent would have decamped to her friends now that the press had found her, and notwithstanding the fact that he regretted turning up unannounced on her doorstep, he returned to Clem Attlee Court only to have his suspicions confirmed. Nobody answered the door, the lights were off, and all seemed silent within. An icy wind blew along the brick balcony. As Strike moved away, the angry-looking woman from next door appeared, this time eager to talk. She's gone away. You press, are you? Yeah, said Strike, because he could tell the neighbour was excited at the idea, and because he did not want Kent to know that he had been back. The things your lot have written, she said, with poorly disguised glee. The things you said about her. Nah, she's gone. Any idea when she'll be back? Nah, said the neighbour with regret. Her pink scalp was visible through the sparse, tightly permed grey hair. I could call you, she suggested. If she shows up again, that'd be very helpful, said Strike. His name had been in the papers a little too recently to hand over one of his cards. He tore out a page of his notebook, wrote his number out for her, and handed it over with a twenty-pound note. Cheers, she said, businesslike. See ya. He passed a cat on his way back downstairs, the same one, he was sure, 
at which Catherine Kent had taken a kick. It watched him with wary but superior eyes as he passed. The gang of youths he had met previously had gone. Too cold today if your warmest item of clothing was a sweatshirt. Limping through the slippery grey snow required physical effort, which helped distract his busy mind, making moot the question of whether he was moving from suspect to suspect on Leonora's behalf or Charlotte's. Let the latter continue towards the prison of her own choosing. He would not call. He would not text. When he reached the tube, he pulled out his phone and telephoned Jerry Waldegrave. He was sure that the editor had information that Strike needed, that he had not known he needed before his moment of revelation in the River Café, but Waldegrave did not pick up. Strike was not surprised. Waldegrave had a failing marriage, a moribund career, and a daughter to worry about. Why take a detective's calls, too? Why complicate your life when it did not need complicating, when you had a choice? The cold, the ringing of unanswered phones, silent flats with locked doors. He could do nothing else today. Strike bought a newspaper and went to the Tottenham, sitting himself beneath one of the voluptuous women painted by a Victorian set designer, cavorting with Flora in their flimsy draperies. Today, Strike felt strangely as though he was in a waiting room, whiling away the hours. Memories like shrapnel forever embedded, infected by what had come later. Words of love and undying devotion, times of sublime happiness. Lies upon lies upon lies. His attention kept sliding away from the stories he was reading. His sister Lucy had once said to him in exasperation, Why do you put up with it? Why? Just because she's beautiful? And he had answered, It helps. She had expected him to say no, of course. Though they had spent so much time trying to make themselves beautiful, you were not supposed to admit to women that beauty mattered. Charlotte was beautiful, the most beautiful woman he had ever seen, and he had never rid himself of a sense of wonder at her looks, nor of the gratitude they inspired, nor of pride by association. Love, Michael Fancourt had said, is a delusion. Strike, turn the page on a picture of the Chancellor of the Exchequer's sulky face without seeing it. Had he imagined things in Charlotte that had never been there? Had he invented virtues for her, to add luster to her staggering looks? He had been nineteen when they met. It seemed incredibly young to strike now, as he sat in this pub carrying a good two stone of excess weight, missing half a leg. Perhaps he had created a Charlotte in her own image, who had never existed outside his own besotted mind. But what of it? He had loved the real Charlotte, too. The woman who had stripped herself bare in front of him, demanding whether he could still love her if she did this, if she confessed to this, if she treated him like this, until finally she had found his limit, and beauty, rage, and tears had been insufficient to hold him, and she had fled into the arms of another man. And maybe that's love, he thought, siding in his mind with Michael Fancourt against an invisible and censorious Robin who for some reason seemed to be sitting in judgment on him as he sat drinking Doom Bar and pretending to read about the worst winter on record. You and Matthew. Strike could see it, even if she could not. The condition of being with Matthew was not to be herself. Where was the couple that saw each other clearly? In the endless parade of suburban conformity that seemed to be Lucy and Greg's marriage? In the tedious variations on betrayal and disillusionment that brought a never-ending stream of clients to his door, in the willfully blind allegiance of Leonora Quine, to a man whose every fault had been excused because he's a writer, or the hero worship that Catherine Kent and Pippa Midgley had brought to the same fool, trussed like a turkey, and disemboweled. Strike was depressing himself. He was halfway down his third pint. As he wondered whether he was going to have a fourth, his, his mobile buzzed on the table where he had laid it, face down. He drank his beer slowly while the pub filled up around him, looking at his phone, taking bets against himself, outside the chapel, giving me one last chance to stop it, or she's done it and wants to let me know. He drank the last of his beer before flipping the mobile over. Congratulate me, Mrs. Jago Ross. Strike stared at the words for a few seconds, then slid the phone into his pocket, got up, folded the newspaper under his arm, and set off home. As he walked with the aid of his stick back to Denmark Street, he remembered the words from his favourite book, unread for a very long time, 
buried at the bottom of the box of belongings on his landing, difficile est, longum subito, deponere amorum, difficile est, averum hoc qua lubet efficias. It is hard to throw off long-established love, hard, but this you must manage somehow. The restlessness that had consumed him all day had gone. He felt hungry and in need of relaxation. Arsenal were playing Fulham at three. There was just time to cook himself a late lunch before kick-off. And after that, he thought, he might go round to see Nina Lascelles. Tonight was not a night he fancied spending alone. Chapter 42 Matteo An odd toy Giuliano I To mock an ape with all Ben Johnson Every man in his humour. Robin arrived at work on Monday morning, feeling tired and vaguely battle-weary, but proud of herself. She and Matthew had spent most of the weekend discussing her job. In some ways, strange to think this after nine years together, it had been the deepest and most serious conversation that they had ever had. Why had she not admitted for so long that her secret interest in investigative work had long predated meeting Cormor and Strike? Matthew had seemed stunned when she had finally confessed to him that she had had an ambition to work in some form of criminal investigation since her early teens. I'd have thought it would have been the last thing, Matthew had mumbled, tailing off but referring obliquely, as Robin knew, to the reason she had dropped out of university. I just never knew how to say it to you, she told him. I thought you'd laugh. So it wasn't Cormor and making me stay or anything to do with him as a, as a person— she had been on the verge of saying, as a man, but saved herself just in time. It was me. It's what I want to do. I love it. And now he says he'll train me, Matt, and that's what I always wanted. The discussion had gone on all through Sunday, the disconcerted Matthew shifting slowly, like a boulder. How much weekend work? he had asked her suspiciously. I don't know. When it's needed, Matt, I love the job, don't you understand? I don't want to pretend any more. I just want to do it, and I'd like your support. In the end, he had put his arms around her and agreed. She had tried not to feel grateful that his mother had just died, making him, she could not help thinking, just a little more amenable to persuasion than he might usually have been. Robin had been looking forward to telling Strike about this mature development in her relationship, but he was not in the office when she arrived. Lying on the desk beside her tiny tinsel tree, was a short note in his distinctive, hard-to-read handwriting. No milk, gone out for breakfast, then to Hamley's, want to beat crowds. P.S. Know who killed Quine. Robin gasped. Seizing the phone, she called Strike's mobile, only to hear the engage signal. Hamley's would not open until ten, but Robin did not think she could bear to wait that long. Again and again she pressed redial while she opened and sorted the post, but Strike was still on the other call. She opened emails, the phone clamped to one ear. Half an hour passed, then an hour, and still the engaged tone emanated from Strike's number. She began to feel irritated, suspecting that it was a deliberate ploy to keep her in suspense. At half-past ten, a soft ping from the computer announced the arrival of an email from an unfamiliar sender called Claudia2 at live.com, who had sent nothing but an attachment labelled FYI. Robin clicked on it automatically still listening to the engaged tone. A large black-and-white picture swelled to fill her computer monitor. The backdrop was stark, an overcast sky and the exterior of an old stone building. Everyone in the picture was out of focus except the bride, who would turn to look directly at the camera. She was wearing a long, plain, slim-fitting white gown with a floor-length veil held in place by a thin diamond band. Her black hair was flying like the folds of tulle in what looked like a stiff breeze. One hand was clasped in that of a blurred figure in a morning suit, who appeared to be laughing, but her expression was unlike any bride's that Robin had ever seen. She looked broken, bereft, haunted, her eyes staring straight into Robin's, as though they alone were friends, as though Robin were the only one who might understand. Robin lowered the mobile she had been listening to, and stared at the picture. She had seen that extraordinarily beautiful face before. They had spoken once, on the telephone. Robin remembered a low, attractively husky voice. This was Charlotte, Strike's ex fiance the woman she had once seen running from this very building. She was so beautiful. Robin felt strangely humbled by the other woman's looks, 
and awed by her profound sadness. Sixteen years, on and off with Strike. Strike with his pube-like hair, his boxer's profile, and his half a leg. Not that those things mattered, Robin told herself, staring transfixed at this incomparably stunning, sad bride. The door opened. Strike was suddenly there beside her, two carrier bags of toys in his hands, and Robin, who had not heard him coming up the stairs, jumped as though she had been caught pilfering from the petty cash. Morning, he said. She reached hastily for the computer mouse, trying to close down the picture before he could see it, but her scramble to cover up what she was viewing drew his eyes irresistibly to the screen. Robin froze, shamefaced. She sent it a few minutes ago. I didn't know what it was when I opened it. Um, sorry. Strike stared at the picture for a few seconds, then turned away, setting the bags of toys down on the floor by her desk. Just delete it, he said. He sounded neither sad nor angry, but firm. Robin hesitated, then closed the file, deleted the email, and emptied the trash folder. Cheers, he said, straightening up, and by his manner informed her that there would be no discussion of Charlotte's wedding picture. I've got about thirty missed calls from you on my phone. Well, what do you expect? said Robin with spirit. Your note. You said— I had to take a call from my aunt, said Strike. An hour and ten minutes on the medical complaints of everyone in St. Moore's, all because I told her I'm going home for Christmas. He laughed at the sight of her barely contained frustration. All right, but we gotta be quick. I've just realized there's something we could do this morning before I meet Fancourt. Still wearing his coat, he sat down on the leather sofa and talked for ten solid minutes, laying his theory before her in detail. When he had finished, there was a long silence. The misty, mystical image of the boy angel in her local church floated into Robin's mind as she stared at Strike in near total disbelief. Which bits cause a new problems? asked Strike kindly. Uh, said Robin. We already agreed that Quine's disappearance might not have been spontaneous, right? Strike asked her. If you add together the mattress at Talgarth Road, convenient in a house that hasn't been used in twenty-five years, and the fact that a week before he vanished, Quine told that bloke in the bookshop he was going away and bought himself reading material, and the waitress in the river cafe saying Quine wasn't really angry when he was shouting at Tassel, that he was enjoying himself, I think we can hypothesize a staged disappearance. Okay, she said. This part of Strike's theory seemed the least outlandish to her. She did not know where to begin in telling him how implausible she found the rest of it, but the urge to pick holes made her say, Wouldn't he have told Leonora what he was planning, though? Of course not. She can't act to save her life. He wanted her worried, so she'd be convincing when she went round telling everybody he disappeared. Maybe she'd even involve the police, make a fuss with the publisher, start the panic. But that had never worked, said Robin. He was always flouncing off and nobody cared. Surely even he must have realized that he wasn't going to get massive publicity just for running away and hiding in his old house. Ah! But this time he was leaving behind him a book he thought was going to be the talk of literary London, wasn't he? He'd drawn as much attention to it as he could by rowing with his agent in the middle of a packed restaurant and making a public threat to self-publish. He goes home, stages the grand walk out in front of Leonora, and slips off to Talgarth Road. Later that evening he lets in his accomplice without a second thought, convinced that they're in it together. After a long pause, Robin said bravely, because she was not used to challenging Strike's conclusions, which she had never known to be wrong, but you haven't got a single piece of evidence that there was an accomplice, let alone, I mean, it's all opinion. He began to reiterate points he had already made, but she held up her hand to stop him. I heard all that the first time, but you're extrapolating from things people have said. There's no, no physical evidence at all. Of course there is, said Strike. Bombix Mori. That's not, it's the single biggest piece of evidence we've got. You're the one, said Robin, who's always telling me means an opportunity. You're the one who's always saying motive doesn't. I haven't said a word about motive, Strike reminded her. As it happens, I'm not sure what the motive was, although I've got a few ideas. And if you want more physical evidence, you can come and help me get it right now. She looked at him suspiciously. In all the time she had worked for him, he had never asked her to collect a physical clue. 
I want you to come and help me talk to Orlando Quine, he said, pushing himself back off the sofa. I don't want to do it on my own. She's, well, she's tricky. Doesn't like my hair. She's in Labrick Grove with a next-door neighbor, so we better get a move on. This is the daughter with learning difficulties, Robin asked, puzzled. Yeah, said Strike. She's got this monkey plush thing hangs around her neck. I've just seen a pile of them in Hamleys. They're really pajama cases. Cheeky monkeys, they call them. Robin was staring at him as though fearful for his sanity. When I met her, she had it round her neck, and she kept producing things out of nowhere. Pictures, crayons, and a card she sneaked off the kitchen table. I've just realized she was pulling it all out of the pajama case. She nicks things from people, Strike went on, and she was in and out of her father's study all the time when he was alive. He used to give her paper to draw on. You're hoping she's carrying around a clue to her father's killer inside her pajama case? No. Nope but I think there's reasonable chance that she picked up a bit of Bombix Mori while she was skulking around in Quine's office, or that he gave her the back of an early draft to draw on. I'm looking for scraps of paper with notes on them, a discarded couple of paragraphs, anything. Look, I know it's a long shot, said Strike, correctly reading her expression, but we can't get into Quine's study. The police have already been through everything in there and come up with nothing, and I'm betting the notebooks and drafts Quine took away with him have been destroyed. Cheeky Monkey's the last place I can think of to look, and, he checked his watch, we haven't got much time if we're going to Labbrook Grove and back before I meet Fancourt. Which reminds me. He left the office. Robin heard him heading upstairs and thought he must be going to his flat, but then the sounds of rummaging told her that he was searching the boxes of his possessions on the landing. When he returned, he was holding a box of latex gloves that he had clearly filched before leaving the SIB for good, and a clear plastic evidence bag of exactly the size that airlines provided to hold toiletries. There's another crucial bit of physical evidence I'd like to get, he said, taking out a pair of gloves and handing them to an uncomprehending Robin. I thought you could have a bash at getting hold of it while I'm with Fancourt this afternoon. In a few succinct words, he explained what he wanted her to get and why. Not altogether to strike surprise, a stunned silence followed his instructions. You're joking, said Robin faintly. I'm not. She raised one hand unconsciously to her mouth. It won't be dangerous, Strike reassured her. That's not what's worrying me. Cormoran, that's... that's horrific. You... are you really serious? If you'd seen Leonora Quine in Holloway last week, you wouldn't ask that, said Strike darkly. We're going to have to be bloody clever to get her out of there. Clever, thought Robin, still phased as she stood with the limp gloves dangling from her hand. His suggestions for the day's activities seem wild, bizarre, and in the case of the last, disgusting. Look, he said, suddenly serious, I don't know what to tell you except I can feel it. I can smell it, Robin. Someone deranged, bloody dangerous but efficient, lurking behind all this. They got that idiot Quine exactly where they wanted him by playing on his narcissism. And I'm not the only one who thinks so either. Strike threw Robin her coat, and she put it on. He was tucking evidence bags into his inside pocket. People kept telling me there was someone else involved. Chard says it was Waldegrave. Waldegrave says it's Tassel. Pippa Midgley's too stupid to interpret what's staring her in the face. And Christian Fisher, well, he's got more perspective not being in the book, said Strike. He put his finger on it without realizing it. Robin, who was struggling to keep up with Strike's thought processes, and skeptical of those parts she could understand, followed him down the metal staircase and out into the cold. This murder, said Strike, lighting a cigarette as they walked down Denmark Street together, was months, if not years, in the planning. Work a genius when you think about it, but it's over-elaborate and that's going to be its downfall. You can't plot a murder like a novel. There are always loose ends in real life. Strike could tell that he was not convincing Robin, but he was not worried. He had worked with disbelieving subordinates before. Together, they descended into the tube and onto a central line train. What did you get for your nephews? Robin asked after a long silence. Camouflage gear and fake guns, said Strike, whose choice had been entirely motivated by the desire to aggravate his brother-in-law. And I got Timothy Anstis a bloody big drum. They'll enjoy that at five o'clock on Christmas morning. 
In spite of her preoccupation, Robin snorted with laughter. The quiet row of houses from which Owen Quine had fled a month previously was, like the rest of London, covered in snow, pristine and pale on the roofs, and grubby grey underfoot. The happy Inuit smiled down from his pub sign, like the presiding deity of the wintry street, as they passed beneath him. A different policeman stood outside the Quine residence now, and a white van was parked at the curb with its doors open. Digging for guts in the garden, Strike muttered to Robin, as they drew nearer and spotted spades lying on the floor. They didn't have any luck at mucking marshes, and they're not going to have any luck in Leonora's flower beds either. So you say, replied Robin, sotto voce, a little intimidated by the staring policeman, who was quite handsome. So you're going to help me prove this afternoon, replied Strike under his breath. Morning, he called to the watchful constable, who did not respond. Strike seemed energized by his crazy theory, but if by any remote chance he was right, Robin thought, the killing had grotesque features even beyond that carved-out corpse. They headed up the front path of the house beside the quines, bringing them within feet of the watchful PC. Strike rang the bell, and after a short wait the door opened, revealing a short, anxious-looking woman in her early sixties who was wearing a housecoat and wool-trim slippers. Are you Edna? Strike asked. Yes, she said timidly, looking up at him. When Strike introduced himself and Robin, Edna's furrowed brow relaxed, to be replaced by a look of pathetic relief. Oh, it's you. I've heard all about you. You're helping Leonora. You're going to get her out, aren't you? Robin felt horribly aware of the handsome PC listening to all of it, feet away. Come in, come in said Edna, backing out of their way and beckoning them enthusiastically inside. Mrs. I'm sorry I don't know your surname, began Strike, wiping his feet on the doormat. Her house was warm, clean, and much cosier than the Quines, though identical in layout. Call me Edna, she said, beaming at him. Edna, thank you. You know, you ought to ask to see ID before you let anyone into your house. Oh, but said Edna, flustered. Leonora told me all about you. Strike insisted, nevertheless, on showing her his driving license before following her down the hall into a blue and white kitchen much brighter than Leonora's. She's upstairs, said Edna, when Strike explained that they had come to see Orlando. She's not having a good day. Do you want coffee? As she flitted around fetching cups, she talked non-stop in the pent-up fashion of the stressed and lonely. Don't get me wrong, I don't mind having a poor lamb, but... She looked hopelessly between Strike and Robin, then blurted out, But how long for? They've no family, you see. There was a social worker around yesterday checking on her. She said if I couldn't keep her, she'd have to go in a home or something. I said you can't do that to Orlando. They've never been apart, her and her mum. No, she can stay with me, but... Edna glanced at the ceiling. She's very unsettled just now, very upset. Just wants her mum to come home, and what can I say to her? I can't tell her the truth, can I? And there they are, next door, digging up the whole garden. They've gone and dug up Mr. Poop. Dead cat, Strike muttered under his breath to Robin, as tears bubbled behind Edna's spectacles and bounced down her round cheeks. Poor lamb, she said again. When she had given Strike and Robin their coffees, Edna went upstairs to fetch Orlando. It took ten minutes for her to persuade the girl to come downstairs, but Strike was glad to see Cheeky Monkey clutched in her arms when she appeared, today dressed in a grubby tracksuit and wearing a sullen expression. He's called like a giant, she announced to the kitchen at large when she saw Strike. I am, said Strike, nodding. Well remembered. Orlando slid into the chair that Edna pulled out for her, holding her orangutan tightly in her arms. I'm Robin, said Robin, smiling at her. Like a bird, said Orlando at once. Dodo's a bird. It's what her mum and dad called her, explained Edna. We're both birds, said Robin. Orlando gazed at her, then got up and walked out of the kitchen without speaking. Edna sighed deeply. She takes upset over everything. You never know what she's... But Orlando had returned with crayons and a spiral-bound drawing pad that Strike was sure had been bought by Edna to try to keep her happy. Orlando sat down at the kitchen table and smiled at Robin, a sweet, open smile that made Robin feel unaccountably sad. I'm going to draw you a Robin, she announced. I'd love that, 
said Robin. Orlando set to work with her tongue between her teeth. Robin said nothing, but watched the picture develop. Feeling that Robin had already forged a better rapport with Orlando than he had managed, Strike ate a chocolate biscuit offered by Edna and made small talk about the snow. Eventually, Orlando finished her picture, tore it out of the pad, and pushed it across to Robin. It's beautiful, said Robin, beaming at her. I wish I could draw a dodo, but I can't draw at all. This, Strike knew, was a lie. Robin drew very well. He had seen her doodles. I've got to give you something, though. She rummaged in her bag, watched eagerly by Orlando, and eventually pulled out a small round makeup mirror, decorated on the back with a stylized pink bird. There, said Robin. Look, that's a flamingo. Another bird. You can keep that. Orlando took a gift with parted lips, staring at it. Say thank you to the lady, prompted Edna. Thank you, said Orlando, and she slid the mirror inside the pajama case. Is he a bag? asked Robin, with bright interest. My monkey, said Orlando, clutching the orangutan closer. My daddy give him to me. My daddy died. I'm sorry to hear that, said Robin quietly, wishing that the image of Quine's body had not slid instantly into her mind, his torso as hollow as a pajama case. Strike surreptitiously checked his watch. The appointment with Fancourt was drawing ever closer. Robin sipped some coffee and asked, Do you keep things in your monkey? I like your hair, said Orlando. It's shiny and yellow. Thank you, said Robin. Have you got any other pictures in there? Orlando nodded. Can I have a biscuit? she asked Edna. Can I see your other pictures? Robin asked as Orlando munched. And after a brief pause for consideration, Orlando opened up her orangutan. A sheaf of crumpled pictures came out, on an assortment of different sized and coloured papers. Neither Strike nor Robin turned them over at first, but made admiring comments as Orlando spread them out across the table. Robin asking questions about the bright starfish and the dancing angels that Orlando had drawn in crayon and felt tip. Basking in their appreciation, Orlando dug deeper into her pyjama case for her working materials. Up came a used typewriter cartridge, oblong and grey, with a thin strip tape carrying the reversed words it had printed. Strike resisted the urge to palm it immediately as it disappeared beneath a tin of coloured pencils and a box of mints, but kept his eye on it as Orlando laid out a picture of a butterfly, through which could be seen traces of untidy adult writing on the back. Encouraged by Robin, Orlando now brought out more, a sheet of stickers, a postcard of the Mendip Hills, a round fridge magnet that read, Careful, you may end up in my novel. Last of all, she showed them three images on better quality paper, two proof book illustrations, and a mocked-up book cover. My daddy gave me them from his work, Orlando said. Daniel Char touched me when I wanted it, she said, pointing at a brightly coloured picture that Strike recognised, Kyla the kangaroo, who loved to bounce. Orlando had added a hat and handbag to Kyla, and coloured in the line drawing of a princess talking to a frog with neon felt tips. Delighted to see Orlando so chatty, Edna made more coffee. Conscious of the time, but aware of the need not to provoke a row and a protective grab of all her treasures, Robin and Strike chatted as they picked up and examined each of the pieces of paper on the table. Whenever she thought something might be helpful, Robin slid it sideways to Strike. There was a list of scribbled names on the back of the butterfly picture. Sam Breville, Eddie Boyne, Edward Baskinville, Stephen Brook. The postcard of the Mendip Hills had been sent in July and carried a brief message. Weather great, hotel disappointing, hope the book's going well, V. Kiss kiss. Other than that, there was no trace of handwriting. A few of Orlando's pictures were familiar to Strike from his last visit. One had been drawn on the reverse of a child's restaurant menu another on the Quine's gas bill. Well, we better head off, said Strike, draining his coffee cup with a decent show of regret. Almost absent-mindedly, he continued to hold the cover image for Dorcas Pengelly's Upon the Wicked Rocks. A bedraggled woman lay supine on the stony sands of a steep cliff-enclosed cove, with the shadow of a man falling across her midriff. Orlando had drawn thickly lined black fish in the seething blue water. The used typewriter cassette lay beneath the image, nudged there by Strike. I don't want you to go, Orlando told Robin, suddenly tense and tearful. It's been lovely, hasn't it? 
said Robin. I'm sure we'll see each other again. You'll keep your flamingo mirror, won't you? And I've got my Robin picture. But Orlando had begun to wail and stamp. She did not want another goodbye. Under cover of the escalating furore, Strike wrapped the typewriter cassette smoothly in the cover illustration for Upon the Wicked Rocks and slid it into his pocket, unmarked by his fingerprints. They reached the street five minutes later, Robin, a little shaken, because Orlando had wailed and tried to grab her as she headed down the hall. Edna had had to physically restrain Orlando from following them. Poor girl, said Robin under her breath, so that the staring PC could not hear them. Oh, God, that was dreadful. Useful, though, said Strike. You got that typewriter ribbon? Yep, said Strike, glancing over his shoulder to check that the PC was out of sight before taking out the cassette, still wrapped in Dorcas's cover, and tipping it into a plastic evidence bag. And a bit more than that. You did, said Robin, surprised. Possible lead, said Strike. Might be nothing. He glanced again at his watch and sped up, wincing as his knee throbbed in protest. I'm going to have to get a move on if I'm not going to be late for Fancourt. As they sat on the crowded tube train carrying them back to central London twenty minutes later, Strike said, You're clear about what you're doing this afternoon. Completely clear, said Robin, but with a note of reservation. I know it's not a fun job. That's not what's bothering me. And like I say, it shouldn't be dangerous, he said, preparing to stand as they approached Tottenham Court Road. But something made him reconsider a slight frown between his heavy eyebrows. Your hair, he said. What's wrong with it? said Robin, raising her hand self-consciously. It's memorable, said Strike. Haven't got a hat, have you? I, I could buy one, said Robin, feeling oddly flustered. Charge it to petty cash, he told her. Can't hurt to be careful. Chapter 43 Hoy day! What a sweep of vanity comes this way! William Shakespeare, Timon of Athens Strike walked up crowded Oxford Street, past snatches of canned carols and seasonal pop songs, and turned left into the quieter, narrower Dean Street. There were no shops here, just block-like buildings packed together with their different faces, white, red, and dun, opening into offices, bars, pubs, or bistro-type restaurants. Strike paused to allow boxes of wine to pass from delivery van to catering entrance. Christmas was a more subtle affair here in Soho, where the arts world, the advertisers and publishers congregated, and nowhere more so than at the Groucho Club. A grey building, almost nondescript, with its black-framed windows and small topiaries, sitting behind plain convex balustrades. Its cachet lay not in its exterior, but in the fact that relatively few were allowed within the members-only club for the creative arts. Strike limped over the threshold, and found himself in a small hall area, where a girl behind a counter said pleasantly, Can I help you? I'm here to meet Michael Fancourt. Oh yes, you're Mr. Strick. That's me, said Strike. He was directed through a long bar room with leather seats, packed with lunchtime drinkers, and up the stairs. As he climbed, Strike reflected, not for the first time, that his special investigation branch training had not envisaged him conducting interviews without official sanction or authority on a suspect's own territory, where his interviewee had the right to terminate the encounter without reason or apology. The SIB required its officers to organize their questioning in a template of people, places, things. Strike never lost sight of the effective, rigorous methodology, but these days it was essential to disguise the fact that he was filing facts in mental boxes. Different techniques were required when interviewing those who thought they were doing you a favor. He saw his quarry immediately he stepped into a second wooden-floored bar, where sofas in primary colors were set along the wall beneath paintings by modern artists. Fancourt was sitting slantwise on a bright red couch, one arm along its back, a leg a little raised in an exaggerated pose of ease. A Damien Hurst spot painting hung right behind his over-large head, like a neon halo. The writer had a thick thatch of graying dark hair. His features were heavy, and the lines beside his generous mouth deep. He smiled as Strike approached. It was not, perhaps, the smile he would have given someone he considered an equal. Impossible not to think in those terms, given the studied affectation of ease, the habitually sour expression, but a gesture to one whom he wished to be gracious. Mr. Strike. Perhaps he considered standing up to shake hands, 
but Strike's height and bulk often dissuaded smaller men from leaving their seats. They shook hands across the small wooden table, unwillingly, but left with no choice unless he wanted to sit on the sofa with Fancourt, a far too cosy situation, particularly with the author's arm lying along the back of it. Strike sat down on a solid round puff that was unsuited both to his size and his sore knee. Beside them was a shaven-headed ex-soap star who had recently played a soldier in a BBC drama. He was talking loudly about himself to two other men. Fancourt and Strike ordered drinks, but declined menus. Strike was relieved that Fancourt was not hungry. He could not afford to buy anyone else lunch. How long have you been a member of this place? he asked Fancourt, when the waiter had left. Since it opened. I was an early investor, said Fancourt. Only club I've ever needed. I stay overnight here if I need to. There are rooms upstairs. Fancourt fixed Strike with a consciously intense stare. I've been looking forward to meeting you. The hero of my next novel is a veteran of the so-called War on Terror and its military corollaries. I'd like to pick your brains once we've got Owen Quine out of the way. Strike happened to know a little about the tools available to the famous when they wished to manipulate. Lucy's guitarist father, Rick, was less famous than either Strike's father or Fancourt, but still celebrated enough to cause a middle-aged woman to gasp and tremble at the sight of him queuing for ice creams in St. Moore's. Oh, my God, what are you doing here? Rick had once confided in the adolescent Strike that the one sure way to get a woman into bed was to tell her you were writing a song about her. Michael Fancourt's pronouncement that he was interested in capturing something of Strike in his next novel felt like a variation on the same theme. He had clearly not appreciated that seeing himself in print was neither a novelty to Strike nor something he had ever chased. With an unenthusiastic nod to acknowledge Fancourt's request, Strike took out a notebook. Do you mind if I use this? Helps me remember what I want to ask you. Feel free, said Fancourt, looking amused. He tossed aside the copy of The Guardian that he had been reading. Strike saw the picture of a wizened but distinguished-looking old man who was vaguely familiar, even upside down. The caption read, Pinkleman at Ninety. Dear old Pinks, said Fancourt, noticing the direction of Strike's gaze. We're giving him a little party at the Chelsea Arts Club next week. Yeah, said Strike, hunting for a pen. He knew my uncle. They did their national service together, said Fancourt. When I wrote my first novel, Bellafront, I was fresh out of Oxford. My poor old unk, trying to be helpful, sent a copy to Pinkleman, who was the only writer he'd ever met. He spoke in measured phrases, as though some invisible third party were taking down every word in shorthand. The story sounded pre-rehearsed, as though he had told it many times, and perhaps he had. He was an oft-interviewed man. Pinkleman, at that time author of the seminal Bunty's Big Adventure series, didn't understand a word I'd written, Fancourt went on. But to please my uncle, he forwarded it to Chard Books, where it landed, most fortuitously, on the desk of the only person in the place who could understand it. Stroke of luck said Strike. The waiter returned with wine for Fancourt and a glass of water for Strike. So, said the detective, were you returning a favour when you introduced Pinkleman to your agent? I was, said Fancourt, and his nod held the hint of patronage of a teacher glad to note that one of his pupils had been paying attention. In those days, Pink's was with some agent who kept forgetting to hand on his royalties. Whatever you say about Elizabeth Tassel, she's honest. In business terms, she's honest, Fancourt amended, sipping his wine. She'll be at Pinkleman's party too, won't she? said Strike, watching Fancourt for his reaction. She still represents him, doesn't she? It doesn't matter to me if Liz is there. Does she imagine that I'm still burning with malice towards her? asked Fancourt, with his sour smile. I don't think I give Liz Tassel a thought from one year's end to the next. Why did she refuse to ditch Quine when you asked her to? asked Strike. Strike did not see why he should not deploy the direct attack to a man who had announced an ulterior motive for meeting within seconds of their first encounter. It was never a question of me asking her to drop Quine, said Fancourt, still in measured cadences for the benefit of that invisible amanuensis. I explained that I could not remain at her agency while he was there. 
and left. I see, said Stripe, who was well used to the splitting of hairs. Why do you think she let you leave? You were the bigger fish, weren't you? I think it's fair to say that I was a barracuda compared to Quine Stickleback, said Fancourt with a smirk. But, you see, Liz and Quine were sleeping together. Really? I didn't know that, said Stripe, clicking out the nib of his pen. Liz arrived at Oxford, said Fancourt. This strapping great girl who'd been helping her father castrate bulls and the like on sundry northern farms, desperate to get laid, and nobody fancied the job much. She had a thing for me, a very big thing. We were tutorial partners, juicy Jacobean intrigue calculated to get a girl going, but I never felt altruistic enough to relieve her of her virginity. We remained friends, said Fancourt, and when she started her agency I introduced her to Quine, who notoriously preferred to plumb the bottom of the barrel, sexually speaking. The inevitable occurred. Very interesting, said Strike. Is this common knowledge? I doubt it, said Fancourt. Quine was already married to his, well, his murderess. I suppose we have to call her now, don't we? he said thoughtfully. I'd imagine murderess trumps wife when defining a close relationship, and Liz would have threatened him with dire consequences if he'd been his usual indiscreet self about her bed romantics on the wild off chance that I might yet be persuaded to sleep with her. Was this blind vanity, Strike wondered, a matter of fact, or a mixture of both? She used to look at me with those big cow eyes, waiting, hoping, said Fancourt, a cruel twist to his mouth. After Ellie died, she realized that I wasn't going to oblige her even when grief-stricken. I'd imagine she was unable to bear the thought of decades of future celibacy, so she stood by her man. Did you ever speak to Quine again after you left the agency? Strike asked. For the first few years after Ellie died, he'd scuttle out of any bar I entered, said Fancourt. Eventually, he got brave enough to remain in the same restaurant, throwing me nervous looks. No, I don't think we spoke to each other ever again, said Fancourt, as though the matter were of little interest. You were injured in Afghanistan, I think. Yeah, said Strike. It might work on women, Strike reflected, the calculated intensity of the gaze. Perhaps Owen Quine had fixed Catherine Kent and Pippa Midgley with the identical hungry vampiric stare when he told them he would be putting them into Bombix Mori, and they had been thrilled to think of part of themselves, their lives, forever encased in the amber of a writer's prose. How did it happen? asked Fancourt, his eyes on Strike's legs. I.E.D., said Strike. What about Talgarth Road? You and Quine were co-owners of the house. Didn't you ever need to communicate about the place? Did you ever run into each other there? Never. Haven't you been there to check on it? You've owned it, what, twenty, twenty-five years, something like that, said Fancourt indifferently. No, I haven't been inside since Joe died. I suppose the police have asked you about the woman who thinks she saw you outside on the 8th of November. Yes, said Fancourt shortly. She was mistaken. Beside them, the actor was still in full and loud flow. Thought I bloody had it. Couldn't see where the fuck I was supposed to be running. Sand in my bloody eyes. So you haven't been in the house since 86? No, said Fancourt impatiently. Neither Owen nor I wanted it in the first place. Why not? Because our friend Joe died there in exceptionally squalid circumstances. He hated hospitals, refused medication. By the time he fell unconscious, the place was in a disgusting state, and he, who had been the living embodiment of Apollo, was reduced to a sack of bones, his skin. It was a grisly end, said Fancourt, made worse by Daniel Ch— Fancourt's expression hardened. He made an odd chewing motion as though literally eating unspoken words. Strike waited. He's an interesting man, Dan Chard, said Fancourt with a palpable effort at reversing out of the cul-de-sac into which he'd driven himself. I thought Owen's treatment of him in Bombix Mori was the biggest missed opportunity of all, though future scholars are hardly going to look to Bombix Mori for subtlety of characterization, are they? <laughs> he added with a short laugh. 
How would you have written Daniel Chard? Strike asked, and Fancourt seemed surprised by the question. After a moment's consideration, he said, Dan's the most unfulfilled man I've ever met. He works in a field where he's competent but unhappy. He craves the bodies of young men, but can bring himself to do no more than draw them. He's full of inhibitions and self-disgust, which explains his unwise and hysterical response to Owen's caricature of him. Dan was dominated by a monstrous socialite mother who wanted her pathologically shy son to take over the family business. I think, said Fancourt, I'd have been able to make something interesting of all that. Why did Char turn down North Book? Strike asked. Fancourt made the chewing motion again, then said, I like Daniel Chard, you know. I had the impression that there had been a grudge at some point, said Strike. What gave you that idea? You said that you certainly didn't expect to find yourself back at Ropa Chard when you spoke at their anniversary party. You were there, said Fancourt sharply, and when Strike nodded, he said, Why? I was looking for coin, said Strike. His wife had hired me to find him. But as we know now, she knew exactly where he was. No, said Strike. I don't think she did. You genuinely believe that? asked Fancourt. His large head tilted to one side. Yeah, I do, said Strike. Fancourt raised his eyebrows, considering Strike intently, as though he were a curiosity in a cabinet. So you didn't hold it against Chard that he turned down Norse book? Strike asked, returning to the main point. After a brief pause, Fancourt said, Well, yes, I did hold it against him. Exactly why Dan changed his mind about publishing it, only Dan could tell you. But I think it was because there was a smattering of press around Joe's condition, drumming up Middle England disgust about the unrepentant book he was about to publish, and Dan, who had not realized that Joe now had full-blown AIDS, panicked. He didn't want it to be associated with bathhouses and AIDS, so he told Joe he didn't want the book after all. It was an act of great cowardice, and Owen and I— Another pause. How long had it been since Fancourt had bracketed himself and Quine together in Amity? Owen and I believed that it killed Joe. He could hardly hold a pen. He was virtually blind. But he was trying desperately to finish the book before he died. We felt that was all that was keeping him alive. Then, Chard's letter arrived, cancelling their contract. Joe stopped work, and within forty-eight hours he was dead. There are similarities, said Strike, with what happened to your first wife. They weren't the same thing at all, said Fancourt flatly. Why not? Joe's was an infinitely better book. Yet another pause, this time much longer. That's considering the matter, said Fancourt, from a purely literary perspective. Naturally, there are other ways of looking at it. He finished his glass of wine and raised a hand to indicate to the barman that he wanted another. The actor beside them, who had barely drawn breath, was still talking. Said, screw authenticity. What do you want me to do? Saw me own bloody arm off? It must have been a very difficult time for you, said Strike. Yes, said Fancourt waspishly. Yes, I think we can call it difficult. You lost a good friend and a wife within, what, months of each other? A few months, yes. You were writing all through that time. Yes, said Fancourt, with an angry, condescending laugh. I was writing all through that time. It's my profession. Would anyone ask you whether you were still in the army while you were having private difficulties? I doubt it, said Strike, without rancor. What were you writing? It was never published. I abandoned the book I was working on so that I could finish Joe's. The waiter set a second glass in front of Fancourt and departed. Did North's book need much doing to it? Hardly anything, said Fancourt. He was a brilliant writer. I tidied up a few rough bits and polished the ending. He'd left notes about how he wanted it done. Then I took it to Jerry Waldegrave, who was with Roper. Strike remembered what Chart had said about Fancourt's over-closeness to Waldegrave's wife, and proceeded with some caution. Had you worked with Waldegrave before? I've never worked with him on my own stuff. 
but I knew of him by reputation as a gifted editor, and I knew that he'd like Joe. We collaborated on Towards the Mark. He did a good job on it, did he? Fancourt's flash of bad temper had gone. If anything, he looked entertained by Strike's line of questioning. Yes, he said, taking a sip of wine. Very good. But you didn't want to work with him now you've moved to rope a chart. Not particularly, said Fancourt, still smiling. He drinks a lot these days. Why do you think Quine put Waldegrave in Bombix Mori? How can I possibly know that? Waldegrave seems to have been good to Quine. It's hard to see why Quine felt the need to attack him. Is it? asked Fancourt. I strike closely. Everyone I talk to seems to have a different angle on the Cutter character in Bombix Mori. Really? Most people seem outraged that Quine attacked Waldegrave at all. They can't see what Waldegrave did to deserve it. Daniel Chard thinks the Cutter shows that Quine had a collaborator, said Strike. Who the hell does he think would have collaborated with Quine on Bombix Mori? <laughs> asked Fancourt, with a short laugh. He's got ideas, said Strike. Meanwhile, Waldegrave thinks the cutter's really an attack on you. But I'm vainglorious, said Fancourt with a smile. Everyone knows that. Why would Waldegrave think that the cutter is about you? You'll need to ask Jerry Waldegrave, said Fancourt, still smiling. But I've got a funny feeling you think you know, Mr. Strike. And I'll tell you this. Quine was quite, quite wrong, as he really should have known. On pass. So in all these years, you've never managed to sell Talgarth Road. It's been very difficult to find a buyer who satisfies the terms of Joe's will. It was a quixotic gesture of Joe's. He was a romantic, an idealist. I set down my feelings about all of this. The legacy, the burden, the poignancy of his bequest in House of Hollow, said Fancourt, much like a lecturer recommending additional reading. Owen had his say. Such as it was, added Fancourt, with the ghost of a smirk, in the Balzac Brothers. The Balzac Brothers was about the house in Talgarth Road, was it? asked Strike, who had not gleaned that impression during the fifty pages he had read. It was set there. Really, it's about our relationship. The three of us, said Fancourt. Joe dead in the corner, and Owen and I trying to follow in his footsteps, making sense of his death. It was set in the studio where, I think, from what I've read, you found Quine's body. Strike said nothing, but continued to take notes. The critic Harvey Bird called the Balzac brothers wincingly, jaw-droppingly, sphincter-clenchingly awful. I just remember a lot of fiddling with balls, said Strike. And Fancourt gave a sudden, unforced, girlish titter. <laughs> You've read it, have you? <laughs> oh, yes. Owen was obsessed with his balls. The actor beside them had paused for breath at last. Fancourt's words rang in a temporary silence. Strike grinned as the actor and his two dining companions stared at Fancourt, who treated them to his sour smile. The three men began talking hurriedly again. He had a real E-day fix, said Fancourt, turning back to Strike. Picasso-esque, you know. His testicles the source of his creative power. He was obsessed in both his life and his work with machismo, virility, fertility. Some might say it was an odd fixation for a man who liked to be tied up and dominated, but I see it as a natural consequence, the yin and yang of Quine's sexual persona. You'll have noticed the names he gave us in the book. Vas and Varicacil, said Strike, and he noted again that slight surprise in Fancourt that a man who looked like Strike read books or paid attention to their contents. Vass, Quine, the duck that carries sperm from balls to penis, the healthy, potent, creative force. Varicocele, a painful enlargement of a vein in the testicle, sometimes leading to infertility. A typically crass Quine-esque allusion to the fact that I contracted mumps shortly after Joe died, and in fact was too unwell to go to the funeral but also to the fact that, as you've pointed out, I was writing under difficult circumstances around that time. You were still friends at this point, Strike clarified. When he started the book, we were still, in theory, friends, said Fancourt with a grim smile. 
But writers are a savage breed, Mr. Strike. If you want lifelong friendship and selfless camaraderie, join the army and learn to kill. If you want a lifetime of temporary alliances with peers who will glory in your every failure, write novels. Strike smiled. Fancourt said with detached pleasure, The Balzac brothers receive some of the worst reviews I've ever read. Did you review it? No, said Fancourt. You were married to your first wife at this point, Strike asked. That's right, said Fancourt. The flicker of his expression was like the shiver of an animal's flank when a fly touches it. I'm just trying to get the chronology right. You lost her shortly after North died. Euphemisms for death are so interesting, aren't they? said Fancourt lightly. I didn't lose her. On the contrary. I tripped over her in the dark, dead in our kitchen with her head in the oven. I'm sorry, said Strike formally. Yes, well. Fancourt called for another drink. Strike could tell that a delicate point had been reached, where a flow of information might either be tapped or run forever dry. Did you ever talk to Quine about the parody that caused your wife's suicide? I've already told you. I never talked to him again about anything after Ellie died, said Fancourt calmly. So, no. You were sure he wrote it, though? Without question. Like a lot of writers without much to say, Quine was actually a good literary mimic. I remember him spoofing some of Joe's stuff, and it was quite funny. He wasn't going to jeer publicly at Joe, of course. It did him too much good hanging around with the pair of us. Did anyone admit to seeing the parody before publication? Nobody said as much to me, but it would have been surprising if they had, wouldn't it, given what it caused? Liz Tassel denied to my face that Owen had shown it to her, but I heard on the grapevine that she'd read it pre-publication. I'm sure she encouraged him to publish. Liz was insanely jealous of Ellie. There was a pause. Then Fancourt said with an assumption of lightness, Hard to remember these days that there was a time when you had to wait for the ink and paper reviews to see your work excoriated. With the invention of the Internet, any subliterate cretin can be Michiko Kakutani. Quine always denied writing it, didn't he? Strike asked. Yes, he did. Gutless bastard that he was, said Fancourt, apparently unconscious of any lack of taste. Like a lot of soi disant mavericks, Quine was an envious, terminally competitive creature who craved adulation. He was terrified that he was going to be ostracized after Ellie died. Of course, said Fancourt with unmistakable pleasure, it happened anyway. Owen had benefited from a lot of reflected glory, being part of a triumvirate with Joe and me. When Joe died and I cut him adrift, he was seen for what he was, a man with a dirty imagination and an interesting style who had barely an idea that wasn't pornographic. Some authors, said Fancourt, have only one good book in them. That was Owen. He shot his bolt, an expression he would have approved of, with Hobart sin. Everything after that was pointless rehashes. Didn't you say you thought Bombix Mori was... A maniac's masterpiece. You read that, did you? said Fancourt, with vaguely flattered surprise. Well, so it is, a true literary curiosity. I never denied that Owen could write, you know. It was just that he was never able to dredge up anything profound or interesting to write about. It's a surprisingly common phenomenon. But with Bombix Mori, he found his subject at last, didn't he? Everybody hates me. Everyone's against me. I'm a genius, and nobody can see it. The result is grotesque and comic. It reeks of bitterness and self-pity, but it has an undeniable fascination. And the language, said Fancourt, with the most enthusiasm he had so far brought to the discussion, is admirable. Some passages are among the best things he ever wrote. This is all very useful, said Strike. Fancourt seemed amused. How? I've got a feeling that Bombix Morris central to this case. Case? repeated Fancourt, smiling. There was a short pause. Are you seriously telling me 
that you still think the killer of Owen Quine is at large? Yeah, I think so, said Strike. Then, said Fancourt, smiling still more broadly, wouldn't it be more useful to analyse the writings of the killer rather than the victim? Maybe, said Strike, but we don't know whether the killer writes. Oh, nearly everyone does these days, said Fancourt. The whole world's writing novels, but nobody's reading them. I'm sure people would read Bombix Mori, especially if you did an introduction, said Strike. I think you're right, said Fancourt, smiling more broadly. When exactly did you read the book for the first time? It would have been... Let me see. Fancourt appeared to do a mental calculation. Not until the, uh, middle of the week after Quine delivered it, said Fancourt. Dan Chard called me, told me that Quine was trying to suggest that I had written the parody of Ellie's book, and tried to persuade me to join him in legal action against Quine. I refused. Did Chard read any of it out to you? No, said Fancourt, smiling again, frightened he might lose his star acquisition, you see. No, he simply outlined the allegation that Quine had made and offered me the services of his lawyers. When was this telephone call? On the evening of the 7th, it must have been, said Fancourt. The Sunday night, the same day you filmed an interview about your new novel, said Strike. You're very well informed, said Fancourt, his eyes narrowing. I watched the program. You know, said Fancourt, with a needle prick of malice, you don't have the appearance of a man who enjoys arts programs. I never said I enjoyed them, said Strike, and was unsurprised to note that Fancourt appeared to enjoy his retort. But I did notice that you misspoke when you said your first wife's name on camera. Fancourt said nothing but merely watched Strike over his wine glass. You said F, then corrected yourself and said Ellie, said Strike. Well, as you say, I misspoke. It can happen to the most articulate of us. In Bombix Mori, your late wife is called Effigy. Which is a coincidence, said Strike. Obviously, said Fancourt, because you couldn't yet have known that Quine had called her Effigy on the 7th. Obviously not. Quine's mistress got a copy of the manuscript fed through her letterbox right after he disappeared, said Strike. You didn't get sent an early copy by any chance. The ensuing pause became overlong. Strike felt the fragile thread that he had managed to spin between them snap. It did not matter. He had saved this question for last. No, said Fancourt. I didn't. He pulled out his wallet. His declared intention of picking Strike's brains for a character in his next novel seemed, not at all to Strike's regret, forgotten. Strike pulled out some cash, but Fancourt held up a hand and said, with unmistakable offensiveness, No, no, allow me. Your press coverage makes much of the fact that you have known better times. In fact, it puts me in mind of Ben Johnson. I am a poor gentleman, a soldier one that, in the better state of my fortunes, scorned so mean a refuge. Really, said Strike pleasantly, returning his cash to his pocket, I'm put more in mind of Sicina subrepsti me, aqua intestina pererens, a miseru eripuisti omnia nostra bona, eripuisti ehu nostre crudella venenum vitae. Ehu nostre pestis amicitiae. He looked unsmilingly upon Fancourt's astonishment. The writer rallied quickly. Ovid? Catullus, said Strike, heaving himself off the low puff with the aid of the table. Translates roughly. So that's how you crept up on me, an acid eating away my guts, stole from me everything I most treasure. Yes, alas, stole. Grim poison in my blood, the plague, alas of the friendship we once had. Well, I expect we'll see each other around, said Strike pleasantly. He limped off towards the stairs, Fancourt's eyes upon his back. Chapter 44 All his allies and friends rush into troops like raging torrents. Thomas Decker, the noble Spanish soldier. Strike sat for a long time on the sofa in his kitchen sitting room that night. 
barely hearing the rumble of the traffic on Charing Cross Road and the occasional muffled shouts of more early Christmas partygoers. He had removed his prosthesis. It was comfortable sitting there in his boxes, the end of his injured leg free of pressure, the throbbing of his knee deadened by another double dose of painkillers. Unfinished pasta congealed on the plate beside him on the sofa. The sky beyond his small window achieved the dark blue velvet depth of true night, and Strike did not move, though wide awake. It felt like a very long time since he had seen the picture of Charlotte in her wedding dress. He had not given her another thought all day. Was this the start of true healing? She had married Jago Ross, and he was alone, mulling the complexities of an elaborate murder in the dim light of his chilly attic flat. Perhaps each of them was, at last, where they really belonged. On the table in front of him, in the clear plastic evidence bag, still half-wrapped in the photocopied cover of Upon the Wicked Rocks, sat the dark grey typewriter cassette that he had taken from Orlando. He had been staring at it for what seemed like half an hour at least, feeling like a child on Christmas morning confronted by a mysterious, inviting package, the largest under the tree. And yet he ought not to look or touch, lest he interfere with whatever forensic evidence might be gleaned from the tape. Any suspicion of tampering, he checked his watch. He had promised himself not to make the call until half-past nine. There were children to be wrestled into bed, a wife to placate after another long day on the job. Strike wanted time to explain fully. But his patience had limits. Getting up with some difficulty, he took the keys to his office and moved laboriously downstairs, clutching the handrail, hopping and occasionally sitting down. Ten minutes later, he re-entered his flat and returned to the still warm spot on the sofa, carrying his penknife and wearing another pair of the latex gloves he had earlier given to Robin. He lifted the typewriter tape and the crumpled cover illustration gingerly out of the evidence bag and set the cassette, still resting on the paper, on the rickety formica top table. Barely breathing, he pulled out the toothpick attachment from his knife and inserted it delicately behind the two inches of fragile tape that were exposed. By dint of careful manipulation, he managed to pull out a little more. Reversed words were revealed, the letters back to front. Y-O-B, space, E-I-D-D-E, space, W-E-N-K, space, I, space, T-H-G-U-O-H-T, space, D-A-H, space, I, space, D-N. His sudden rush of adrenaline was expressed only in Strike's quiet sigh of satisfaction. He deftly tightened the tape again, using the knife screwdriver attachment in the cog at the top of the cassette, the hole untouched by his hands, then, still wearing the latex gloves, slipped it back into the evidence bag. He checked his watch again. Unable to wait any longer, he picked up his mobile and called Dave Polworth. Bad time? he asked, when his old friend answered. No? said Polworth, sounding curious. What's up, Diddy? Need a favour, chum. A big one. The engineer, over a hundred miles away in his sitting room in Bristol, listened without interrupting while the detective explained what it was he wanted done. When finally he had finished, there was a pause. I know it's a big ask, Strike said, listening anxiously to the line crackling. Dunno if it'll even be possible in this weather. Course it will, said Polworth. I'd have to see when I could do it, though, did he? Got two days off coming up. Not sure Penny's gonna be keen. Yeah, I thought that might be a problem, said Strike. I know it'd be dangerous. Don't insult me, I've done worse than this, said Polworth. Nah, she wanted me to take her in her mother Christmas shopping. But fuck it, did he? Did you say this is life or death? Close, said Strike, closing his eyes and grinning. Life and liberty. And no Christmas shopping, boy, which suits old chum. Consider it done, and I'll give you a ring if I've got anything, all right? Stay safe, mate. Piss off. Strike dropped the mobile beside him on the sofa and rubbed his face in his hands, still grinning. He might just have told Polworth to do something even crazier and more pointless than grabbing a passing shark, but Polworth was a man who enjoyed danger, and the time had come for desperate measures. The last thing Strike did before turning out the light was to reread the notes of his conversation with Fancourt and to underline, so heavily that he sliced through the page, the word Cutter. Chapter 45 Didst thou not mark the jest of the silkworm? John Webster, The White Devil 
both the family home and Talgarth Road, continued to be combed for forensic evidence. Leonora remained in Holloway. It had become a waiting game. Strike was used to standing for hours in the cold, watching darkened windows, following faceless strangers, to unanswered phones and doors, blank faces, clueless bystanders, to enforced, frustrating inaction. What was different and distracting on this occasion was the small whine of anxiety that formed a backdrop to everything he did. You had to maintain a distance, but they were always people who got to you, injustices that bit. Leonora in prison, white-faced and weeping, her daughter confused, vulnerable, and bereft of both parents. Robin had pinned up Orlando's picture over her desk, so that a merry red-bellied bird gazed down upon the detective and his assistant as they busied themselves with other cases, reminding them that a curly-haired girl in Ladbrook Grove was still waiting for her mother to come home. Robin at least had a meaningful job to do, although she felt that she was letting Strike down. She had returned to the office two days running, with nothing to show for her efforts, her evidence bag empty. The detective had warned her to err on the side of caution, to bail at the least sign that she might have been noticed or remembered. He did not like to be explicit about how recognizable he thought her, even with her red-gold hair piled under a beanie hat. She was very good-looking. I'm not sure I need to be quite so cautious, she said, having followed his instructions to the letter. Let's remember what we're dealing with here, Robin, he snapped, anxiety continuing to whine in his gut. Quine didn't rip out his own guts. Some of his fears were strangely amorphous. Naturally, he worried that the killer would yet escape, that there were great gaping holes in the fragile cobweb of a case he was building, a case that just now was built largely out of his own reconstructive imaginings, that needed physical evidence to anchor it down, lest the police and defence council blew it clean away, that he had other worries. Much as he had disliked the mystic bob tag with which Anstis had saddled him, Strike had a sense of approaching danger now, almost as strongly as when he had known, without question, that the Viking was about to blow up around him. Intuition, they called it, but Strike knew it to be the reading of subtle signs, the subconscious joining of dots. A clear picture of the killer was emerging out of the mass of disconnected evidence, and the image was stark and terrifying. A case of obsession, of violent rage, of a calculating, brilliant, but profoundly disturbed mind. The longer he hung around, refusing to let go, the closer he circled, the more targeted his questioning, the greater the chance that the killer might wake up to the threat he posed. Strike had confidence in his own ability to detect and repel attack, but he could not contemplate with equanimity the solutions that might occur to a diseased mind that had shown itself fond of Byzantine cruelty. The days of Polwarth's leave came and went without tangible results. Don't give up now, did he? he told Strike over the phone. Characteristically, the fruitlessness of his endeavours seemed to have stimulated rather than discouraged Polworth. I'm going to pull a sickie Monday. I'll have another bash. I can't ask you to do that, muttered Strike, frustrated. The drive. I'm offering, you ungrateful peg-legged bastard. Penny'll kill you. What about her Christmas shopping? What about my chance to show up the mat? said Polworth, who disliked the capital and its inhabitants on long-held principle. You're a mate, chum, said Strike. When he had hung up, he saw Robin's grin. Was funny. Chum, she said. It sounded so public school, so unlike Strike. It's not what you think, said Strike. He was halfway through the story of Dave Polworth and the shark when his mobile rang again, an unknown number. He picked up. Is that Cameron, uh, Strike? Speaking. It's Jude Graham here, Kath Kent's neighbour. She's back said the female voice happily. That's good news, said Strike, with a thumbs up to Robin. Yeah, she got back this morning. Got a friend staying with her. I asked her where she'd been, but she wouldn't say, said the neighbour. Strike remembered that Jude Graham thought him a journalist. Is the friend male or female? Female, she answered regretfully. Tall, skinny, dark girl. She's always hanging around calf. That's very helpful, Mrs Graham, said Strike. I'll uh, put something through your door later for your trouble. Great, said the neighbour happily. Cheers, she rang off. Cass Kent's back at home, Strike told Robin. Sounds like she's got Pippa Midgley staying with her. Oh, said Robin, trying not to smile. 
I uh, suppose you're regretting you put her in a headlock now. Strike grinned ruefully. They're not going to talk to me, he said. No, Robin agreed. I don't think they will. Suits them fine, Leonora in the clink. If you told them your whole theory, they might cooperate, suggested Robin. Strike stroked his chin, looking at Robin without seeing her. I can't, he said finally. If it leaks out that I'm sniffing up that tree, I'll be lucky not to get a knife in the back one dark night. Are you serious? Robin, said Strike, mildly exasperated. Quine was tied up and disemboweled. He sat down on the arm of the sofa, which squeaked less than the cushions, but groaned under his weight, and said, Pippa Midgley liked you. I'll do it, said Robin at once. Not alone, he said. But maybe you could get me in. How about this evening? Of course, she said, elated. Hadn't she and Matthew established new rules? This was the first time she had tested him, but she went to the telephone with confidence. His reaction when she told him that she did not know when she would be home that night could not have been called enthusiastic, but he accepted the news without demur. So at seven o'clock that evening, having discussed at length the tactics that they were about to employ, Strike and Robin proceeded separately through the icy night, ten minutes apart with Robin in the lead, the Stafford Cripps house. A gang of youths stood again in the concrete forecourt of the block, and they did not permit Robin to pass with the wary respect they had accorded Strike two weeks previously. One of them danced backwards ahead of her as she approached the inner stairs, inviting her to party, telling her she was beautiful, laughing derisively at her silence, while his mates jeered behind her in the darkness, discussing her rear view. As they entered the concrete stairwell, her taunter's jeers echoed strangely. She thought he might be seventeen at most. I need to go upstairs, she said firmly, as he slouched across the stairwell for his mate's amusement, but sweat had trickled on her scalp. He's a kid, she told herself, and strikes right behind you. The thought gave her courage. Get out of the way, please, she said. He hesitated, dropped a sneering comment about her figure, and moved. She half expected him to grab her as she passed, but he loped back to his mates, all of them calling filthy names after her as she climbed the stairs and emerged with relief, without being followed, onto the balcony leading to Kath Kent's flat. The lights inside were on. Robin paused for a second, gathering herself, then rang the doorbell. After some seconds the door opened a cautious six inches, and there stood a middle-aged woman with a long tangle of red hair. Catherine? Yeah, said the woman suspiciously. I've got some very important information for you, said Robin. You need to hear this. Don't say, I need to talk to you, Strike had coached her, or I've got some questions. You frame it so that it sounds like it's to her advantage. Get as far as you can without telling her who you are. Make it sound urgent. Make her worry she's going to miss something if she lets you go. You want to be inside before she can think it through. Use her name. Make a personal connection. Keep talking. What? demanded Catherine Kent. Can I come in? asked Robin. It's very cold out here. Who are you? You need to hear this, Catherine. Who? Kath, said someone behind her. Are you a journalist? I'm a friend, Robin improvised, her toes over the threshold. I want to help you, Catherine. Hey! A familiar, long, pale face and large brown eyes appeared beside Kath's. It's her I told you about, said Pippa. She works with him. Pippa, said Robin making eye contact with the tall girl. You know I'm on your side. There's something I need to tell you both. It's urgent. Her foot was two-thirds of the way across the threshold. Robin put every ounce of earnest persuasiveness that she could muster into her expression as she looked into Pippa's panicked eyes. Pippa, I wouldn't have come if I didn't think it was really important. Let her in, Pippa told Catherine. She sounded silly. The hall was cramped and seemed full of hanging coats. Catherine led Robin into a small, lamp-lit sitting room with plain magnolia painted walls. Brown curtains hung at the windows, the fabric so thin that the lights of buildings opposite and distant, passing cars, shone through them. A slightly grubby orange throw covered the old sofa, which sat on a rug patterned with swirling abstract shapes, and the remains of a Chinese takeaway sat on a cheap pine coffee table. In the corner, was a rickety computer table bearing a laptop. The two women, Robin saw, with a pang of something like remorse, 
I'd been decorating a small, fake Christmas tree together. A string of lights lay on the floor, and there were a number of decorations on the only armchair. One of them was a china disc reading, Future Famous Writer. What you want? demanded Catherine Kent. Her arms folded. She was glaring at Robin through small, fierce eyes. May I sit down? said Robin. And she did so without waiting for Catherine's answer. Make yourself at home as much as you can without being rude. Make it harder for her to dislodge you, Stryker said. What do you want? Catherine kept repeating. Pippa stood in front of the windows, staring at Robin, who saw that she was fiddling with a tree ornament. A mouse dressed as Santa. You know that Leonora Quine's being arrested for murder, said Robin. Of course I do. I'm the one, Catherine pointed at her own ample chest, who found the visa bill with the ropes, the burka and the overalls on it. Yes, said Robin. I know that. Ropes and the burka, ejaculated Catherine Kent. Got more than he bargained for, didn't he? All those years thinking she was just some dowdy little, boring little, little cow. And look what she did to him. Yes, said Robin. I know it looks that way. What do you mean? Looks that... Catherine, I've come here to warn you. They don't think she did it. No specifics. Don't mention the police explicitly if you can avoid it. Don't commit to a checkable story. Keep it vague, Stryker told her. What do you mean? Repeated Catherine sharply. The police don't... And you had access to his card. More opportunities to copy it. Catherine looked wildly from Robin to Pippa, who was clutching the Santa Mouse, white-faced. But Stryke doesn't think you did, said Robin. Who? said Catherine. She appeared too confused, too panicked to think straight. Her boss, stage whispered Pippa. Him, said Catherine, rounding on Robin again. He's working for Leonora. He doesn't think you did it, repeated Robin. Even with the credit card bill. The fact you even had it. I mean, it looks odd, but he's sure you had it by accident. She gave it me, said Catherine Kent, flinging out her arms, gesticulating furiously. His daughter, she gave it me. I never even looked on the back for weeks, never thought to. I was being nice, taking her crappy bloody picture and acting like it was good. I was being nice. I understand that, said Robin. We believe you, Catherine, I promise. Strike wants to find the real killer. He's not like the police. Insinuate, don't stay. He's not interested in just grabbing the next woman Quine might have, you know. The words, let tie him up, hung in the air, unspoken. Pippa was easier to read than Catherine. Credulous and easily panicked, she looked at Catherine, who seemed furious. Maybe I don't care who killed him, Catherine snarled through clenched teeth. But you surely don't want to be arrested. I've only got your word for it, they're interested in me. There's been nothing on the news. Well, there wouldn't be, would there? Said Robin gently. The police don't hold press conferences to announce that they think they might have the wrong person. Who had the credit card? Huh. Quine usually had it himself, said Robin. And his wife's not the only person who had access. How do you know what the police are thinking any more than I do? Strike's got good contact in there, said Robin Quine. He was in Afghanistan with the investigating officer, Richard Anson's. The name of the man who had interrogated her seemed to carry weight with Catherine. She glanced at Pippa again. Why are you telling me this? Catherine demanded. Because we don't want to see another innocent woman arrested, said Pippa. Because we think the police are wasting time sniffing around the wrong people, and because throw in a bit of self-interest when she played the problem. It keeps things plausible. Obviously, said Ron, in the show of all of us. It would do Cormoran a lot of good if he was the one who the real guy. Again, she added. Yeah, said Catherine, nodding vehemently. That's it, isn't it? He wants the publicity. No woman who had been with Owen Quine for two years was going to believe that publicity was an unqualified thing. Look, we just wanted to warn you how they're thinking, said Robin, and to ask the other. But obviously, if you don't want... Robin made the stand. Once you've laid it out for her, act like you can take it or leave it. You're there when she starts chasing you. I've told the police everything I know, said Catherine, who appeared disconcerted now that Robin, who was taller than her, had stood up again. I haven't got anything else to say. Well, we're not sure they were asking the right questions, said Robin, sinking back onto the sofa. You're a writer, she said, turning suddenly off the piece that Stryker prepared for her, her eyes on the laptop in the corner. You noticed this. 
You understood him, and his work better than anyone else. The unexpected swerve into flattery caused whatever words of fury Catherine had been about to fling at Robin, her mouth had been open ready to deliver them, to die in her throat. So, Catherine said, her aggression felt a little fake now. What do you want to know? Will you let Strike come and hear what you've got to say? He won't if you don't want him to, Robin assured her. An offer unsanctioned by her boss. He respects your right to refuse. Strike had made no such declaration. But he'd like to hear it in your own words. I don't know that I've got anything useful to say, said Catherine, folding her arms again. But she could not disguise a ring of gratified vanity. I know it's a big ask, said Robin. But if you help us get the real killer, Catherine, you'll be in the papers for the right reasons. The promise of it settled gently over the sitting room. Catherine interviewed by eager and now admiring journalists, asking about her work, perhaps. Tell me about Melina's sacrifice. Catherine glanced sideways at Pippa, who said, That bastard kidnapped me! You tried to attack him, Pip, said Catherine. She turned a little anxiously to Robin. I never told her to do that. She was. After we saw what he'd written in the book, we were both. We thought he, your boss, had been hired to fit us up. I understand, lied Robin who found the reasoning torturous and paranoid, but perhaps that was what spending time with Owen Quine did to a person. She got carried away and didn't think, said Catherine, with a look of mingled affection and reproof at her protégé. Pip's got temper issues. Understandable, said Robin hypocritically. May I call Cormoran? Strike, I mean. Ask him to meet us here. She had already slipped her mobile out of her pocket and glanced down at it. Strike had texted her. On balcony. Bloody freezing. She texted back, wait five. In fact, she needed only three minutes. Softened by Robin's earnestness and air of understanding, and by the encouragement of the alarm Pippa to let strike in and find out the worst, when he finally knocked, Catherine proceeded to the front door with something close to alacrity. The room seemed much smaller with his arrival. Next to Catherine, strike appeared huge and almost unnecessarily male. When she had swept it clear of Christmas ornaments, he dwarfed the only armchair. Pippa retreated to the end of the sofa and perched on the arm, throwing strike looks composed of defiance and terror. Do you want a drink of something? Catherine threw at strike in his heavy overcoat, with his size fourteen feet planted squarely on her swirly rug. Cup of tea would be great, he said. She left for the tiny kitchen. Finding herself alone with strike and Robin, Pippa panicked and scuttled after her. You've done bloody well, strike muttered to Robin if they're offering tea. She's very proud of being a writer, Robin breathed back, which means she could understand him in ways that other people. But Pippa had returned with a box of cheap biscuits, and Strike and Robin fell silent at once. Pippa resumed her seat at the end of the sofa, casting Strike frightened sidelong glances that had, as when she had cowered in their office, a whiff of theatrical enjoyment about them. This is very good of you, Catherine, said Strike when she had set a tray of tea on the table. One of the mugs Robin saw read, Keep clam and proofread. We'll see, retorted Kent, her arms folded, as she glared at him from a height. Kath, sit, coaxed Pippa. And Catherine sat reluctantly down between Pippa and Robin on the sofa. Strike's first priority was to nurse the tenuous trust that Robin had managed to foster. The direct attack had no place here. He therefore embarked on a speech echoing Robin's, implying that the authorities were having second thoughts about Leonora's arrest, and that they were reviewing the current evidence, avoiding direct mention of the police, yet implying with every word that the Met was now turning its attention to Catherine Kent. As he spoke, a siren echoed in the distance. Strike added assurances that he personally felt sure that Kent was completely in the clear, but that he saw her as a resource the police had failed to understand or utilize properly. Yeah, well, you could be right there she said. She had not so much blossomed under his soothing words as unclenched. Picking up the keep clam mug, she said with a show of disdain, all they wanted to know about was our sex life. The way Anstis had told it, Strike remembered, Catherine had volunteered a lot of information on the subject without being put under undue pressure. I'm not interested in your sex life, said Strike. It's obvious he wasn't, to be blunt, getting what he wanted at home. He hadn't slept with her in years, said Catherine. Remembering the photographs in Leonora's bedroom of Quine tied up, Robin dropped her gaze to the surface of her tea. They had nothing in common, 
He couldn't talk to her about his work. She wasn't interested. Didn't give a damn. He told us, didn't he? She looked up at Pippa, perched on the arm of the sofa beside her. She never even read his books properly. He wanted someone to connect to on that level. He could really talk to me about literature. And me, said Pippa, launching at once into a speech. He was interested in identity politics, you know, and he talked to me for hours about what it was like for me being born, basically, in the wrong— Yeah! He told me it was a relief to be able to talk to someone who actually understood his work, said Catherine loudly, drowning Pippa out. I thought so, said Strike, nodding. And the police didn't bother asking you about any of this, I take it. Well, they asked where we met and I told them, on his creative writing course, said Catherine. It was just gradual, you know. He was interested in my writing. In our writing, said Pippa quietly. Catherine talked at length, Strike nodding with every appearance of interest at the gradual progression of the teacher-student relationship to something much warmer, Pippa tagging along, it seemed, and leaving Quine and Catherine only at the bedroom door. I write fantasy with a twist, said Catherine, and Strike was surprised and a little amused that she had begun to talk like Fancourt, in rehearsed phrases, in sound bites. He wondered fleetingly how many people who sat alone for hours as they scribbled their stories practiced talking about their work during their coffee breaks, and he remembered what Waldegrave had told him about Quine, that he had freely admitted to role-playing interviews with a biro. It's fantasy slash erotica, really, but quite literary. And that's the thing about traditional publishing, you know. They don't want to take a chance on something that hasn't been seen before. It's all about what fits their sales categories. And if you're blending several genres, if you're creating something entirely new, they're afraid to take a chance. I know that Liz Tassel, Catherine spoke the name as though it were a medical complaint, told Owen my work was too niche. But that's the great thing about indie publishing, the freedom. Yeah, said Pippa, clearly desperate to put in her two pennies worth. That's true. For genre fiction, I think indie can be the way to go. Except I'm not really genre, said Catherine, with a slight frown. That's my point. But Owen felt that for my memoir I'd do better going the traditional route, said Pippa. You know, he had a real interest in gender identity, and he was fascinated with what I'd been through. I introduced him to a couple of other transgendered people, and he promised to talk to his editor about me, because he thought with the right promotion, you know, and with a story that's never really been told, Owen loved Melina's sacrifice. He couldn't wait to read on. He was practically ripping it out of my hand every time I finished a chapter, said Catherine loudly. And he told me... She stopped abruptly in mid-flow. Pippa's evident irritation at being interrupted faded ludicrously from her face. Both of them, Robin could tell, had suddenly remembered that all the time Quine had been showering them with effusive encouragement, interest and praise, the characters of Harpy and Epicene had been taking obscene shape on an old electric typewriter, hidden from their eager gazes. So he talked to you about his own work? Strike asked. A bit said Catherine Kent in a flat voice. How long was he working on Bombix Mori, do you know? Most of the time I knew him, she said. What did he say about it? There was a pause. Catherine and Pippa looked at each other. I've already told him, Pippa told Catherine, with a significant glance at Strike, that he told us it was going to be different. Yeah, said Catherine heavily. She folded her arms. He didn't tell us it was going to be like that. Like that. Strike remembered the brown, glutinous substance that had leaked from Harpy's breasts. It had been for him one of the most revolting images in the book. Catherine's sister, he remembered, had died of breast cancer. Did he say what it was going to be like? Strike asked. He lied, said Catherine simply. He said it was going to be the writer's journey or something, but he made out. He told us we were going to be beautiful, lost souls, said Pippa on whom the phrase seemed to have impressed itself. Yeah, said Catherine heavily. Did he ever read any of it to you, Catherine? No, she said. He said he wanted it to be a... a... Oh, Kath, said Pippa tragically. Catherine had buried her face in her hands. Here, said Robin kindly, delving into her handbag for tissues. No, said Catherine roughly, pushing herself off the sofa and disappearing into the kitchen. She came back with a handful of kitchen roll. He said, she repeated, he wanted it to be a surprise. That bastard, she said, sitting back down. Bastard! She dabbed at her eyes and shook her head, the long mane of red hair swaying, while Pippa rubbed her back. Pippa told me, said Strike, 
That coin put a copy of the manuscript through your door. Yeah, said Catherine. It was clear that Pippa had already confessed to this indiscretion. Jude next door saw him doing it. She's a nosy bitch. Always keeping tabs on me. Strike, who had just put an additional twenty through the nosy neighbor's letterbox, as a thank you for keeping him informed of Catherine's movements, asked, When? Early hours of the sixth, said Catherine. Strike could almost feel Robin's tension and excitement. Were the lights outside your front door working then? Them? They've been out for months. Did she speak to Quine? No, just peered out the window. It was two in the morning or something. She wasn't going to go outside in her nighty. But she'd seen him come and go loads of times. She knew what he looked like, said Catherine on a sob, in his stupid cloak and hat. Pippa said there was a note, said Strike. Yeah, payback time for both of us, said Catherine. Have you still got it? I burned it, said Catherine. Was it addressed to you, dear Catherine? No, she said. Just a message and a bloody kiss. Bastard, she sobbed. Shall I go and get us some real drink? Volunteered Robin, surprisingly. There's some in the kitchen, said Catherine, her reply muffled by application of the kitchen roll to her mouth and cheeks. Pip, you get it. You were sure the note was from him? Asked Strike, as Pippa sped off in pursuit of alcohol. Yeah, it was his handwriting. I'd know it anywhere, said Catherine. What did you understand by it? I don't know, said Catherine weakly, wiping her overflowing eyes. Payback for me because he had a go at his wife, and payback for him on everyone, even me. Gutless bastard, she said, unconsciously echoing Michael Fancourt. He could have told me he didn't want, if he wanted to end it. Why do that? Why? And it wasn't just me. Pip, making out he cared, talking to her about her life. She's had an awful time. I mean, her memoir's not great literature or anything, but... Pippa returned, carrying clinking glasses and a bottle of brandy, and Catherine fell silent. We were saving this for the Christmas pudding, said Pippa, deftly uncorking the cognac. There you go, Kath. Catherine took a large brandy and swigged it down in one. It seemed to have the desired effect. With a sniff, she straightened her back. Robin accepted a small measure. Strike declined. When did you read the manuscript? he asked Catherine, who was already helping herself to more brandy. Same day I found it, on the ninth, when I got home to grab some more clothes. I'd been staying with Angela at the hospice, see. He hadn't picked up any of my calls since bonfire night, not one, and I told him Angela was really bad. I'd left messages. Then I came home and found the manuscript all over the floor. I thought, is that why he's not picking up? He wants me to read this first. I took it back to the hospice with me and read it there, while I was sitting by Angela. Robin could only imagine how it would have felt to read her lover's depiction of her while she sat beside her dying sister's bed. I called Pip, didn't I? said Catherine. Pippa nodded. And told her what he'd done. I kept calling him, but he still wouldn't pick up. Well, after Angela had died, I thought, screw it, I'm coming to find you. The brandy had given colour to Catherine's wan cheeks. I went to their house, but when I saw her, his wife, I could tell she was telling the truth. He wasn't there. So I told her to tell him Angela was dead. He met Angela, said Catherine, her face crumpling again. Pippa set down her own glass and put her arms around Catherine's shaking shoulders. I thought he'd realise at least what he'd done to me when I was losing, when I'd lost. For over a minute, there were no sounds in the room but Catherine's sobs and the distant yells of the youths in the courtyard below. I'm sorry, said Strike formally. It must have been awful for you, said Robin. A fragile sense of comradeship bound the four of them now. They could agree on one thing at least, that Owen Quine had behaved very badly. It's your powers of textual analysis I'm really here for, Strike told Catherine, when she had again dried her eyes, now swollen to slits in her face. What do you mean? she asked. But Robin heard gratified pride behind the curtness. I don't understand some of what Quine wrote in Bombix Mori. It is not, she said. And again she unknowingly echoed Fancourt. It won't win prizes for subtlety, will it? I don't know, said Strike. There is one very intriguing character. Vainglorious, she said. Naturally he thought she would jump to that conclusion. Fancourt was famous. I was thinking of the cutter. I don't want to talk about that, she said. With a sharpness that took Robin aback, Catherine glanced at Pippa, and Robin recognized the mutual glow, poorly disguised of a shared secret. 
He pretended to be better than that, said Catherine. He pretended that there were some things that were sacred. Then he went and— Nobody seems to want to interpret the cutter for me, said Strike. That's because some of us have some decency, said Catherine. Strike caught Robin's eye. He was urging her to take over. Jerry Waldergraves already told Cormoran that he's the cutter, she said tentatively. I like Jerry Waldergrave, said Catherine defiantly. You met him? asked Robin. Owen took me to a party Christmas before last, she said. Waldergrave was there. Sweet man. He had a few, she said. Drink him even then, was he? interjected Strike. It was a mistake. He had encouraged Robin to take over because he guessed that she seemed less frightening. His interruption made Catherine clam up. Anyone else interesting at the party? Robin asked, sipping her brandy. Michael Fancourt was there, said Catherine at once. People say he's arrogant, but I thought he was charming. Oh, did you speak to him? Owen wanted me to stay well away, she said. But I went to the ladies, and on the way back I just told him how much I'd loved House of Hollow. Owen wouldn't have liked that, she said, with pathetic satisfaction. Always going on about Fancourt being overrated but I think he's marvellous. Anyway, we talked for a while, and then someone pulled him away, but yes, she repeated defiantly, as though the shade of Owen Quine were in the room and could hear her praising his rival. He was charming to me. Wish me luck with my writing, she said, sipping her brandy. Did you tell him you were Owen's girlfriend? asked Robin. Yes, said Catherine, with a twist to her smile, and he laughed and said, You have my commiserations. He didn't bother him. He didn't care about Owen any more, I could tell. No, I think he's a nice man and a marvellous writer. People are envious, aren't they, when you're successful? She poured herself more brandy. She was holding it remarkably well. Other than the flush it had brought to her face, there was no sign of tipsiness at all. And you like Jerry Waldegrave, said Robin, almost absent-mindedly. Oh, he's lovely, said Catherine, on a roll now, praising anyone that Quine might have attacked. Lovely man. He was very, very drunk, though. He was in a side room and people were steering clear, you know. That bitch Tassel told us to leave him to it, that he was talking gibberish. Why do you call her a bitch? asked Robin. Snobby old cow, said Catherine. Way she spoke to me, to everyone. But I know what it was. She was upset because Michael Fancourt was there. I said to her, Owen had gone off to see if Jerry was all right. He wasn't going to leave him passed out in a chair, whatever that old bitch said. I told her, I've just been talking to Fancourt. He was charming. She didn't like that, said Catherine with satisfaction. Didn't like the idea of him being charming to me when he hates her. Owen told me she used to be in love with Fancourt, and he wouldn't give her the time of day. She relished the gossip, however old. For that night, at least, she had been an insider. She left soon after I told her that, said Catherine with satisfaction. Horrible woman. Michael Fancourt told me, said Strike, and the eyes of Catherine and Pippa were instantly riveted on him eager to hear what the famous writer might have said, that Owen Quine and Elizabeth Tassel once had an affair. One moment of stupefied silence, and then Catherine Kent burst out laughing. It was unquestionably genuine. Raucous, almost joyful shrieks filled the room. Owen and Elizabeth Tassel! That's what he said. Pippa beamed at the sight and sound of Catherine Kent's exuberant, unexpected mirth. She rolled against the back of the sofa, trying to catch her breath. Brandy slopped onto her trousers as she shook with what seemed entirely genuine amusement. Pippa caught the hysteria from her and began to laugh, too. Never, panted Catherine, in a million years. This would have been a long time ago, said Strike, but her long red mane shook as she continued to roar with unfeigned laughter. Oh, and Liz, never, never, ever. You don't understand, she said, now dabbing at eyes wet with mirth. He thought she was awful. He would have told me. Owen talked about everyone he'd slept with. He wasn't a gentleman like that, was he, Pip? I'd have known if they'd ever. I don't know where Michael Fancourt got that from. Never, said Catherine Kent, with unforced merriment and total conviction. The laughter had loosened her up. But you don't know what the cutter really meant, Robin asked her, setting her empty brandy glass down on the pine coffee table with the finality of a guest about to take their leave. I never said I didn't know, said Catherine, still out of breath from her protracted laughter. 
I do know. It was just awful to do it to Jerry. Such a bloody hypocrite. Owen tells me not to mention it to anyone, and then he goes and puts it in Bombix Mori. Robin did not need Strike's look to tell her to remain silent, and let Catherine's brandy-fueled good humour, her enjoyment of their undivided attention, and the reflected glory of knowing sensitive secrets about literary figures, do their work. All right, she said. All right, here it is. Owen told me as we were leaving. Jerry was very drunk that night, and you know his marriage is on the rocks, has been for years. He and Fenella had had a really terrible row the night before the party, and she told him that their daughter might not be his. That she might be... Strike knew what was coming. Fan courts, said Catherine, after a suitable dramatic pause. The dwarf with the big head, the baby she thought of aborting because she didn't know whose it was. Do you see? The cutter with his cuckold's horns. And Owen told me to keep my mouth shut. It's not funny, he said. Jerry loves his daughter. Only good thing he's got in his life. But he talked about it all the way home. On and on about Fancourt and how much he'd hate finding out he had a daughter because Fancourt never wanted kids. All that bullshit about protecting Jerry. Anything to get at Michael Fancourt. Anything. Chapter 46. Leander strived. The waves about him wound and pulled him to the bottom where the ground was strewed with pearl. Christopher Marlowe. Hero and Leander. Grateful for the effect of cheap brandy, and to Robin's particular combination of clear-headedness and warmth, Strike parted from her with many thanks half an hour later. Robin travelled home to Matthew in a glow of gratification and excitement, looking more kindly on Strike's theory as to the killer of Owen Quine than she had done before. This was partly because nothing that Catherine Kent had said had contradicted it, but mainly because she felt particularly warm towards her boss, after the shared interrogation. Strike returned to his attic rooms in a less elevated frame of mind. He had drunk nothing but tea, and believed more strongly than ever in his theory, but all the proof he could offer was a single typewriter cassette. It would not be enough to overturn the police case against Leonora. There were hard frosts overnight on Saturday and Sunday, but during the daytime glimmers of sunshine pierced the cloud blanket. Rain turned some of the accumulated snow in the gutters to sliding slush. Strike brooded alone between his rooms and his office, ignoring a call from Nina Lascelles and turning down an invitation to dinner at Nick and Ilse's, pleading paperwork, but actually preferring solitude without pressure to discuss the Quine case. He knew that he was acting as though he were held to a professional standard that had ceased to apply when he had left the special investigation branch. Though legally free to gossip to whomever he pleased about his suspicions, he continued to treat them as confidential. This was partly long-standing habit, but mainly because, much as others might jeer, he took extremely seriously the possibility that the killer might hear what he was thinking and doing. In Strike's opinion, the safest way of ensuring that secret information did not leak was not to tell anybody about it. On Monday... He was visited again by the boss and boyfriend of the faithless Miss Brocklehurst, whose masochism now extended to a wish to know whether she had, as he strongly suspected, a third lover hidden away somewhere. Strike listened, with half his mind on the activities of Dave Polworth, who was starting to feel like his last hope. Robin's endeavours remained fruitless, in spite of the hours she was spending pursuing the evidence he had asked her to find. At half-past six that evening, as he sat in his flat watching the forecast, which predicted a return of Arctic weather by the end of the week, his phone rang. Guess what, did he? said Polworth down a crackling line. You're kidding me, said Strike, his chest suddenly tight with anticipation. Got the lot, mate. Holy shit, breathed Strike. It had been his own theory, but he felt as astonished as if Polworth had done it all unaided. Bagged up here, waiting for you. I'll send someone for it first thing tomorrow. And I'm going to go home and have a nice hot bath, said Polworth. Chum, you're a bloody... I know I am. We'll talk about my credit later. I'm fucking freezing, Daddy. I'm going home. Strike called Robin with the news. Her relation matched his own. Right, tomorrow, she said, full of determination. Tomorrow I'm going to get it. I'm going to make sure. Don't go getting careless. Strike talked over her. It's not a competition. He barely slept that night. Robin made no appearance at the office until one in the afternoon, but the instant he heard the glass door bang and heard her calling him, he knew. 
You haven't. Yes, she said breathlessly. She thought he was going to hug her, which would be crossing a line he had never even approached before. But the lunge she had thought might be meant for her was really for the mobile on his desk. I'm calling Anstis. We've done it, Robin. Cormoran, I think, Robin started to say, but he did not hear her. He had hurried back into his office and closed the door behind him. Robin lowered herself into her computer chair, feeling uneasy. Strike's muffled voice rose and fell beyond the door. She got up restlessly to visit the bathroom, where she washed her hands and stared into the cracked and spotted mirror over the sink, observing the inconveniently bright gold of her hair. Returning to the office, she sat down, could not settle to anything, noticed that she had not switched on her tiny tinsel Christmas tree, did so, and waited, absent-mindedly biting her thumbnail, something she had not done for years. Twenty minutes later, his jaw set, and his expression ugly, Strike emerged from the office. Stupid fucking dickhead, were his first words. No, gasped Robin. He's having none of it, said Strike, too wound up to sit, but limping up and down the enclosed space. He's had that bloody rag in the lockup and analysed it, and it's got Quine's blood on it. Big effing deal. Could have cut himself months ago. He's so in love with his own effing theory. Did you say to him, if he just gets a warrant? Dickhead! roared Strike, punching the metal filing cabinet so that it reverberated and Robin jumped. But he can't deny. Once forensics are done, that's the bleeding point, Robin, he said, rounding on her. Unless he searches before he gets forensics done, there might be nothing there to find. But did you tell him about the typewriter? If the simple fact that it's there doesn't hit the prick between the eyes. She ventured no more suggestions, but watched him walk up and down, brow furrowed, too intimidated to tell him now what was worrying her. Fuck it, growled Strike on his sixth walk back to her desk. Shock and awe. No choice. How? he muttered, pulling out his mobile again. And Nick. Who's Nick? asked Robin, desperately trying to keep up. He's married to Leonora's lawyer, said Strike, punching buttons on his phone. Old mate. He's a gastroenterologist. He retreated again to his office and slammed the door. For want of anything else to do, Robin filled the kettle, her heart hammering, and made them both tea. The mugs cooled untouched while she waited. When Strike emerged fifteen minutes later, he seemed calmer. All right, he said seizing his tea and taking a gulp. I've got a plan and I'm gonna need you. Are you up for it? Of course, said Robin. He gave her a concise outline of what he wanted to do. It was ambitious and would require a healthy dose of luck. Well, Strike asked her finally. No problem, said Robin. We might not need you. No, said Robin. On the other hand, you could be key. Yes, said Robin. Sure that's all right, Strike asked watching her closely. No problem at all, said Robin. I want to do it, I really do. It's just... She hesitated. I think he... What? said Strike sharply. I think I'd better have a practice, said Robin. Oh, said Strike, eyeing her. Yeah, fair enough. Got until Thursday, I think. I'll check the date now. He disappeared for the third time into his inner office. Robin returned to her computer chair. She desperately wanted to play her part in the capture of Owen Quine's killer, but what she had been about to say, before Strike's sharp response panicked her out of it, was, I think he might have seen me. Chapter 47 <laughs> Thou entanglest thyself in thine own work like a silkworm. John Webster, The White Devil By the light of the old-fashioned street lamp, the cartoonish murals covering the front of the Chelsea Arts Club were strangely eerie. Circus freaks had been painted on the rainbow-stippled walls of a long, low line of ordinary white houses knocked into one. A four-legged blonde girl, an elephant eating its keeper, an etiolated contortionist in prison stripes, whose head appeared to be disappearing up his own anus. The club stood in a leafy, sleepy, and genteel street, quiet with the snow that had returned with a vengeance, falling fast and mounting over roofs and pavements as though the brief respite in the Arctic winter had never been. All through Thursday, the blizzard had grown thicker, and now, viewed through a rippling lamplit curtain of icy flakes, the old club in its fresh pastel colours appeared strangely insubstantial, pasteboard scenery, a trompe l'oeil marquee. 
Strike was standing in a shadowy alley off Old Church Street, watching as one by one they arrived for their small party. He saw the aged Pinkleman help from his taxi by a stone-faced Jerry Waldergrave, while Daniel Chard stood in a fur hat on his crutches, nodding and smiling an awkward welcome. Elizabeth Tassel drew up alone in a cab, fumbling for her fare and shivering in the cold. Lastly, in a car with a driver, came Michael Fancourt. He took his time getting out of the car, straightening his coat, before proceeding up the steps to the front door. The detective, on whose dense curly hair the snow was falling thickly, pulled out his mobile and rang his half-brother. Hey, said Al, who sounded excited. They're all in the dining room. How many? About a dozen of them. Coming in now. Strike limped across the street with the aid of his stick. They let him in at once when he gave his name and explained that he was here as Duncan Gilfeder's guest. Al and Gilfeder, a celebrity photographer whom Strike was meeting for the first time, stood a short way inside the entrance. Gilfeder seemed confused as to who Strike was, or why he, a member of this eccentric and charming club, had been asked by his acquaintance Al to invite a guest whom he did not know. My brother, said Al, introducing them. He sounded proud. Oh, said Gilfeder blankly. He wore the same type of glasses as Christian Fisher, and his lank hair was cut in a straggly shoulder-length bob. I thought your brother was younger. That's Eddie, said Al. This is Cormoran, ex-army. He's a detective now. Oh, said Gilfeder, looking even more bemused. Thanks for this, Strike said, addressing both men equally. Get you another drink? The club was so noisy and packed, it was hard to see much of it, except glimpses of squashy sofas and a crackling log fire. The walls of the low-ceilinged bar were liberally covered in prints, paintings, and photographs. It had the feeling of a country house, cosy and a little scruffy. As the tallest man in the room, Strike could see over the crowd's heads towards the windows at the rear of the club. Beyond lay a large garden lit by exterior lights, so that it was illuminated in patches. A thick, pristine layer of snow, pure and smooth as royal icing, lay over verdant shrubbery and the stone sculptures lurking in the undergrowth. Strike reached the bar and ordered wine for his companions, glancing as he did so into the dining room. Those eating filled several long wooden tables. There was the Roper Chard party, with a pair of French windows beside them, the garden icy white and ghostly behind the glass. A dozen people, some of whom Strike did not recognize, had gathered to honor the ninety-year-old Pinkleman, who was sitting at the head of the table. Whoever had been in charge of the placement, Strike saw, had sat Elizabeth Tassel and Michael Fancourt well apart. Fancourt was talking loudly into Pinkleman's ear, charred opposite him. Elizabeth Tassel was sitting next to Jerry Waldegrave. Neither was speaking to the other. Strike passed glasses of wine to Alan Gilfeder, then returned to the bar to fetch a whiskey for himself, deliberately maintaining a clear view of the Roper Chard party. Why? said a voice, clear as a bell, but somewhere below him. Are you here? Nina Lascelles was standing at his elbow, in the same strappy black dress she had worn to his birthday dinner. No trace of her former giggly flirtatiousness remained. She looked accusatory. Hi, said Strike, surprised. I didn't expect to see you here. Nor I you, she said. He had not returned any of her calls for over a week, not since the night he had slept with her to rid himself of thoughts of Charlotte on her wedding day. So, you know Pinkleman, said Strike, trying for small talk in the face of what he could tell was animosity. I'm taking over some of Jerry's authors now he's leaving. Pink's is one of them. Congratulations, said Strike. Still, she did not smile. Waldegrave still came to the party, though. Pink's is fond of Jerry. Why? she repeated. Are you here? Doing what I was hired to do, said Strike, trying to find out who killed Owen Quine. She rolled her eyes, clearly feeling that he was pushing his persistence past a joke. How did you get in here? It's members only. I've got a contact, said Strike. You didn't think of using me again, then? she asked. He did not much like the reflection of himself he saw in her large, mouse-like eyes. There was no denying that he had used her repeatedly. It had become cheap, shameful, and she deserved better. I thought that might be getting old, said Strike. Yeah, said Nina. You thought right. She turned from him and walked back to the table, filling the last vacant seat between two employees whom he did not know. 
Strike was in Jerry Waldegrave's direct line of vision. Waldegrave caught sight of him, and Strike saw the editor's eyes widen behind his horn-rimmed glasses. Alerted by Waldegrave's transfixed stare, Chard twisted in his seat, and he too clearly recognized Strike. How's it going? asked Al excitedly at Strike's elbow. Great, said Strike. Where is that gill summing gone? Downed his drink and left. Doesn't know what the hell we're up to, said Al. Al did not know why they were here either. Strike had told him nothing, except that he needed entry to the Chelsea Arts Club tonight, and that he might need a lift. Al's bright red Alfa Romeo spider sat parked a little down the road. It had been agony on Strike's knee to get in and out of the low-slung vehicle. As he had intended, half the rope at charred table now seemed acutely aware of his presence. Strike was positioned so that he could see them reflected clearly in the dark French windows. Two Elizabeth Tassels were glaring at him over their menus, two Ninas were determinedly ignoring him, and two shiny-pated chards summoned a waiter each and muttered in their ears. Is that the ball block we saw in the River Cafe? asked Al. Yeah, said Strike, grinning, as the solid waiter separated from his reflected wraith and made his way towards them. I think we're about to be asked whether we've got the right to be here. Very sorry, sir began the waiter, in a mutter, as he reached strike. But could I ask? Al Rogby, my brother and I are here with Duncan Gilfeder, said Al pleasantly, before strike could respond. Al's tone expressed surprise that they had been challenged at all. He was a charming and privileged young man who was welcome everywhere, whose credentials were impeccable, and whose casual roping of strike into the family pen conferred upon him that same sense of easy entitlement. Johnny Ropeby's eyes looked out of Al's narrow face. The waiter muttered hasty apologies and retreated. Are you just trying to put the wind up them? asked Al, staring over at the publisher's table. Can't hurt, said Strike with a smile, sipping his whiskey as he watched Daniel Chard deliver what was clearly a stilted speech in Pinkelman's honor. A card and present were brought out from under the table. For every look and smile they gave the old writer— there was a nervous glance towards the large, dark man staring at them from the bar. Michael Fancourt alone had not looked around. Either he remained in ignorance of the detective's presence, or was untroubled by it. When starters had been put in front of them all, Jerry Waldegrave got to his feet and moved out from the table towards the bar. Nina and Elizabeth's eyes followed him. On Waldegrave's way to the bathroom, he merely nodded at Strike, but on the way back, he paused. Surprised to see you here. Yeah, said Strike. Yeah, said Waldegrave. You're, um, making people feel uncomfortable. Nothing I can do about that, said Strike. You could try not staring us out. This is my brother, Al, said Strike, ignoring the request. Al beamed and held out a hand, which Waldegrave shook, seeming nonplussed. You're annoying Daniel, Waldegrave told Strike, looking directly into the detective's eyes. That's a shame, said Strike. The editor rumpled his untidy hair. Well, if that's your attitude, surprised you care how Daniel Chard feels. I don't, particularly, said Waldegrave. But he can make life unpleasant for other people when he's in a bad mood. I'd like tonight to go well for Pinkelman. I can't understand why you're here. Wanted to make a delivery, said Strike. He pulled a blank white envelope out from an inside pocket. What is this? It's for you said Strike. Watergrave took it, looking utterly confused. Something you should think about, said Strike, moving closer to the bemused editor in the noisy bar. Fancourt had mumps, you know, before his wife died. What? said Watergrave, bewildered. Never had kids. Pretty sure he's infertile. Thought you might be interested. Watergrave stared at him, opened his mouth, found nothing to say, then walked away still clutching the white envelope. What was that? Al asked Strike, agog. Plan A, said Strike. We'll see. Waldegrave sat back down at the rope at chart table. Mirrored in the black window beside him, he opened the envelope Strike had given him. Puzzled, he pulled out a second envelope. There was a scribbled name on this one. The editor looked up at Strike, who raised his eyebrows. Jerry Waldegrave hesitated, then turned to Elizabeth Tassel, and passed her the envelope. She read what was written on it, frowning. Her eyes flew to strikes. He smiled, and toasted her with his glass. 
She seemed uncertain as to what to do for a moment. Then she nudged the girl beside her and passed the envelope on. It traveled up the table and across it, into the hands of Michael Fancourt. There we are, said Strike. Al, I'm going into the garden for a fag. Stay here and keep your phone on. They don't allow mob. But Al caught sight of Strike's expression and amended hastily. Will do. Chapter 48 Does the silkworm expend her yellow labors for thee? For thee does she undo herself? Thomas Middleton, The Revenger's Tragedy The garden was deserted and bitterly cold. Strike sank up to his ankles in snow, unable to feel the cold seeping through his right trouser leg. All the smokers who would ordinarily have congregated on the smooth lawns had chosen the street instead. He ploughed a solitary trench through the frozen whiteness, surrounded by silent beauty, coming to a halt beside a small round pond that had become a disk of thick grey ice. A plump bronze cupid sat in the middle on an oversized clamshell. It wore a wig of snow and pointed its bow and arrow, not anywhere that it might hit a human being, but straight up at the dark heavens. Strike lit a cigarette and turned back to look at the blazing windows of the club. The diners and waiters looked like paper cutouts moving against a lit screen. If Strike knew his man, he would come. Wasn't this an irresistible situation to a writer, to the compulsive spinner of experience into words, to a lover of the macabre and the strange? And sure enough, after a few minutes, Strike heard a door open, a snatch of conversation and music hastily muffled, then the sound of deadened footsteps. Mr. Strike. Fancourt's head looked particularly large in the darkness. Would it not be easier to go onto the street? I'd rather do this in the garden, said Strike. I see. Fancourt sounded vaguely amused, as though he intended, at least in the short term, to humor Strike. The detective suspected that it appealed to the writer's sense of theater that he should be the one summoned from the table of anxious people to talk to the man who was making them all so nervous. What's this about? asked Fancourt. Value your opinion, said Strike. Question of critical analysis of Bombix Mori. Again, said Fancourt. His good humor was cooling with his feet. He pulled his coat more closely around him and said, the snow falling thick and fast, I've said everything I want to say about that book. One of the first things I was told about Bombix Mori, said Strike, was that it was reminiscent of your early work. Gore and arcane symbolism, I think, were the words used. So, said Fancourt, hands in his pockets. So, the more I've talked to people who knew Quine, the clearer it's become that the book that everyone's read bears only a vague resemblance to the one he claimed to be writing. Fancourt's breath rose in a cloud before him, obscuring the little that Strike could see of his heavy features. I've even met a girl who says she heard part of the book that doesn't appear in the final manuscript. Writer's cut, said Fancourt, shuffling his feet, his shoulders hunched up around his ears. Owen would have done well to cut a great deal more. Several novels, in fact. There are also all the duplications from his earlier work, said Strike. Two hermaphrodites, two bloody bags, all that gratuitous sex. He was a man of limited imagination, Mr. Strike. He left behind a scribbled note with what looks like a bunch of possible character names on it. One of those names appears on a used typewriter cassette that came out of his study before the police sealed it off, but it's nowhere in the finished manuscript. So he changed his mind, said Fancourt irritably. It's an everyday name, not symbolic or archetypal like the names in the finished manuscript said Strike. His eyes becoming accustomed to the darkness, Strike saw a look of faint curiosity on Fancourt's heavy-featured face. A restaurant full of people witnessed what I think is going to turn out to be Quine's last meal and his final public performance, Strike went on. A credible witness says that Quine shouted for the whole restaurant to hear that one of the reasons Tassel was too cowardly to represent the book was... Fancourt's limp dick. He doubted that he and Fancourt were clearly visible to the jittery people at the publisher's table. Their figures would blend with the trees and statuary, but the determined or desperate might still be able to make out their location 
but the tiny luminous eye of Strike's blowing cigarette, a marksman's bead. Thing is, there is nothing in Bombix Mori about your dick, continued Strike. There is nothing in there about Quine's mistress and his young transgendered friend being beautiful lost souls, which is how he told them he was going to describe them. And you don't pour acid on silkworms. You boil them to get their cocoons. So, repeated Fancourt, so I've been forced to the conclusion, said Strike, that the Bombix Mori everyone's read is a different book to the Bombix Mori Owen Quine wrote. Fancourt stopped shuffling his feet. Momentarily frozen, he appeared to give Strike's words serious consideration. I know, he said, almost it seemed to himself. Quine wrote that book. It's his style. It's funny you should say that, because everyone else who had a decent ear for Quine's particular style seems to detect a foreign voice in the book. Daniel Chard thought it was Waldegrave, Waldegrave thought it was Elizabeth Tassel, and Christian Fisher heard you. Fancourt shrugged with his usual easy arrogance. Quine was trying to imitate a better writer. Don't you think the way he treats his living models is strangely uneven? Fancourt, accepting the cigarette Strike offered him in a light, now listened in silence and with interest. He says his wife and agent were parasites on him, Strike said. Unpleasant, but the sort of accusation anyone could throw at the people who might be said to live off his earnings. He employs his mistress isn't fond of animals, and throws in something that could either be a veiled reference to her producing crap books, or a pretty sick allusion to breast cancer. His transgendered friend gets off with a jibe about vocal exercises, and that's after she claims she showed him the life story she was writing and shared all her deepest secrets. He accuses Chard of effectively killing Joe North, and makes a crass suggestion of what Chard really wanted to do to him. And there's the accusation that you were responsible for your first wife's death, all of which is either in the public domain, public gossip, or an easy accusation to sling, which isn't to say it wasn't hurtful, said Fancourt quietly. Agreed, said Strike. It gave plenty of people reason to be pissed off with him. But the only real revelation in the book is the insinuation that you fathered Joanna Waldegrave. I told you, as good as told you, last time we met, said Fancourt, sounding tense. That that accusation is not only false, but impossible. I am infertile, as Quine as Quine should have known, agreed Strike. Because you and he were still ostensibly on good terms when you had mumps, and he'd already made a jibe about it in the Balzac brothers. And that makes the accusation contained in the cutter even stranger, doesn't it? As though it was written by someone who didn't know that you were infertile. Didn't any of this occur to you when you read the book? The snow fell thickly on the two men's hair, on their shoulders. I didn't think Owen cared whether any of it was true or not, said Fancourt slowly, exhaling smoke. Mud sticks. He was just flinging a lot around. I thought he was looking to cause as much trouble as possible. Do you think that's why he sent you an early copy of the manuscript? When Fancourt did not respond, Strike went on, it's easily checkable, you know. Courier, postal service, there'll be a record. You might as well tell me. A lengthy pause. All right, said Fancourt at last. When did you get it? The morning of the 6th. What did you do with it? Burned it, said Fancourt shortly, exactly like Catherine Kent. I could see what he was doing, trying to provoke a public row, maximize publicity. The last resort of a failure. I was not going to humour him. Another snatch of the interior revelry reached them as the door to the garden opened and closed again. Uncertain footsteps winding through the snow, and then a large shadow looming out of the darkness. What? croaked Elizabeth Tassel, who was wrapped in a heavy coat with a fur collar. Is going on out here? The moment he heard her voice, Fancourt made to move back inside. Strike wondered when was the last time they had come face to face in anything less than a crowd of hundreds. Wait a minute, will you? Strike asked the writer. 
Fancourt hesitated. Tassel addressed Strike in her deep, croaky voice. Pinks is missing, Michael. Something you'd know all about, said Strike. The snow whispered down upon the leaves and onto the frozen pond where the Cupid sat, pointing his arrow skywards. You thought Elizabeth's writing lamentably derivative. Isn't that right? Strike asked Fancourt. You both studied Jacobean revenge tragedies, which accounts for the similarities in your styles. But you're a very good imitator of other people's writing, I think, Strike told Tassel. He had known that she would come if he took Fancourt away, known that she would be frightened of what he was telling the writer out in the dark. She stood perfectly still as snow landed in her fur collar on her iron-gray hair. Strike could just make out the contours of her face by the faint light of the club's distant windows. The intensity and emptiness of her gaze were remarkable. She had the dead, blank eyes of a shark. You took off Elspeth Fancourt's style to perfection, for instance. Fancourt's mouth fell quietly open. For a few seconds, the only sound other than the whispering snow was the barely audible whistle emanating from Elizabeth Tassel's lungs. I thought from the start that Quine must have had some hold on you, said Strike. You never seemed like the kind of woman who'd let herself be turned into a private bank and skivvy, who'd choose to keep Quine and let Fancourt go. All that bull about freedom of expression. You wrote the parody of Elspeth Fancourt's book that made her kill herself. All these years, there's only been your word for it that Owen showed you the piece he'd written. It was the other way round. There was silence, except for the rustle of snow on snow, and that faint, eerie sound emanating from Elizabeth Tassel's chest. Fancourt was looking from the agent to the detective, open-mouthed. The police suspected that Quine was blackmailing you, Strike said. But you fobbed them off with a touching story about lending him money for Orlando. You've been paying Owen off for more than a quarter of a century, haven't you? He was trying to goad her into speech, but she said nothing continuing to stare at him out of the dark, empty eyes, like holes in her plain, pale face. How did you describe yourself to me when we had lunch? Strike asked her. The very definition of a blameless spinster. Found an outlet for your frustrations, though, didn't you, Elizabeth? The mad, blank eyes swiveled suddenly towards Fancourt, who had shifted where he stood. Did it feel good? Raping and killing your way through everyone you knew, Elizabeth. One big explosion of malice and obscenity, revenging yourself on everyone, painting yourself as the unacclaimed genius, taking side swipes at everyone with a more successful love life, a more satisfying... A soft voice spoke in the darkness, and for a second, Strike did not know where it was coming from. It was strange, unfamiliar, high-pitched and sickly. The voice a mad woman might imagine to express innocence, kindliness. No, Mr. Strike, she whispered, like a mother telling a sleepy child not to sit up, not to struggle. You poor, silly man, you poor thing. She forced a laugh that left her chest heaving, her lungs whistling. He was badly hurt in Afghanistan, she said to Fancourt in that eerie, crooning voice. I think he's shell-shocked, brain-damaged, just like little Orlando. He needs help, poor Mr. Strike. Her lungs whistled as she breathed faster. You should have bought a mask, Elizabeth, shouldn't you? Strike asked. He thought he saw the eyes darken and enlarge, her pupils dilating with the adrenaline coursing through her. The large, mannish hands had curled into claws. Thought you had it all worked out, didn't you? Ropes, disguise, protective clothing to protect yourself against the acid. But you didn't realize you get tissue damage just from inhaling the fumes. The cold air was exacerbating her breathlessness. In her panic, she sounded sexually excited. I think, said Strike, with calculated cruelty, it's driven you literally mad, Elizabeth, hasn't it? Better hope the jury buys that anyway, eh? What a waste of a life. Your business down the toilet. No man, no children. Tell me, was there ever an abortive coupling between the two of you? Asked Strike bluntly, watching their profiles. This limp dick business. 
Sounds to me like Quine might have fictionalized it in the real Bombix Mori. With their backs to the light, he could not see their expressions, but their body language had given him his answer. The instantaneous swing away from each other to face him had expressed the ghost of a united front. When was this? Strike asked, watching the dark outline that was Elizabeth. After Elspeth died? But then you moved on to Fenella Waldegrave, eh, Michael? No trouble keeping it up there, I take it. Elizabeth emitted a small gasp. It was as though he had hit her. For Christ's sake, growled Fancourt. He was angry with Strike now. Strike ignored the implicit reproach. He was still working on Elizabeth, goading her, while her whistling lungs struggled for oxygen in the falling snow. Must have really pissed you off when Quine got carried away, and started shouting about the contents of the real Bombix Mori in the River Café, did it, Elizabeth? After you'd warned him not to breathe a word about the contents. Insane. <sighs> You're insane, she whispered with a forced smile beneath the shark eyes, her big yellow teeth glinting. The war didn't just cripple you. Nice, said Strike appreciatively. There's the bullying bitch everyone's told me you are. You hobble around London trying to get in the papers, she panted. You're just like poor Owen, just like him. How he loved the papers, didn't he, Michael? She turned to appeal to Fancourt. Didn't Owen adore publicity? Running off like a little boy, playing hide-and-seek. <gasps> you encouraged Quine to go and hide in Talgarth Road, said Strike. That was all your idea. I won't listen to any more, she whispered, and her lungs were whistling as she gasped the winter air and raised her voice. I'm not listening, Mr. Strike. I'm not listening. Nobody's listening to you, you poor, silly man. You told me Quine was a glutton for praise, said Strike, raising his voice over the high-pitched chant with which he was trying to drown out his words. I think he told you his whole prospective plot for Bombex Murray months ago, and I think Michael here was in there in some form. Nothing as crude as vainglorious, but mocked for not getting it up, perhaps. Payback time for both of you, eh? And as he had expected, she gave a little gasp at that, and stopped her frantic chanting. You told Quine that Bombex Murray sounded brilliant, that it would be the best thing he'd ever done that it was going to be a massive success, but that he ought to keep the contents very, very quiet in case of legal action, and to make a bigger splash when it was unveiled. And all the time, you were writing your own version. You had plenty of time on your hands to get it right, didn't you, Elizabeth? Twenty-six years of empty evenings. You could have written plenty of books by now, with your first from Oxford. But what would you write about? You haven't exactly lived a full life, have you? Naked rage flickered across her face. Her fingers flexed, but she controlled herself. Strike wanted her to crack, wanted her to give in, but the shark's eyes seemed to be waiting for him to show weakness, for an opening. You crafted a novel out of a murder plan. The removal of the guts and the covering of the corpse in acid weren't symbolic. They were designed to screw forensics but everyone bought it as literature, and you got that stupid, egotistical bastard to collude in planning his own death. You told him you had a great idea for maximizing his publicity and his profits. The pair of you would stage a very public row, you saying the book was too contentious to put out there, and he'd disappear. You'd circulate rumors about the book's contents, and finally, when Quine allowed himself to be found, You'd secure him a big, fat deal. She was shaking her head, her lungs audibly laboring, but her dead eyes did not leave his face. He delivered the book. You delayed a few days until bonfire night, to make sure you had lots of nice diversionary noise. Then you sent out copies of the fake Bombix to Fisher, the better to get the book talked about, to Waldegrave, and to Michael here. You faked your public row, then you followed Quine to Talgarth Road. No, said Fancourt, apparently unable to help himself. Yes, said Strike, 
pitiless. Coyne didn't realize he had anything to fear from Elizabeth, not from his co-conspirator in the comeback of the century. I think he'd almost forgotten by then that what he'd been doing to you for years was blackmail, hadn't he? he asked Tassel. He'd just developed the habit of asking you for money and being given it. I doubt you ever even talked about the parody anymore, the thing that ruined your life. And you know what I think happened once he let you in, Elizabeth? Against his will, Strike remembered the scene, the great vaulted window, the body centred there, as though for a grisly still life. I think you got that poor, naive, narcissistic sod to pose for a publicity photograph. Was he kneeling down? Did the hero in the real book plead or pray? Or did he get tied up like your bombix? He'd have liked that, wouldn't he? Quine, posing in ropes. It would have made it nice and easy to move behind him and smash his head in with the metal doorstop, wouldn't it? Under cover of the neighbourhood fireworks, you knocked Quine out, tied him up, sliced him open, and... Fancourt let out a strangled moan of horror, but Tassel spoke again, crooning at him in a travesty of consolation. You ought to see someone, Mr. Strike. Poor Mr. Strike. And to his surprise, she reached out to lay one of her big hands on his snow-covered shoulder. Remembering what those hands had done, Strike stepped back instinctively, and her arm fell heavily back to her side, hanging there, the fingers clenching reflexively. You filled a hold all with Owen's guts and the real manuscript, said the detective. She had moved so close that he could again smell the combination of perfume and stale cigarettes. Then you put on Quine's own cloak and hat, and left. Off you went to feed a fourth copy of the fake Bombix Mori through Catherine Kent's letterbox. To maximize suspects and incriminate another woman who was getting what you never got. Sex. Companionship. At least one friend. She feigned laughter again, but this time the sound was manic. Her fingers were still flexing and unflexing. You and Owen would have got on so well, she whispered. Wouldn't he, Michael? Wouldn't he have got on marvellously with Owen? Sick fantasists. People will laugh at you, Mr. Strike. She was panting harder than ever, those dead, blank eyes staring out of her fixed white face. A poor cripple trying to recreate the sensation of success, chasing your famous father. Have you got proof of any of this? Fancourt demanded in the swirling snow, his voice harsh with the desire not to believe. This was no ink and paper tragedy. No grease-paint death scene. Here beside him stood the living friend of his student years, and whatever life had subsequently done to them, the idea that the big, ungainly, besotted girl whom he had known at Oxford could have turned into a woman capable of grotesque murder was almost unbearable. Yeah, I've got proof, said Strike quietly. I've got a second electric typewriter, the exact model of coins, wrapped up in a black burqa, and hydrochloric-stained overalls and weighted with stones. An amateur diver I happened to know pulled it out of the sea just a few days ago. It was lying beneath some notorious cliffs at Gwythian, Hell's Mouth, a place featured on Dorcas Pengelly's book cover. I expect she showed it to you when you visited, didn't she, Elizabeth? Did you walk back there alone with your mobile, telling her you needed to find better reception? She let out a ghastly low moan, like the sound of a man who has been punched in the stomach. For a second, nobody moved. Then Tassel turned clumsily and began running and stumbling away from them, back towards the club. A bright yellow rectangle of light shivered, then disappeared as the door opened and closed. But, said Fancourt, taking a few steps and looking back at Strike a little wildly, you can't. You've got to stop her. Couldn't catch her if I wanted to, said Strike throwing the butt of his cigarette down into the snow. Dodgy knee. She could do anything. Off to kill herself, probably, agreed Strike, pulling out his mobile. The writer stared at him. You, you cold-blooded bastard. You're not the first to say it, said Strike, pressing keys on his phone. Ready, he said into it, 
we're off. Chapter 49. Dangers like stars, in dark attempts, best shine. Thomas Decker, the noble Spanish soldier. Out past the smokers at the front of the club, the large woman came, blindly slipping a little in the snow. She began to run up the dark street, her fur-collared coat flapping behind her. A taxi, its for hire light on, slid out of a side road, and she hailed it, flapping her arms madly. The cab slid to a halt, its headlamps making two cones of light, whose trajectory was cut by the thickly falling snow. Fulham Palace Road, said the harsh, deep voice, breaking with sobs. They pulled slowly away from the curb. The cab was old, the glass partition scratched, and a little stained by years of its owner's smoking. Elizabeth Tassel was visible in the rearview mirror as the streetlight slid over her, sobbing silently into her large hands, shaking all over. The driver did not ask what was the matter, but looked beyond the fare to the street behind, where the shrinking figures of two men could be seen, hurrying across the snowy road to a red sports car in the distance. The taxi turned left at the end of the road, and still Elizabeth Tassel cried into her hands. The driver's thick wooden hat was itchy, grateful though she had been for it during the long hours of waiting. On up the King's Road the taxi sped, over thick powdery snow that resisted Tyre's attempts to squash it to slush, the blizzard swirling remorselessly, rendering the roads increasingly lethal. You're going the wrong way. There's a diversion, lied Robin. Because of the snow, she met Elizabeth's eyes briefly in the mirror. The agent looked over her shoulder. The red Alfa Romeo was too far behind to see. She stared wildly around at the passing buildings. Robin could hear the eerie whistling from her chest. We're going in the opposite direction. I'm going to turn in a minute, said Robin. She did not see Elizabeth Tassel try the door, but heard it. They were all locked. You can let me out here, she said loudly. Let me out, I said. You won't get another cab in this weather, said Robin. They had counted on Tassel being too distraught to notice where they were going for a little while longer. The cab was barely at Sloan Square. There was over a mile to go to New Scotland Yard. Robin's eyes flickered again to her rearview mirror. The Alfa Romeo was a tiny red dot in the distance. Elizabeth had undone her seatbelt. Stop this cab, she shouted. Stop it and let me out. I can't stop here, said Robin, much more calmly than she felt, because the agent had left her seat and her large hands were scrabbling at the partition. I'm going to have to ask you to sit down, mad. The screen slid open. Elizabeth's hand seized Robin's hat and a handful of hair, her head almost side by side with Robin's, her expression venomous. Robin's hair fell into her eyes in sweaty strands. Get off me! Who are you? screeched Tassel, shaking Robin's head with a fistful of hair in her hand. Ralph said he saw Blonde going through the bin. Who are you? Let go! shouted Robin as Tassel's other hand grabbed her neck. Two hundred yards behind them, Strike roared at Al. Put your fucking foot down! There's something wrong! Look at it! The taxi ahead was careering all over the road. It's always been shit and ice, moaned Al, as the Alpha skidded a little, and the taxi took the corner into Sloan Square at speed, and disappeared from view. Tassel was halfway into the front of the taxi, screaming from her ripped throat. Robin was trying to beat her back one-handed, while maintaining a grip on the wheel. She could not see where she was going for hair and snow, and now both Tassel's hands were at her throat, squeezing. Robin tried to find the brake, but as the taxi leapt forwards, realized she had hit the accelerator. She could not breathe. Taking both hands off the wheel, she tried to prise away the agent's tightening grip. Screams from pedestrians, a huge jolt, and then the ear-splitting crunch of glass, of metal on concrete, and the searing pain of the seatbelt against her as the taxi crashed. But she was sinking, everything going black. Fuck the car, leave it, we've got to get in there, Strike bellowed at Al, over the wail of a shop alarm and the screams of the scattered bystanders. Al brought the Alpha to an untidy skidding halt in the middle of the road, a hundred yards from where the taxi had smashed its way into a plate glass window. Al jumped out as Strike struggled to stand. A group of passers-by, 
some of them Christmas party-goers in black tie, who had sprinted out of the way as the taxi mounted the curb, watched, stunned, as Al ran, slipping and almost falling, over the snow towards the crash. The rear door of the cab opened. Elizabeth Tassel flung herself from the back seat and began to run. Al, get her! Strike bellowed, still struggling through the snow. Get her, Al! La Rose had a superb rugby team. Al was used to taking orders. A short sprint, and he had taken her down in a perfect tackle. She hit the snowy street with a hard bang over the screamed protests of many women watching, and he pinned her there, struggling and swearing, repelling every attempt of chivalrous men to help his victim. Strike was immune to all of it. He seemed to be running in slow motion, trying not to fall, staggering towards the ominously silent and still cab. Distracted by Al and his struggling, swearing captive, nobody had a thought to spare for the driver of the taxi. Robin! She was slumped sideways, still held to her seat by the belt. There was blood on her face, but when he said her name, she responded with a muddled groan. Thank fuck! Thank fuck! Police sirens were already filling the square. They wailed over the shop alarm, the mounting protests of the shocked Londoners, and strike, undoing Robin's seatbelt, pushing her gently back into the cab as she attempted to get out, said, Stay there. She knew we weren't going to her house, mumbled Robin. Knew straight away I was going the wrong way. Doesn't matter, panted Strike. You've brought Scotland Yard to us. Diamond bright lights were twinkling from the bare trees around the square. Snow poured down upon the gathering crowd. The taxi protruding from the broken window and the sports car parked untidily in the middle of the road. As the police cars came to a halt, their flashing blue lights sparkling on the glittering glass-strewn ground, their sirens lost in the wail of the shop alarm. As his half-brother tried to shout an explanation as to why he was lying on top of a sixty-year-old woman, the relieved, exhausted detective slumped down beside his partner in the cab and found himself, against his will and against the dictates of good taste, laughing. One week later. Chapter 50. Cynthia. How say you, Endymion? All this was for love. Endymion. I say, madam, then the gods send me a woman's hate. John Lilly. Endymion. Or the man in the moon. Strike had never visited Robin and Matthew's flat in Ealing before. His insistence that Robin take time off work to recover from mild concussion and attempted strangulation had not gone down well. Robin, he had told her patiently over the phone, I've had to shut up the office anyway. Press crawling all over Denmark Street. I'm staying at Nick and Ilse's. But he could not disappear to Cornwall without seeing her. When she opened her front door, he was glad to see that the bruising on her neck and forehead had already faded to a faint yellow and blue. How are you feeling? he asked, wiping his feet on the doormat. Great, she said. The place was small but cheerful, and it smelled of her perfume, which he had never noticed much before. Perhaps a week without smelling it had made him more sensitive to it. She led him through to the sitting room, which was painted magnolia like Catherine Kent's, and where he was interested to note the copy of Investigative Interviewing, Psychology in Practice, lying cover upwards on a chair. A small Christmas tree stood in the corner, the decorations white and silver like the trees in Sloane Square, that had formed the background of press photographs of the crashed taxi. Matthew got over it yet? asked Strike, sinking down into the sofa. I can't say he's the happiest I've ever seen him, she replied, grinning. Tea? She knew how he liked it, the colour of creosote. Christmas present, he told her when she returned with the tray, and handed her a nondescript white envelope. Robin opened it curiously and pulled out a stapled sheaf of printed material. Surveillance course in January, said Strike. So next time you pull a bag of dog shit out of a bin, no one notices you doing it. She laughed, delighted. Thank you. Thank you. Most women would have expected flowers. I'm not most women. Yeah, well, I've noticed that, said Strike, taking a chocolate biscuit. Have they analysed it yet? she asked. The dog poo? Yep, full of human guts. She'd been defrosting them bit by bit. They found traces in the Doberman's bowl and the rest in her freezer. Oh, God, said Robin, the smile sliding off her face. Criminal genius, said Strike, sneaking into Quine's study and planting two of her own used typewriter ribbons behind the desk. 
Anstis has condescended to have them tested now. There's none of Quine's DNA on them. He never touched them. Ergo, he never typed what's on there. Anstis is still talking to you, is he? Just. Hard for him to cut me off. I saved his life. I can see how that would make things awkward, Robin agreed. So they're buying your whole theory now. Open and shut case, now they know what they're looking for. She bought the duplicate typewriter nearly two years ago, ordered the burka and the ropes on Quine's card, and got him sent to the house while the workmen were in. Loads of opportunity to get at his visa over the years. Coat hanging up in the office while he went for a slash. Sneak out his wallet while he was asleep, pissed, when she drove him home from parties. She knew him well enough to know he was slapdash on checking things like bills. She had access to the key to Talgarth Road. Easy to copy. She'd been all over the house. Knew the hydrochloric acid was there. Brilliant, but over-elaborate, said Strike, sipping his dark brown tea. She's on suicide watch, apparently. But you haven't heard the most mental bit. There's more, said Robin apprehensively. Much as she had looked forward to seeing Strike, she still felt a little fragile after the events of a week ago. She straightened her back and faced him squarely, braced. She kept the bloody book. Robin frowned at him. What do you... It was in the freezer with the guts. Bloodstained because she carried it away in the bag with the guts. The real manuscript. The Bombix Mori that Quine wrote. But why on earth? God only knows. Fancourt says. You've seen him? Briefly. He's decided he knew it was Elizabeth all along. I'll lay you odds what his next novel's going to be about. Anyway, he says she wouldn't have been able to bring herself to destroy an original manuscript. For God's sake, she had no problem destroying its author. Yeah, but this was literature, Robin, said Strike, grinning. And get this, Roper Chard are very keen to publish the real thing. Fancourt's going to write the introduction. You are kidding. Nope. Quine's going to have a bestseller at last. Don't look like that said Strike bracingly, as she shook her head in disbelief. Plenty to celebrate. Leonora and Orlando will be rolling in money once Bombix Mori hits the bookshelves. That reminds me. Got something else for you. He slid his hand into the inside pocket of the coat lying beside him on the sofa and handed her a rolled-up drawing that he had been keeping safe there. Robin unfurled it and smiled, her eyes filling with tears. Two curly-haired angels danced together, beneath the carefully penciled legend, to Robin, love from Dodo. How are they? Great, said Strike. He had visited the house in Southern Row at Leonora's invitation. She and Orlando had met him hand in hand at the door, cheeky monkey dangling around Orlando's neck as usual. Where's Robin? Orlando demanded. I wanted Robin to be here. I drew her a picture. The lady had an accident, Leonora reminded her daughter backing away into the hall to let Strike in, keeping a tight hold on Orlando's hand, as though frightened that someone might separate them again. I told you, Dodo, the lady did a very brave thing, and she had a crash in a car. Auntie Liz was bad, Orlando told Strike, walking backwards down the hall, still hand in hand with her mother, but staring at Strike all the way with those limpid green eyes. She was the one who made my daddy die. Yes, I, er, uh, I know. Strike replied, with that familiar feeling of inadequacy that Orlando always seemed to induce in him. He had found Edna from next door, sitting at the kitchen table. Oh, you were clever, she told him over and again. Wasn't it dreadful, though? How's your poor partner? Wasn't it terrible, though? Bless him, said Robin, after he had described this scene in some detail. She spread Orlando's picture out on the coffee table between them beside the details of the surveillance course, where she could admire them both. And how's Al? Beside himself with bloody excitement, said Strike gloomily. We've given him a false impression of the thrill of work in life. I liked him, said Robin, smiling. Yeah, well, you were concussed, said Strike. And Paul was bloody ecstatic to have shown up the Met. You've got some very interesting friends, said Robin. How much are you going to have to pay to repair Nick's dad's taxi? I haven't got the bill in yet, he sighed. I suppose, he added several biscuits later, with his eyes on his present to Robin, I'm going to have to get another temp in while you're off learning surveillance. 
Yeah, I suppose you will, agreed Robin. And after a slight hesitation, she added, I hope she's rubbish. Strike laughed as he got to his feet, picking up his coat. I wouldn't worry. Lightning doesn't strike twice. Doesn't anyone ever call you that, among all your many nicknames? She wondered, as they walked back through the hall. Call me what? Lightning strike. Is that likely? He asked, indicating his leg. Well, Merry Christmas, partner. The idea of a hug hovered briefly in the air, but she held out her hand with mock blokiness, and he shook it. Have a great time in Cornwall. And you in Massam. On the point of relinquishing her hand, he gave it a quick twist. He had kissed the back of it before she knew what had happened. Then, with a grin and a wave, he was gone. This has been a Hachette audio production of The Silkworm, written by Robert Galbraith, read by Robert Glenister, produced by Strathmore Publishing, directed by Jenny Leo, post-production by Wolfgang Dienst. The Silkworm is also available in print and digital formats from Mulholland Books, a division of Hachette Book Group. Text copyright 2014 by Robert Galbraith Limited. Audio production copyright 2014, Hachette Audio. All rights reserved. In accordance with the U.S. Copyright Act of 1976, the duplicating, uploading, and electronic sharing of any part of this audiobook without the permission of the publisher constitutes unlawful privacy and theft of the author's intellectual property. If you would like to use material from the audiobook, other than for review purposes, prior written permission must be obtained by contacting the publisher at permissions at hbgusa.com. Thank you for your support of the author's rights. This audiobook is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places and incidents are either the product of the author's imagination or are used fictitiously, and any resemblance to actual persons, living or dead, events or locales, is entirely coincidental. O oh Santa, words and music by Mariah Carey, Brian Paul Cox and Maudlin Dupree. Copyright 2010. Reproduced by permission of EMI Music Publishing Limited, London W1F, 9LD. Copyright 2010, WBM Music Corp, CSAC, and Songs in the Key of B-Flat, Inc., CSAC. All rights on behalf of itself, and Songs in the Key of B-Flat, Inc., administered by WBM Music Corp. Copyright 2010, by Universal MCA Music Limited. Love you more. Words and music by Ortiz Williams, Marvin Humes, Jonathan Gill, Aston Merigold, Toby Gad, and Wayne Hector. Copyright 2010, BMG FM Music Limited, a BMG Chrysalis Company, BMG Rights Management UK Limited, a BMG Chrysalis Company, EMI Music Publishing Limited. All rights reserved. International copyright secured. Reproduced by permission of Music Sales Limited and EMI Music Publishing Limited, London W1F, 9LD.